Operation Paperclip, the secret intelligence program that brought Nazi scientists to America. Written by Annie Jacobson. Read by the author. Dedication for Kevin. Prologue. This is a book about Nazi scientists and American government secrets. It is about how dark truths can be hidden from the public by U.S. officials in the name of national security, and it is about the unpredictable, often fortuitous circumstances through which truth gets revealed. Operation Paperclip was a post-war U.S. intelligence program that brought German scientists to America under secret military contracts. The program had a benign public face and a classified body of secrets and lies. I'm mad on technology, Adolf Hitler told his inner circle at a dinner party in 1942. And in the aftermath of the German surrender, more than 1,600 of Hitler's technologists would become America's own. What follows puts a spotlight on 21 of these men. Under Operation Paperclip, which began in May of 1945, the scientists who helped the Third Reich wage war continued their weapons-related work for the U.S. government, developing rockets, chemical and biological weapons, aviation and space medicine for enhancing military pilot and astronaut performance, and many other armaments at a feverish and paranoid pace that came to define the Cold War. The age of weapons of mass destruction had begun, and with it came the treacherous concept of brinksmanship, the art of pursuing dangerous policy to the limits of safety before stopping. Hiring dedicated Nazis was without precedent, entirely unprincipled, and inherently dangerous, not just because, as Undersecretary of War Robert Patterson stated when debating if he should approve paperclip, these men are enemies, but because it was counter to democratic ideals. The men profiled in this book were not nominal Nazis. Eight of the twenty-one, Otto Ambrose, Theodore Benziger, Kurt Blomme, Walter Dornberger, Siegfried Kneemeyer, Walter Schreiber, Walter Schieber, and Werner von Braun, each at some point worked side by side with Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, or Hermann Goering during the war. Fifteen of the twenty-one were dedicated members of the Nazi party. Ten of them also joined the ultra-violent, ultra-nationalistic Nazi party paramilitary squads, the SA, Sturmabteilung, or stormtroopers, and the SS, Schutzstaffel, or protection squadron. Two wore the Golden Party badge, indicating favor bestowed by the Führer. One was given an award of one million Reichsmarks for scientific achievement. Six of the twenty-one stood trial at Nuremberg. A seventh was released without trial under mysterious circumstances. And an eighth stood trial in Dachau for regional war crimes. One was convicted of mass murder and slavery, served some time in prison, was granted clemency, and then was hired by the U.S. Department of Energy. They came to America at the behest of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Some officials believed that by endorsing the paperclip program, they were accepting the lesser of two evils, that if America didn't recruit these scientists, the Soviet communists surely would. Other generals and colonels respected and admired these men, and said so. To comprehend the impact of Operation Paperclip on American national security during the early days of the Cold War, and the legacy of warfighting technology it has left behind. It is important first to understand that the program was governed out of an office in the elite E-ring of the Pentagon. The Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, JOA, was created solely and specifically to recruit and hire Nazi scientists and put them on weapons projects and in scientific intelligence programs within the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the CIA, starting in 1947, and other organizations. 
In some cases, when individual scientists had been too close to Hitler, the JOA hired them to work at U.S. military facilities in occupied Germany. The JOA was a subcommittee of the Joint Intelligence Committee, JIC, which provided national security information for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The JIC remains the least known and least studied U.S. intelligence agency of the 20th century. To understand the mindset of the Joint Intelligence Committee, consider this. Within one year of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the JIC warned the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the United States needed to prepare for total war with the Soviets, to include atomic, chemical, and biological warfare and they even set an estimated start date of 1952. This book focuses on that uneasy period from 1945 to 1952 in which the JOA's recruitment of Nazi scientists was forever on the rise, culminating in accelerated paperclip, which allowed individuals previously deemed undesirable to be brought to the United States, including Major General Dr. Walter Schreiber, the Surgeon General of the Third Reich. Operation Paperclip left behind a legacy of ballistic missiles, sarin gas cluster bombs, underground bunkers, space capsules, and weaponized bubonic plague. It also left behind a trail of once-secret documents that I access to report this book, including post-war interrogation reports, Army intelligence security dossiers, Nazi Party paperwork, Allied Intelligence Armaments Reports, Declassified JOA Memos, Nuremberg Trial Testimony, Oral Histories, A General's Desk Diaries, and a Nuremberg War Crimes Investigator's Journal. Coupled with exclusive interviews and correspondence with children and grandchildren of these Nazi scientists, five of whom shared with me the personal papers and unpublished writings of their family members, what follows is the unsettling story of Operation Paperclip. All of the men profiled in this book are now dead. Enterprising achievers as they were, just as the majority of them won top military and science awards when they served the Third Reich, so it went that many of them won top U.S. military and civilian awards serving the United States. One had a U.S. government building named after him, and as of 2013, two continue to have prestigious National Science Prizes given annually in their names. One invented the ear thermometer. Others helped man get to the moon. How did this happen and what does this mean now? Does accomplishment cancel out past crimes? These are among the central questions in this dark and complicated tale. It is a story populated with Machiavellian connivers and men who dedicate their lives to designing weapons for the coming war. It is also a story about victory and what victory can often entail. It is rife with Nazis, many of whom were guilty of accessory to murder but were never charged and lived out their lives in prosperity in the United States. In the instances where a kind of justice is delivered, it rings of half measure. Or perhaps there is a hero in the record of fact which continues to be filled in. Part 1. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Unknown. Chapter 1. The War and the Weapons It was November 26, 1944, and Strasbourg, France, was still under attack. The cobblestone streets of this medieval city were in chaos. Three days before, the 2nd French Armored Division had chased the Germans out of town and officially liberated the city from the Nazis. But now the Allies were having a difficult time holding the enemy back. German mortar rounds bombarded the streets. Air battles raged overhead. And in the center of town, inside a fancy apartment on K. Klebar, Armed U.S. soldiers guarded the Dutch-American particle physicist Samuel Goodsmith as he sat in an armchair scouring files. The apartment belonged to a German virus expert named Dr. Eugen Hagen, believed to be a key developer in the covert Nazi biological weapons program. 
Hagen had apparently fled his apartment in a hurry just a few days prior, leaving behind a framed photograph of Hitler on the mantel and a cache of important documents in the cabinets. Gutsmet and two colleagues, bacteriological warfare experts Bill Cromarty and Fred Wardenberg, had been reading over Dr. Hagen's documents for hours. Based on what was in front of them, they planned to be here all night. Most of Strasbourg was without electricity, so Goodsmith and his colleagues were reading by candlelight. Samuel Goodsmith led a unit engaged in a different kind of battle than the one being fought by the combat soldiers and airmen outside. Goodsmith and his team were on the hunt for Nazi science, German weaponry more advanced than what the Allies possessed. Goodsmith was scientific director of this top secret mission, codename Operation Alsace, an esoteric and dangerous endeavor that was an offshoot of the Manhattan Project. Goodsmith and his colleagues were far more accustomed to working inside a laboratory than on a battlefield, and yet here they were in the thick of the fight. It was up to these men of science to determine just how close the Third Reich was to waging atomic, biological, or chemical warfare against Allied troops. This was called ABC warfare by Alsace. An untold number of lives depended on the success of the operation. Samuel Goodsmith had qualities that made him the mission's ideal science director. Born in Holland, he spoke Dutch and German fluently. At age 23, he had become famous among fellow physicists for identifying the concept of electronic spin. Two years later, he earned his Ph.D. at the University of Leiden and moved to America to teach. During the war, Goodsmith worked on weapons development through a government-sponsored lab at MIT. This gave him unique insight into the clandestine world of atomic, biological, and chemical warfare and had put him in this chair, reading quickly in the flickering candlelight. Just days before, Goodsmith's team had captured four of Hitler's top nuclear scientists and had learned from them that the Nazis' atomic bomb project had been a failure. This was an unexpected intelligence coup for Alsace and a huge relief. The focus now turned to the Reich's biological weapons program, rumored to be well advanced. Goodsmith and his team of Alsace agents knew that the University of Strasbourg had been doubling as a biological warfare research base for the Third Reich. Once a bastion of French academic prowess, this 400-year-old university had been taken over by the Reich Research Council, Hermann Göring's science organization, in 1941. Since then, the university had been transformed into a model outpost of Nazi science. Most of the university's professors had been replaced with men who were members of the Nazi party and of Heinrich Himmler's SS. On this November night, Goodsmith made the decision to have his team set up camp in Professor Hagen's apartment and read all the documents in a straight shot. Alsace security team members set their guns aside, organized a meal of K-rations on the dining room table, and settled into a long night of cards. Goodsmith and the biological weapons experts Cromarty and Wardenberg sat back in Professor Hagen's easy chairs and worked on getting through all the files. Night fell and it began to snow, adding confusion to the scene outside. Hours passed. Then, Goodsmith and Wardenberg let out a yell at the same moment, remembered Goodsmith, for we had both found papers that suddenly raised the curtain of secrecy for us. There, in Professor Hagen's apartment, in apparently harmless communication, lay hidden a wealth of secret information available to anyone who understood it. Goodsmith was not deciphering code. The papers were not stamped top secret. They were just the usual gossip between colleagues, ordinary memos, Goodsmith recalled. But they were memos that were never meant to be found by American scientists. The plan was for the Third Reich to rule for a thousand years. Of the one hundred prisoners you sent me, Hagen wrote to a colleague at the university, an anatomist named Dr. August Hurt, eighteen died in transport. Only twelve are in a condition suitable for my experiments. 
I therefore request that you send me another one hundred prisoners, between twenty and forty years of age, who are healthy and in a physical condition comparable to soldiers. Heil Hitler, Professor Dr. Eugen Hagen. The document was dated November 15, 1943. For Samuel Goodsmith, the moment was a stunning reveal. Here, casually tucked away in a group of Hagen's personal papers, he had discovered one of the most diabolical secrets of the Third Reich. Nazi doctors were conducting medical experiments on healthy humans. This was new information to the scientific community, but there was equally troubling information in the subtext of the letter as far as biological weapons were concerned. Hagen was a virus expert who specialized in creating vaccines. The fact that he was involved in human medical experiments made a kind of twisted sense to Goodsmith in a way that few others could interpret. In order to successfully unleash a biological weapon against an enemy force, the attacking army had to have already created its own vaccine against the deadly pathogen it intended to spread. This vaccine would act as the shield for its own soldiers and civilians. The biological weapon would act as the sword. The document Goodsmith was looking at was a little more than a year old. How much vaccine progress had the Nazis made since? As Goodsmith stared at the documents in front of him, he was faced with a troubling reality. Once, Eugen Hagen had been a temperate man, a physician dedicated to helping people. In 1932, Dr. Hagen had been awarded a prestigious fellowship by the Rockefeller Foundation in New York City, where he had helped to develop the world's first yellow fever vaccine. In 1937, he had been a contender for the Nobel Prize. Hagen had been one of Germany's leading men of medicine. Now, here he was, testing deadly vaccines on once healthy prisoners from concentration camps supplied to him by Himmler's SS. If a leading doctor like Hagen had been able to conduct these kinds of research experiments with impunity, what else might be going on? Goodsmith and his colleagues scoured Dr. Hagen's papers, paying particular attention to the names of the doctors with whom Hagen corresponded about his prisoner shipments, his vaccine tests, and his future laboratory plans. Goodsmith started putting together a list of Nazi scientists who were now top priorities for Alsace to locate, capture, and interview. Dr. Eugen Hagen would never become a paperclip scientist. After the war, he would flee to the Soviet zone of occupation in Germany and work for the Russians. But among the names discovered in his apartment were two physicians important to Operation Paperclip. They were Dr. Kurt Bloma, Deputy Surgeon General of the Third Reich, and Surgeon General Walter Scheiber. Dr. Bloma was in charge of the Reich's biological weapons programs. Dr. Schreiber was in charge of its vaccines the sword and the shield. Before Hitler rose to power, Blomma and Schreiber had been internationally renowned physicians. Had Nazi science also made monsters of these men? Almost two weeks after the Alsace mission's discovery at Strasbourg, 300 miles to the north, in Germany, a party was underway. There, deep in the dark pine forest of Kosfeld, a magnificent, moated, 800-year-old stone castle called Varlar was being readied for a celebration. The castle was a medieval showpiece of the Munster region, resplendent with turrets, balustrades, and lookout towers. On this night, December 9, 1944, the banquet hall had been decorated in full Nazi party regalia. Trellises of ivy graced the podium. Flags featuring Germany's national eagle and swastika emblem hung from the walls, a motif repeated in each China place setting where the guests of the Third Reich celebrated and dined. Outside, on Castle Varlar's grounds, the snow-covered fields were also being readied. 
For centuries, the castle had been a monastery, its broad lawns used as sacred spaces for Benedictine monks to stroll about and consider God. Now, in the frigid December cold, army technicians made last-minute adjustments to the metal platforms of portable rocket launch pads. On each sat a missile called the V-2. The giant V-2 rocket was the most advanced flying weapon ever created. It was 46 feet long, carried a warhead filled with up to 2,000 pounds of explosives in its nose cone, and could travel a distance of 190 miles at speeds up to five times the speed of sound. Its earlier version, the V-1 flying bomb, had been raining terror down on cities across northern Europe since the first one hit London on June 13, 1944. The V-2 rocket was faster and more fearsome. No Allied fighter aircraft could shoot down the V-2 from the sky, both because of the altitude at which it traveled and the speed of its descent. The specter of it crashing down into population centers annihilating whoever or whatever happened to be there was terrifying. The reverberations from each V-2 rocket explosion spread up to 20 miles, the Christian Science Monitor reported. The V-weapons bred fear. Since the start of the war, Hitler had boasted about fearsome, hitherto unknown, unique weapons that would render his enemies defenseless. Over time, and with the aid of propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, references to these mysterious weapons had been consolidated in a singular, terrifying catchphrase, Nazi wonder weapons, or Wunderwaffe. Now, throughout the summer and fall of 1944, the V weapons made the threat a reality. That the Nazis had unfurled a wonder weapon of such power and potential this late in the war made many across Europe terrified about what else Hitler might have. Plans to evacuate one million civilians from London's city center were put in place as British intelligence officers predicted that a next generation of V-weapons might carry deadly chemical or biological weapons in the nose cone. England issued 4.3 million gas masks to its city dwellers and told people to pray. Major General Walter Dornberger was the man in charge of the rocket programs for the German Army's weapons department. Dornberger was small, bald on top, and when he appeared in photographs alongside Himmler, he often wore a long, shin-length leather coat to match the Reichsfuhrer SS. He was a career soldier. This was his Second World War. He was also a talented engineer. Dornberger held four patents in rocket development and a degree in engineering from the Institute of Technology in Berlin. He was one of four honored guests at the Castle Varlar party. Later, he recalled the scene. Around the castle, in the dark forest, were the launching positions of V-2 troops in our operation against Antwerp. It had been Dornberger's idea to set up mobile launch pads as opposed to firing V-2s from fortified bases in the Reich-controlled part of France. A wise idea, considering Allied forces had been pushing across the continent toward Germany since the Normandy landings in June. Antwerp was Belgium's bustling northernmost port city, located just 137 miles away from the V-2 launch pads at Castle Varlar. For a thousand years, it had been a strategic city in Western Europe, conquered and liberated more than a dozen times. In this war, Belgium had suffered terrible losses under four long years of brutal Nazi rule. Three months prior, on September 4, 1944, the Allies liberated Antwerp. There was joy in the streets when the British 11th Armored Division rolled into town. Since then, American and British forces had been relying heavily on the port of Antwerp to bring in men and materiel to support fighting on the Western Front, and also to prepare for the surge into Germany. Now, in the second week of December 1944, Hitler intended to reclaim Antwerp. The Führer and his inner circle were preparing to launch their last, still-secret counteroffensive in the Ardennes Forest 
and for this, the German army needed Antwerp shut down. The job fell to the V2. The party at Castle Varlar was to be a night of warfare and celebration, with one 42,000-pound liquid-fueled rocket being fired off at the enemy after the next, while the guests honored four of the men who had been instrumental in building the wonder weapon for the Reich. The man at the scientific center of the V-2 rocket program was a 32-year-old aristocrat and wonderkind physicist named Warner von Braun. Von Braun was at Castle Varlar to receive, alongside Dornberger, one of Hitler's highest and most coveted non-combat decorations, the Knight's Cross of the War Service Cross. Also receiving the honor were Walter Riedel, the top scientist in the Rocket Design Bureau, and Heinz Kuhns, a representative from the Reich's Armaments Ministry. These four medals were to be presented by Albert Speer, Hitler's Minister of Armaments and War Production. Armaments are the aggregate of a nation's military strength, and as Minister of Weapons, Speer was in charge of scientific armaments programs for the Third Reich. He joined the Nazi Party in 1931 at the age of 26 and rose to power in the party as Hitler's architect. In that role, he created buildings that symbolized the Reich and represented its ideas and quickly became a favorite, joining Hitler's inner circle. In February 1942, Hitler made Speer his Minister of Armaments and War Production after the former minister, Fritz Tott, died in a plane crash. By the following month, Speer had persuaded Hitler to make all other elements of the German economy second to armaments production, which Hitler did by decree. Total productivity in armaments increased by 59.6%, Speer claimed after the war. At the age of 37, Albert Speer was now responsible for all science and technology programs necessary for waging war. Of the hundreds of weapons projects he was involved in, it was the V-2 that he favored most. Like von Braun, Speer was from a wealthy, well-respected German family, not quite a baron, but someone who wished he was. Speer liked to exchange ideas with youthful, ambitious rocket scientists like Werner von Braun. He admired young men able to work unhampered by bureaucratic obstacles and pursue ideas which at times sounded thoroughly utopian. As for General Dornberger, the Castle Varlar celebration was a crowning moment of his career. The pomp and power thrilled him, he later recalled. It was a scene, Dornberger said after the war, the excitement of the evening, the blackness of the night. At one point during the meal, in between courses, the lights inside the castle were turned off and the grand banquet hall was plunged into darkness. After a moment of anticipatory silence, a tall curtain at the end of the long hall swung open, allowing guests to gaze out across the dark, wintry lawns. The room suddenly lit up with the flickering light of the rocket's exhaust and was shaken by the reverberations of its engines, remembered Dornberger. Outside, perched atop a mobile rocket launch pad, the spectacle began. An inferno of burning rocket fuel blasted out the bottom of the V-2, powering the massive rocket into flight, headed toward Belgium. For Dornberger, rocket launches instilled unbelievable feelings of pride. Once, during an earlier launch, the general wept with joy. On this night, the excitement focus alternated, from a rocket launch to an award decoration, then back to a rocket launch again. After each launch, Speer decorated one of the medal recipients. The crowd clapped and cheered and sipped champagne until the banquet hall was again filled with darkness and the next rocket fired off the castle lawn. This particular party would end, but the celebrations continued elsewhere. The team returned to Pinamunda, the isolated island facility on the Baltic coast where the V-weapons had been conceived and originally produced. And on the night of December 16, 1944, a party in the Pinamunda's Officers Club again honored the men. Von Braun and Dornberger, wearing crisp tuxedos, 
each with a knight's cross from Hitler dangling around his neck, read telegrams of congratulations to Nazi officials as the group toasted their success with flutes of champagne. In the eyes of the Reich, Hitler's rocketeers had good reason to celebrate. In Antwerp, at 3.20 p.m., a V-2 rocket had smashed into the Rex Cinema, where almost 1,200 people were watching a Gary Cooper film. It was the highest death toll from a single rocket attack during the war, 567 casualties. The Allies were obsessed with the Nazis' V-weapons. If they had been ready earlier, the course of the war could have been different, explained General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. It seemed likely that if the German had succeeded in perfecting and using these new weapons six months earlier than he did, our invasion of Europe would have proved exceedingly difficult, perhaps impossible, Eisenhower said. Instead, circumstance worked in the Allies' favor, and by the fall of 1944, Allied forces had a firm foothold on the European continent. But back in Washington, D.C., inside the Pentagon, a secret, U.S.-only, rocket-related scientific intelligence mission was in the works. Colonel Gervais William Trichel was the first chief of the newly created rocket branch inside U.S. Army Ordnance. Now, Trichel was putting together a group of Army scientists to send to Europe as part of Special Mission V-2. The United States was 20 years behind Germany in rocket development. But Trichel saw an opportunity to close that gap and save the U.S. Army millions of dollars in research and development costs. Trichel's team would capture these rockets and everything related to them for shipment back to the United States. The mission would begin as soon as the U.S. Army arrived in the town of Nordhausen, Germany. The British had the lead on intelligence regarding V-weapons. Their photo interpreters had determined exactly where the rockets were being assembled, at a factory in central Germany in the naturally fortified Haars Mountains. Trying to bomb this factory from the air was useless because the facility had been built underground in an old gypsum mine. While the Americans made plans inside the Pentagon, and while Von Braun and his colleagues drank champagne at Pinamunde, the men actually assembling the Reich's V-2 rockets endured an entirely different existence. Nazi science had brought back the institution of slavery all across the Reich, and concentration camp prisoners were being worked to death in the service of war. The workers building rockets included thousands of grotesquely malnourished prisoners who toiled away inside a sprawling, underground tunnel complex known by its euphemism, Middlework, the Middleworks. This place was also called Nordhausen, after the town, and Dora, the code name for its concentration camp. To average Germans, the Haars was a land of fairy tales, of dark forests and stormy mountains. To those who read Goethe, here was the place where the witches and the devil collided at Brocken Mountain. Even in America, in Disney's popular film Fantasia, these mountains had meaning. They were where forces of evil gathered to do their handiwork. But at the end of the Second World War, the Reich's secret, subterranean penal colony at Nordhausen was fact, not fiction. The Middlework was a place where ordinary citizens of France, Holland, Belgium, Italy, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Russia, Poland, and Germany had been transformed into the Third Reich's slaves. The underground factory at Nordhausen had been in operation since late August 1943, after a Royal Air Force attack on the Pinamunda facility up north forced armaments production to move elsewhere. The day after that attack, Heinrich Himmler, Reichsführer SS, paid a visit to Hitler and proposed they move rocket production underground. Hitler agreed, and the SS was put in charge of supplying slaves and overseeing facilities construction. 
the individual in charge of expanding Nordhausen from a mine to a tunnel complex was Brigadier General Hans Kammler, a civil engineer and architect who, earlier in his career, built the gas chambers at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The first group of 107 slave laborers arrived at the middlework in late August 1943. They came from the Buchenwald concentration camp, located 50 miles to the southeast. The wrought iron sign over the Buchenwald gate read, Jedem das Seine. Everyone gets what he deserves. Digging tunnels was hard labor, but the SS feared prisoners might revolt if they had mining tools, so the men dug with their bare hands. The old mine had been used by the German army as a fuel storage facility. There were two long tunnels running parallel into the mountain that needed to be widened now for rail cars. There were also smaller cross tunnels every few meters that needed to be lengthened to create more workspace. In September 1943, machinery and personnel arrived from Pinamunda. Notable among the staff, and important to Operation Paperclip, was the man in charge of production, a high school graduate named Arthur Rudolph. Rudolph's specialty was rocket engine assembly. He had worked under Von Braun in this capacity since 1934. Rudolph was a Nazi ideologue. He joined the party before there was any national pressure to do so in 1931. What he lacked in academic pedigree, he made up for as a slave driver. As the Middlework Operations Director, Rudolph worked with the SS construction staff to build the underground facility. Then he oversaw production on the assembly lines for V-Weapons scientific director, Warner Von Braun. The prisoners worked 12-hour shifts, seven days a week, putting together V-Weapons. By the end of the first two months, there were 8,000 men living and working in this cramped underground space. There was no fresh air in the tunnels, no ventilation system, no water, and very little light. Blasting went on day and night, and the dust after every blast was so thick that it was impossible to see five steps ahead, read one report. Laborers slept inside the tunnels on wood bunk beds. There were no washing facilities and no sanitation. Latrines were barrels cut in half. The workers suffered and died from starvation, dysentery, pleurisy, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and phlegmasia from beatings. The men were walking skeletons, skin stretched over bones. Some perished from ammonia burns to the lungs. Others died by being crushed from the weight of the rocket parts they were forced to carry. The dead were replaceable. Humans and machine parts went into the tunnels. Rockets and corpses came out. Workers who were slow on the production lines were beaten to death. Insubordinates were garroted or hanged. After the war, war crimes investigators determined that approximately half of the 60,000 men eventually brought to Nordhausen were worked to death. The Middlework wasn't the first slave labor camp created and run by the Third Reich. The SS recognized the value of slave labor in the mid-1930s. Humans could be selected from the ever-growing prisoner populations at concentration camps and put to work in quarries and factories. By 1939, the SS had masterminded a vast network of state-sponsored slavery across Nazi-occupied Europe through an innocuous-sounding division called the SS Business Administration Main Office. This office was overseen by Heinrich Himmler, but required partnerships. These included many companies from the private sector, including IG Farben, Volkswagen, Heinkel, and Steyr Daimler Puck. The most significant partner was Albert Speer's Ministry of Armaments and War Production. When Speer took over as armaments minister in February 1942, his first challenge, he said, was to figure out how to galvanize war production and make it more efficient. Speer's solution was to get rid of bureaucracy and use more slave laborers. 
He himself had been connected to the slave labor programs with the SS for years, including when he was an architect. Speer's buildings required vast amounts of stone, which was quarried by concentration camp laborers from Mauthausen and Flossenburg. The SS Business Administration main office specialized in engineering dangerous and fast construction projects, as was the case with the V2 facility at Nordhausen. Pay no attention to the human victims, Brigadier General Hans Kamler told his staff overseeing construction in the tunnels. The work must proceed and be finished in the shortest possible time. In the first six months of tunnel work, 2,882 laborers died. Albert Speer praised Kamler for what he considered to be a great achievement in engineering, setting things up so efficiently and so fast. Your work far exceeds anything ever done in Europe and is unsurpassed even by American standards, wrote Speer. There were other reasons why the use of slave labor was so important to wonder weapons production, namely the secrecy it ensured. The V-2 was a classified weapons project. The less Allied intelligence knew about it, the better for the Reich. When Albert Speer and Heinrich Himmler met with Hitler in August of 1943 to brief him on the benefits of using slave labor, Himmler reminded the Fuhrer that if the Reich's entire workforce were to be concentration camp prisoners, all contact with the outside world would be eliminated. Prisoners don't even receive mail. In the spring of 1944, V-2 production had accelerated to the point where the SS provided middle work managers with their own concentration camp, Dora, which in turn grew to include 30 subcamps. The man in charge of personnel at the middle work, its general manager, was a 46-year-old engineer named George Rickhe, an ardent Nazi and party member since 1931. On Rickey's resume, later used by the Americans to employ him, Rickey described himself as Middlework General Manager, Production of All V and Rocket Weapons, Construction of Underground Mass Production Facilities, Director of Entire Concern. As General Manager of the sprawling subterranean enterprise, Rickey was in charge of renting slaves from the SS. As a former DMAG Armor Works executive, he had already overseen the creation of more than 1.5 million square feet of underground tunnels around Berlin, all dug by slaves. With this experience, Rickey had become a veteran negotiator between private industry and the SS Business Administration main office in the procurement of slaves. The SS began, in effect, a rent-a-slave service to firms and government enterprises at a typical rate of four marks a day for unskilled workers and six marks for skilled ones, writes V-Weapon historian Michael J. Newfeld. The slaves were disposable. When they died, they were replaced. At Nordhausen, the SS gave Ricke a discount, charging the middle work between two and three Reichsmarks per man per day. On May 6, 1944, days after becoming general manager of the middlework, Rickey called a meeting to discuss how best to acquire more prisoners for slave labor. Werner von Braun, Walter Dornberger, and Arthur Rudolph were all present. It was decided that the SS should enslave another 1,800 skilled French workers to fill the shoes of those who had already been worked to death. The record indicates that von Braun, Dornberger, and Rudolf showed no objection to Rickey's plan. In August, the same problem was again at issue. This time, Warner von Braun initiated the action himself. On August 15, 1944, von Braun wrote a letter to a middlework engineer, Albin Sawatsky, describing a new laboratory he wanted to set up inside the tunnels. Von Braun told Sawatsky that to expedite the process, he had taken it upon himself to procure the slave laborers from the Buchenwald concentration camp. 
During my last visit to the Middlework, you proposed to me that we use the good technical education of detainees available to you from Buchenwald, wrote Von Braun. I immediately looked into your proposal by going to Buchenwald myself, together with Dr. Simon, a colleague, to seek out more qualified detainees. I have arranged their transfer to the Mittelwerk with Standartenfuhrer Colonel Pister, the Commandant of Buchenwald. In December of 1944, with slave laborers dying by the thousands in the Mittelwerk tunnels and V-2 rockets crashing into civilian population centers causing mayhem and terror across Europe, it would have been hard to imagine that some of those directly responsible would ever be regarded as individuals of great value to the United States. And yet in less than a year, Arthur Rudolph, George Rickey, Warner Von Braun, Major General Walter Dornberger, and other rocket engineers would secretly be heading to America to work. In the last days of World War II, few would have ever believed such a thing. But the war's last days were coming. Just three weeks after the celebration at Castle Varlar, Albert Speer found himself with a lot less to celebrate. Visiting the Belgian border town of Hufeliz, accompanied by an SS Armored Force commander named Joseph Sepp Dietrich, Speer had what he would describe in his 1969 memoir as a realization. Gazing upon the bodies of hundreds of dead German soldiers killed in a recent Allied bomber attack, Speer decided the war was over for the Reich. The German war machine could no longer compete against the force and will of the Allied offensive. Howling and exploding bombs, clouds illuminated in red and yellow hues, droning motors, and no defense anywhere. I was stunned by this scene of military impotence which Hitler's military miscalculations had given such a grotesque setting, Speer wrote. Standing there in Hufeliz, Speer, Hitler's Minister of Armaments and War Production, decided to flee from the danger zone. At 4 a.m. on the morning of December 31st, under cover of darkness, Speer and an aide climbed into a private car and hurried east headed for the comforts of a sprawling mountaintop castle outside Frankfurt called Schloss Kronzberg, or Castle Kronzberg. Built on a steep, rocky cliff in the Taunus Mountains, the castle was one of Hermann Göring's Luftwaffe, German Air Force, headquarters. Just as many of Hitler's scientists would soon become American scientists, so would many of the Reich's headquarters and command posts become key facilities used for Project Paperclip. Castle Kranzberg also had a storied past in the history of warfare. The structure dated from the 11th century, but its original foundation had been built on top of the ruins of a ring wall fortification constructed in the time of the Roman Empire. Battles had been waged in this region on and off for over 2,000 years. Castle Kranzberg was grand and splendid, built piecemeal over the centuries to include watchtowers, half-timbered meeting halls, and stone walls. It had 150-odd rooms, including a wing that had been redesigned and renovated by Albert Speer in 1939, when Speer was still Hitler's architect. At Hitler's behest, Speer added several state-of-the-art defense features to Kranzberg Castle including a 1,200-square-foot underground bunker complex, complete with poison gas airlocks designed to protect inhabitants from a chemical warfare attack. Now here was Speer, having fled from the front lines to hide out in the Citadel. The next time he would live here, it would be as a prisoner of the Americans. Hitler had his own headquarters just a few miles away. Adlerhorst, or the Eagle's Nest, had also been designed by Speer. It was a series of small cement bunkers at the edge of a long stretch of valley near the spa town of Bad Nauheim. Few knew it was there. From Adlerhorst, Hitler had been directing the Ardennes campaign, the Battle of the Bulge. 
Arriving at Kranzberg Castle late at night, after fleeing Hufeliz, Speer and his aide were shown to their quarters, where they freshened up before driving over to Adlerhorst to celebrate the coming year, 1945, with Hitler. When Speer arrived at the Eagle's Nest at 2.30 a.m. on January 1st, Hitler, who never drank, appeared drunk. He was in the grip of a permanent euphoria, remembered Speer. Hitler made a toast and promised that the present low point in the war would soon be overcome. His, Hitler's, magnetic gifts were still operative, Speer later recalled. In the end, Germany would be victorious, Hitler said. This was enough for Speer to change his mind about losing the war. Two weeks later, on January 15th, with the war allegedly still winnable, Adolf Hitler boarded his armored train and began the 19-hour trip to Berlin, where he would spend the rest of his life living underground in the Führer bunker, Führer Hauptquartier, or FHQ, in Berlin. The bunker was a fortress of engineering prowess, built beneath the new Reich Chancellery. Its roof, buried under several tons of earth, was 16 feet thick. Its walls were six feet wide. Living inside the Führer bunker, with its low ceilings and crypt-like corridors, was like being stranded in a cement submarine, said one of Hitler's SS honor guards, Captain Behrmann. Behrmann described a bat-like routine of part-time prisoners kept in a cave, miserable rats in a musty cement tomb in Berlin. Not everyone shared the sentiment. Months later, when Middlework General Manager George Riquet was angling to get a job from the Americans, he would boast to the Army officers that he'd overseen construction of the Grand Führer Bunker in Berlin. Now, in mid-January 1945, with Hitler moving back to Berlin, it was decided that Speer should head east to Silesia in Poland. There he was to survey what was going on. Important chemical weapons factories had been built in Poland, armaments ventures jointly pursued with IG Farben, a chemical industry conglomerate. The location of these facilities was significant. Poland was, for the most part, out of reach of Allied bombing campaigns. But a new threat was bearing down. The Soviets had just launched their great offensive in Poland a final military campaign that would take the Red Army all the way to Berlin. Germany was being invaded from both sides, east and west, squeezed as in a vice. The same day that Hitler left the Eagle's Nest, Speer was driven to Poland. There he witnessed firsthand what little was left of the Reich's war machine. On January 21st, he went to the village of Opelin to check in with Field Marshal Ferdinand Schorner newly appointed commander of the army group, and learned that very little of the Wehrmacht's fighting forces remained intact. Nearly every soldier and every war machine had been captured or destroyed. Burnt-out tank holes littered the snow-covered roads. Thousands of dead German soldiers lay in ditches along the roadsides, but many more dead soldiers swung eerily from trees. Those who dared desert the German army had been killed by Field Marshal Schorner, a ferocious and fanatical Nazi Party loyalist who had earned his moniker, Schorner the Bloody. The dead German soldiers had placards hanging around their necks. I am a deserter, they read. I have declined to defend German women and children, and therefore I have been hanged. During Speer's meeting with Schorner, he was told that no one had any idea exactly how far the Red Army was from overtaking the very spot where they were standing, only that the onslaught was inevitable. Speer checked into an otherwise empty hotel and tried to sleep. For decades, this night remained vivid in Albert Speer's mind. In my room hung an etching by Kate Kolwitz, La Carmagnole, remembered Speer as an old man. It showed a yowling mob dancing with hate-contorted faces around a guillotine. Off to one side, a weeping woman cowered on the ground. The weird figures of the etching haunted my fitful sleep, wrote Speer.
There, in his Oplin hotel room, Albert Speer was overcome by a thought that had to have been preoccupying many Nazis' minds. After Germany, what will become of me? The guillotine? Will I be torn apart by a yowling mob? Jedem das Zeine. Could it be true? Does everyone get what he deserves? The following week, on January 30th, 1945, Speer wrote a memorandum to Hitler outlining the huge losses in Silesia. The war is lost, is how Speer's report began. Widespread destruction of evidence would now begin. Chapter 2. Destruction Ninety miles southeast of Speer's Oplin hotel room, chaos was unfolding at the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. Speer's chairman of the ultra-secret Committee C for Chemical Weapons, a chemist named Dr. Otto Ambrose, had documents to destroy. It was January 17, 1945, and every German in a position of power at Auschwitz, from the army officers to the IG Farben officials, was trying to flee. Not Ambrose. He would not leave the labor extermination camp for another six days. Otto Ambrose was a fastidious man. His calculations were exact, his words carefully chosen, his fingernails always manicured. He wore his hair neatly oiled and parted. In addition to being Hitler's favorite chemist, Ambrose was the manager of I.G. Farben's synthetic rubber and fuel factory at Auschwitz. With the Red Army bearing down, the Farben board members had ordered the destruction and removal of all classified paperwork. Ambrose and colleague Walter Dörfeldt were at Auschwitz to do the job. In addition to being the plant manager of this hellish place, Ambrose was the youngest member on Farben's board of directors. All over the camp, SS guards were destroying evidence. Crematoria 2 and 3 were being dismantled, and a plan to dynamite Crematoria 5 was in effect. Some of the SS officers were already fleeing on horseback, while others were preparing to evacuate prisoners for the death march. Whips cracked, dogs barked, tanks painted white for camouflage outside the camp rolled through the muddy streets. Rumors swirled. The Red Army was only a few miles away. A female chemist in Farben's Bunawerk Polymerization Department asked the prisoner and future world-renowned writer Primo Levy, a chemist by training, to fix her bicycle tire. After the war, Levy recalled how strange it was to hear a Farben employee use the word please with a Jewish inmate like himself. Auschwitz was the Reich's largest extermination center. As a concentration camp, it consisted of three separate but symbiotic camps. Auschwitz I, the main camp, Auschwitz II, the Birkenau gas chambers and crematoria, and Auschwitz III, a labor concentration camp run by the chemical giant I.G. Farben. Since April 7, 1942, I.G. Farben had been building the Reich's largest chemical plant at Auschwitz, using a workforce of slave laborers selected from the Auschwitz train car platforms. Farben called their facility I.G. Auschwitz. I.G. Auschwitz was the first corporate concentration camp in the Third Reich. The barracks in which the slave laborers lived and died was officially called Monowitz. Those of us who lived there called it Buna, recalls Gerhard Marschowski, a survivor of the camp. Marschowski was a 19-year-old Jewish boy spared the gas chamber because he was of use to I.G. Auschwitz as an electrician. That he was still alive in the second week of January 1945 was something of a miracle. He had arrived at Auschwitz on April 20, 1943 which meant that he had been there for a year and nine months. At Buna, the average lifespan of a slave laborer was three months. Many of Gerhard Marschowski's friends had long since been worked to death or had been murdered for minor infractions, like hiding a piece of food. 
Gerhard Marschalski remembers January 18, 1945, with clarity because it was his last day at Auschwitz. It was still dark outside when the SS burst into the barracks. They shouted, Get up! March! They had large guns, thick jackets, and dogs, Marschalski recalls. He put on his shoes and hurried outside. There, 9,000 emaciated, starving inmates from Buna were lining up in neat rows. Marschalski heard cannon fire in the distance and the crack of firearms close by. There was chaos all around. SS guards were burning evidence. Bonfires of papers sent ashes up into the dark sky. Snow fell fast, then faster. There was a blizzard on the way. The guards, dressed in warm coats and boots, waved submachine guns. Dogs on leather leashes barked and snarled, Gerhard Marschalski recalls. Wearing thin pajamas, the prisoners at Buna Monowitz began a death march toward the German interior. Within 48 hours, 60% of them would be dead. Primo Levi was not part of the death march. A week before, he had contracted scarlet fever and had been sent to the infectious diseases ward. He had a high temperature and a strawberry tongue, remembered Aldo Moscati, an Italian doctor prisoner who tended to him. With a 104 degree fever, I was extremely feeble and could not even walk, Primo Levi explained after the war. Lying supine in the infectious diseases ward, he listened to the sounds of the emptying camp. On January 21st, a memorandum from Berlin ordered all Farben employees to leave. The last train for Germans leaving Auschwitz, transporting mostly IG Farben's female staff from the camp, left that same afternoon. Yet Otto Ambrose stayed behind. Ambrose's official title was plant manager of Bunowerk 4 and managing director of the fuel production facility at IG Auschwitz. He had been involved in the facility since January 1941, back when Farben's original plans were being drawn. Ambrose had chosen the site location and sketched out the original blueprints for the plant. He was also the man who invented synthetic rubber for the Reich. Tanks, trucks, and airplanes all require rubber for tires and treads. And during wartime, this feat was considered so important to the Reich's ability to wage war that Ambrose had been awarded one million Reichsmarks by the Fuhrer. Finally, on January 23, 1945, Ambrose left the concentration camp. Only random prisoners remained. Inmates like Primo Levi, who were too weak to march and had not been killed by the SS, lay in the infectious diseases ward. When Levy's fever finally broke and he ventured outside, he found groups of prisoners roaming around the camp looking for food. Levy found a silo filled with frozen potatoes. He made a fire and cooked his first food in days. On January 27th, he was dragging a dead friend's corpse to a large grave dug in a distant field when he spotted four men on horseback approaching the camp from far away. They were wearing white, camouflage clothing, but as they got closer, he could see that at the center of the soldiers' caps there was a bright red star. The Red Army had arrived. Auschwitz was liberated. Otto Ambrose was already on the way to Falkenhagen, Germany, to destroy evidence in another Farben factory there. Speer headed back to Berlin. Neither man dared travel north inside Poland where a second armaments factory the two men were jointly involved in was also in jeopardy of being captured by the Soviets. At this facility, called Duernfort after the small riverside village in which it was located, I.G. Farben produced chemical weapons, deadly nerve agents, on an industrial scale. On January 24, 1945, the day after Ambrose fled Auschwitz, Farben had given the word to evacuate Duernfort and destroy whatever evidence remained there. All munitions were loaded onto rail cars and trucks and sent to depots in the West. The destruction of evidence was now becoming standard operating procedures at laboratories, research facilities, and armaments factories across the Reich. 
And while Nazi Germany faced imminent collapse, its scientists, engineers, and businessmen had their futures to think about. All across Nazi-occupied Poland, German forces were retreating en masse as the Red Army continued to shred the Eastern Front. On February 5, 1945, 170 miles northwest of Auschwitz, the Soviets captured the village of Duernfurt. Soviet soldiers took over the town's castle, built during the 17th and 18th centuries, and drank up its wine cellar. The castle, with its fairy tale like conical spires, quickly transformed into a scene of wild debauchery, with inebriated Russian soldiers singing rowdy victory songs. The situation got so out of control that Russian commanders suspended fighting until order could be restored. This made for a perfect opportunity for a team of Nazi commandos hiding in the forest to launch a daring and unprecedented raid. Less than a half a mile away, one of the Reich's most prized wonder weapons facilities lay hidden underground. Camouflaged in a forest of pine trees, inside a large complex of underground bomb-proof bunkers, a workforce of 560 white-collar Germans and 3,000 slave laborers had been mass-producing, since 1942, liquid tabin, a deadly nerve agent the very existence of which was unknown to the outside world. Tabin was one of Hitler's most jealously guarded secrets, a true wonder weapon of the most diabolical kind. Similar to a pesticide, the organophosphate tabin was one of the most deadly substances in the world. A tiny drop to the skin could kill an individual in minutes or sometimes seconds. Exposure meant the glands and muscles would hyperstimulate and the respiratory system would fail. Paralysis would set in and breathing would cease. At Duernfort, where accidents had happened, a human's death by tabin gas resembled the frenetic last moments of an ant sprayed with insecticide. Like the synthetic rubber and fuel factory at Auschwitz, the nerve agent production facility at Duernfurt was owned and operated by IG Farben. And here, the Speer Ministry worked with Farben to fill aerial bombs with Tabin that could eventually be deployed from Luftwaffe planes. No one in the inner circle knew for sure when, or if, Hitler would finally concede to many of his ministers' wishes and allow for a chemical weapons attack against the Allies. But as evidenced at Duernfurt, the opportunity was real. Enough poison gas had been produced here to decimate the population of London or Paris on any given day. Despite the overwhelming onslaught of Red Army troops to this region in February of 1945, Hitler remained determined to keep the secrets of Tabin out of enemy hands. On the morning of February 5, 1945, Major General Max Sachsenhausen of the Reich's 17th Field Replacement Battalion and his troops were hiding in the forest along the banks of the Oder River. Sachsenhausen's commando force was made up of several hundred soldiers, but he also had a unique secondary contingent of men, namely 82 scientists and technicians. Some were army scientists, but most were IG Farben employees and chemical weapons experts. Sachsenheimer's mission was to protect the scientists while they scrubbed Farben's facility of any and all traces of Tabin. The Duernfort complex was a sprawling, state-of-the-art production plant. Speer's Armaments and War Production Ministry had paid Farben nearly 200 million Reichsmarks to build and operate it. The facility had been secretly and skillfully designed and managed by Otto Ambrose. As he had done with IG Auschwitz, Ambrose had overseen every element of this chemical weapons factory dating from the winter of 1941, when the thick forest here was first cleared of pine trees by 120 concentration camp slaves. As Nazi Germany blended industry, war-making, and genocide, few corporations were as central a player as IG Farben. The chemical concern was the largest corporation in Europe and the fourth largest corporation in the world. IG Farben owned the patent on Zyklon B, 
and perhaps no single person at Farben was as central a figure in this equation as Otto Ambrose had been. For his work as chairman of Committee C, the Chemical Weapons Committee inside the Speer Ministry, Ambrose was given the prestigious title of military economy leader, Verwig Schafsführer. He was awarded the War Merit Cross first and second class and the Knight's Cross of the War Merit Cross, which was similar to the award bestowed on Dornberger and von Braun. There was a second scientist who played an important role in chemical weapons, a man who, like Otto Ambrose, would be targeted for Operation Paperclip. This was SS Brigade Führer Dr. Walter Schieber, a chemist by training, Speer's deputy and director of the Armaments Supply Office. Schieber was a hardcore Nazi ideologue and a member of Reichsführer SS Himmler's personal staff. Unusually corpulent for an SS officer, his official car and airplane required retrofitting to accommodate his 275-pound frame. With Hitler's physician, Karl Brandt, Schieber was in charge of gas mask production, a requisite for troop defense if chemical warfare was to be waged. As with biological weapons, the sword needs a shield, and by January of 1945, Schieber had overseen the production of 46.1 million gas masks. Their reliability had been tested at Dürrenfort on concentration camp prisoners. The stories that would emerge during the Nuremberg trials about such tests were ghoulish, including locking prisoners in glass rooms and spraying them with nerve agent. War crimes investigators would later debate whether or not these actions were pilot programs for the gas chambers. The full story of how, and to what extent, Dr. Walter Schieber worked for the U.S. military after the war, and also for the CIA, has never been fully explained until this book. Only weeks before the Red Army took Dürrenfort, overran its castle, and drank all its wine, thousands of concentration camp slave laborers had been toiling away at Farben's secret chemical weapons plant, performing the deadliest of jobs. Wearing double-layer rubber suits and bubble-shaped helmets, prisoners filled artillery shells and bomb casings with nerve agent, marking each munition in a secret code indicating tab and nerve agent, three green rings of paint. The prisoner's suits worked similar to deep-sea diving suits. Attached to the back of each helmet was a tube delivering breathable air. But the air tube was short and gave workers very little room to move. If a man accidentally detached from the air source, he would be exposed to the lethal vapors through the breathing tube and die. But on the morning of February 5, 1945, the facility was empty. Not a chemist or a slave laborer remained. The munitions had been moved, documentary evidence destroyed, and all the IG Farben employees had fled. The prisoners had been evacuated by their SS guards three weeks before. Wearing prisoner pajamas and ill-fitting wooden work shoes, the Dewar and Fort laborers were marched west toward the German interior. Witnesses in nearby villages described a column of 3,000 walking corpses. Temperatures in the area reached negative 18 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time the prisoners reached the Grossrossen concentration camp, 50 miles to the southwest, two-thirds of them had died of exposure. Now, working on Hitler's orders, a technical team was preparing to return to Farben's secret facility for a final scrub of Tauben residue. In the freezing, pre-dawn air, the two chemists, 80 technicians, and a group of German commandos donned double-layer rubber suits, pulled gas masks over their heads, and stole down the banks of the Oder River. They moved quietly across a partially bombed-out railroad bridge, walked slowly down the railroad tracks, and headed to the chemical weapons plant. The protective suits were cumbersome, and it took the technical team 65 minutes to travel less than half a mile. Reaching the plant, the group made its way into the production facility that housed massive, silver-lined kettles in which the nerve agent was made. 
Each kettle sat inside an operating chamber enclosed in double glass walls, encircling a complex ventilation system of double-walled pipes. While one group got to work decontaminating the chambers with ammonia and steam, another group scoured the surfaces of the munitions filling factory where so many slave laborers had met death. The commandos kept guard. While the technicians scrubbed, Two and a half miles downriver, Major General Soxenheimer's remaining platoon of soldiers sprang into action. They launched artillery shells at sleeping Russian forces in a diversionary feint. The Red Army reorganized and retaliated, and by lunchtime, eighteen Soviet tanks were engaged in fierce fighting with Soxenheimer's troops. The battle, a footnote in the annals of war, lasted just long enough for I.G. Farben's technical team to get in, get out, and disappear. Not for several days did the Red Army finally stumble upon Farben's chemical weapons facility at Duernfort. By then, it was void of people and tabin, but otherwise entirely intact. As the Russians examined the facility, scrubbed immaculately clean, it became clear to the commanders that whatever this facility had produced must have been considered of great value to the Reich. The laboratory layout bore signs of chemical weapons production, and the Soviet army called in their own chemical weapons experts from the 16th and 18th Chemical Brigades. The factory was dismantled, crated, and shipped back to the Soviet Union for future use. What had been produced here in the forest remained a mystery to its new owners, the Russians, for a little over a year. By 1946, the entire chemical weapons factory at Duernfort would be reassembled in a little town outside Stalingrad called Bekatovka, and the plant given the Russian code name Chemical Works No. 91. The Soviets themselves then began producing tab and nerve agent on an industrial scale. By 1948, the Soviet military chemical textbook would list Tabin as part of the Red Army stockpile. But 1948 was so far away. So much would happen with America and Hitler's chemists between 1945 and 1948, most of it predicated on the emerging Soviet threat. Back in Berlin, Hitler read the first page of Speer's report and ordered it filed away. Then Hitler became enraged. His furor was likely exacerbated by a conference taking place on the Crimea Peninsula at Yalta beginning February 4, 1945. It was to last for eight days. There, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin were confirming their commitment to demand Germany's unconditional surrender. There would be no bargaining, the three heads of state declared, no deals made with the Nazis. The end of the war would mean the end of the Third Reich. War criminals would be tried, justice meted out. The idea of what defined justice varied dramatically from power to power. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill wanted Nazi leaders to be treated as outlaws. He argued that they should be lined up and shot rather than put on trial. The Premier of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, rather unexpectedly argued for no executions without trial. President Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted a war crimes trial. What all parties agreed on was that after the surrender, Germany would be broken up into three zones of occupation. Soon, France's involvement would make it four. When Hitler learned of the Allies' plan to divvy up the spoils of Germany, he became furious. Then he called on Albert Speer. If the war is lost, Hitler famously told Speer, the nation will also perish. This fate is inevitable. If Germany loses the war, Hitler said, the people deserved existential punishment for being weak. What will remain after this struggle will be, in any case, only the inferior ones, since the good ones have fallen, Hitler said. Following this logic, Hitler decreed that Speer's ministry need not provide German citizens with even the most basic necessities, including shelter and food. He told Speer that if Speer were ever to give him another memorandum saying the war was unwinnable and that negotiations with the enemy should be considered, 
Hitler would consider this an act of treason punishable by death. Hitler then issued a nationwide scorched earth policy. Speer was to help organize the complete destruction of all German infrastructure, military and civilian, from its transportation and communication systems to its bridges and dams. Officially entitled Demolitions on Reich Territory, this order became known as the Nero Decree, or Nero Befell, invoking the Roman Emperor Nero, who allegedly engineered the Great Fire of 64 AD and then watched Rome burn. In central Germany, in the naturally fortified Harz Mountains, production of V-weapons continued at a frenzied pace, despite every indication that Germany would soon lose the war. By late February 1945, conditions inside the Nordhausen tunnels had reached a cataclysm. It was bitterly cold, thousands were starving to death, and there was barely any food. Watery broth was all the prisoners had to live on. The Nordhausen Dora concentration camp was being overrun with new prisoners arriving on the death marches from Auschwitz and Grossrosen in the east. Some came on foot and others came in cattle cars. Many arrived dead. Dora's crematorium was overwhelmed. In this climate, Werner von Braun and General Dornberger pressed on with plans to create a greater number of rockets each day. Since moving his offices from the Pinamunda facility to the Harz Mountains, von Braun had been given a promotion. Now he was head of what was called the Middle Bow Dora Planning Office, a division within Himmler's SS. Von Braun lived just a few miles from the Nordhausen complex, in a villa that had been confiscated from a Jewish factory owner years before. Each day he drove to his office in Bly Sharoda, 11 miles from the tunnel complex, where he drafted designs for new and better test stands and launch ramps for the V-2. Despite the reality that the war was lost, the area was abuzz with new armaments factories being built dug by workers from some of the 40-odd sub-camps now tied to Middlebow Dora, Michael J. Neufeld explains. Von Braun's vision was to escalate rocket production from two or three rockets a day to 200 rockets a day. To prepare for this ambitious expansion, he commandeered factories, schools, and mines throughout the region. But rocket assembly was dependent on workers, and the slave laborers in Nordhausen were now dying at an ever-increasing rate. Von Braun had to have known this. He visited the underground tunnels in an official capacity ten times during the winter of 1945. For the emaciated slave laborers who had managed to stay alive, trying to assemble missiles in filthy, unfinished tunnels without food, water, or sanitation in the bitter cold of winter had become more and more difficult, and it showed in their work. In skies across Europe, these hastily constructed rockets began breaking apart in flight, and in the pine forests of northern Germany, including those around Castle Varlar, quickly assembled rockets were exploding on their mobile launch pads. The managers at Middlework suspected sabotage. To send a message, public hangings were held. Prisoners were hanged up to 57 in one day, read one war crimes report. They were hanged in the tunnels with the help of an electrically controlled crane, a dozen at a time, their hands bound behind their back, a piece of wood was put in their mouth to prevent shouting. The hangings were carried out directly above the V-2 production lines. Laborers were forced to watch their fellow prisoners suffer an agonizingly slow death. In solidarity, a group of Russian and Ukrainian prisoners staged a revolt. The suspects were rounded up. Middlework managers and SS guards decided to make an example of them. After these men were hanged, their bodies were left dangling for a day. Only after Arthur Rudolph, the Middlework Operations Director, received a memo from one of his German engineers asking when they were going to get their crane back were the bodies taken down. In addition to Von Braun's recent promotion to head of the Middlebau Dora Planning Office, he was also promoted to SS Sturmbahnführer, or SS Major. 
One of the benefits that came with this position was a chauffeur-driven car to shuttle von Braun back and forth between Nordhausen and Berlin. It was in the back seat of this car on the night of March 12, 1945, that von Braun was nearly killed. As his car was speeding down the autobahn, headed for Berlin, his driver nodded off at the wheel. The car veered off the road and hurtled down a forty-foot embankment until it crashed on its side near a railroad track. The driver was knocked unconscious. Von Braun broke his arm. Both men lay bleeding in the cold, dark night when two of Von Braun's colleagues from Nordhausen, facilities designer Bernhard Tessmann and architect Hans Lersen, happened to drive by and spot the smashed-up car. They called for a military ambulance, which came to the scene and transported Von Braun and his driver to a hospital. While recuperating, Von Braun received a visit from his personal aide, Dieter Hutzel, and Bernard Tessmann, one of the two men who'd saved Von Braun's life. Tessmann and Hutzel told Von Braun that the arrival of the U.S. Army was imminent. Any day now, they said, V-2 operations would cease. Word was going around that every man not considered a valuable scientist was going to be assigned to an infantry unit, handed a weapon, and ordered to fight the Americans on the front lines. Von Braun was now ready to concede that Germany would lose the war. What he was unwilling to do was relinquish his career. He needed a bargaining chip to use against the Americans after he was captured. Von Braun told Tessmann and Hutzel where he kept the most valuable classified V-2 documents. Because von Braun was bedridden, he needed his two subordinates to crate up these documents and hide them in a remote, secure place where the Allies would never find them on their own. Von Braun told Tessmann and Hutzel that if they could do this, they would be included in von Braun's future negotiations with the Allies. General Dornberger would also be part of the team. Von Braun told Tessmann and Hutzel that he would personally bring the general up to speed. Middlework laborers continued to produce missiles until the end of March. The last V-2s were fired on March 27th, and the last V-1s were fired the following day. On April 1st, Dornberger received an order from SS General Kamler demanding that Dornberger evacuate his staff from the middlework at once. Kamler had selected 500 key scientists and engineers who were to board his private train car parked in Bleicheroda and nicknamed the Vengeance Express and then travel 400 miles south into the Bavarian Alps to hide out. Hutzel and Tessmann were on Kamler's list, but after colluding with General Dornberger, they were able to stay behind to complete the document stash. Von Braun, still requiring medical attention and encumbered by a heavy cast, was taken to the Alps in a private car. Dornberger and his staff drove themselves, fleeing the Haars in a small convoy. When night fell on Dorton, a small mining community at the northern edge of the Haars, the village was in a blackout. The local Gauleiters, Nazi Party district leaders, had ordered villagers to shutter their windows, turn off the lights, and stay home. It was April 4, 1945, and American forces were reportedly camped out just 30 miles to the west. The village's cobblestone streets were empty, save a lone truck driving slowly with its lights off, navigating by the moon. In the front seat sat Tessmann and Hutzel. In the back of the truck were seven German soldiers wearing blindfolds. Also in the truck were dozens of crates filled with classified V-2 information. The truck passed through town and headed up a winding rural road leading into the mouth of an abandoned mine. Hutzel and Tessmann parked the truck and shook hands with the caretaker, Herr Nibelung, a loyal Nazi who sold the two engineers space in a large antechamber in the back of the Dorton mine. The seven soldiers were told it was okay to take off their blindfolds now and get to work. The group unloaded the crates, placed them onto flat cars, and oversaw them as they were driven down a long tunnel by an electric battery-powered locomotive. At the end of the tunnel, behind an iron door, was a small, dry room. 
The crates of V-2 documents were packed inside, the door shut and locked. Outside, a soldier lit a stick of dynamite in front of the doorway to create a huge pile of rubble and keep the important Nazi documents hidden from the outside world. Hutzel and Tessmann had sworn not to tell anyone what they'd done. But just as they were leaving for Bavaria to rendezvous with Dornberger and von Braun, the two men decided to make an exception. Karl Otto Fleischer had served as the Army's business manager for the Middlework Slave Labor Enterprise. Fleischer's name was not on General Kamler's list, and he'd gone home to his house in Nordhausen to blend in. Karl Fleischer was a loyal Nazi who reported directly to General Dornberger during V2 production, and Hutzel and Tessmann believed Fleischer would keep their secret safe. Fleischer was local. He could keep an eye on things and monitor if anyone started poking around the Dorton mine. Hutzel and Tessmann told Karl Fleischer about the secret location of the V2 document stash, and with the U.S. Army just a few days outside Nordhausen, Hutzel and Tessmann sped away. Chapter 3 The Hunters and the Hunted In France, Samuel Goodsmith and his team of Operation Alsace scientists had been waiting patiently since November to launch their next scientific intelligence mission. It had been four months since the team hit intelligence gold inside the Straussburg apartment of the Reich's virologist, Dr. Eugen Hagen. Now, in the last week of March 1945, Goodsmith and his military commander, Colonel Boris Posh, were finally getting ready to seize their next targets. IG Farben factories over the border in Germany, believed to be the locus of the Nazis' chemical weapons program. Since November, Hagen's apartment in Strasbourg had been serving as Alsace headquarters. There had been long delays. In December, Hitler's counteroffensive in the Arden Forest meant that Alsace scientists could not conduct frontline missions as planned. But as serendipity would have it, the entire first floor below Hagen's Strasbourg apartment belonged to I.G. Farben, the primary chemical weapons supplier of the Third Reich, and Alsace seized a considerable cache of documents Farben kept there. Alsace knew Farben was involved in weapons-related vaccine research and suspected they were involved in medical experiments on prisoners. The two Farben factories they had in their sights were located only about 80 miles away, in the German cities of Ludwigshafen and Mannheim. For this, Operation Alsace had put together their largest task force to date, 10 civilian scientists, six military scientists, and 18 security operators. But venturing into German-held territory on their own was considered too dangerous for the American scientists. They had been waiting for Allied forces to cross the Rhine River into Germany, at which point they, too, would be allowed in. Now, in the third week of March 1945, this long-awaited crossing appeared imminent. On March 23, 1945, British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery began a colossal troop offensive across the Rhine River, codenamed Operation Plunder. Adding to the namesake subtext of seizure and pillage were Montgomery's famous words, Over the Rhine, then let us go, and good hunting to you all on the other side. Sacking a vanquished country at the end of a war was as old as war itself, but the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 prohibited looting beyond token items claimed as trophies of war. What exactly did Montgomery mean? On a tactical level, the Rhine River crossing meant that the Allies would smash open more than 500 miles along the Western Front. From an intelligence collection standpoint, it truly meant plunder. As soldiers pushed forward into Germany, accompanying them were more than 3,000 scientific and technical experts with the Combined Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee, or SIOS, the joint British-American program that had been established in London the summer before. 
PSYOS teams reported to Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, or SHAFE, located in Versailles and staffed by experts. Scientists, engineers, doctors, and technicians, accompanied by linguists and scholars, to translate and interpret the documents that were seized. Representing the United States from SIOS were men from the War Department General Staff, the Navy, the Army Air Forces, the State Department, the Foreign Economic Administration, the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, and the Office of Scientific Research and Development. The British sent experts from the Foreign Office, the Admiralty, the Air Ministry, and the Ministries of Supply, Aircraft Production, Economic Warfare, Fuel, and Power. All SIOS staff worked from a list of targets similar to those used by Alsace, which became known as blacklists. Frontline requests for specific SIOS teams were relayed to Shafe from the combat zone. An appropriate SIOS team would be dispatched into the field. Assisting SIOS teams were security forces called T forces, identifiable by helmets with a bright red T painted on the front. These small squadrons of elite soldiers operated at the army group level, but worked independently of traditional combat units. Their job was to recognize potentially valuable scientific targets and then secure them until personnel from SIOS arrived. The goal of the Combined Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee was to investigate all things related to German science. Target types ran the gamut. Radar, missiles, aircraft, medicine, bombs and fuses, chemical and biological weapons labs. And while SIOS remained an official joint venture, there were other groups in the mix with competing interests at hand. Running parallel to SIOS operations were dozens of secret intelligence gathering operations, mostly American. The Pentagon's Special Mission V2 was but one example. By late March 1945, Colonel Trischel, Chief of U.S. Army Ordnance, Rocket Branch, had dispatched his team to Europe. Likewise, U.S. Naval Technical Intelligence had officers in Paris preparing for its own highly classified hunt for any intelligence regarding the Henschel HS-293, a guided missile developed by the Nazis and designed to sink or damage enemy ships. The U.S. Army Air Forces were still heavily engaged in strategic bombing campaigns, but a small group from Wright Field, near Dayton, Ohio, was laying plans to locate and capture Luftwaffe equipment and engineers. Spearheading top-secret missions for British intelligence was a group of commandos called 30 Assault Unit, led by Ian Fleming, the personal assistant to the director of British naval intelligence and future author of the James Bond novels. Sometimes the members of these parallel missions worked in concert with SIOS officers in the field. Certainly they took full advantage of all the information SIOS made available, including its blacklists. But each mission almost always put its individual objectives and goals first. The result, some officers joked, was chaos for SIOS. What began as a gentlemanly collaboration among allies quickly transformed into one of the greatest competitions for information about weapons-related research in the history of war. Once the Rhine River was crossed, the hunt for Nazi science became a free-for-all. On its search for chemical weapons, Alsace scientists crossed the Rhine on the heels of the Third Army. They traveled in a small convoy of army jeeps. The area was not in good shape, Colonel Posh recalled after the war. Buildings of the town shook from the shockwaves generated by the gun explosions, and stalled or broken down vehicles added to the confusion created by the wrecked armor and trucks of the retreating Nazis. Entering Ludwigshafen, one of the Alsace jeeps became separated from its convoy and ran smack into the line of fire of a German anti-tank gun. Hardly expecting a single jeep to appear on the road without a tank accompanying it, the Germans were apparently caught off guard. A single salvo and the few machine gun bursts went wide, Posh recalled after the war. The Alsace scientists had heard that T-forces units were close behind them and were making arrangements for a large team of technical experts to arrive under the SIOS banner. 
the Alsace scientists were determined to get to the IG Farben factory first. But what they ended up finding in Ludwigshafen was disappointing to them. Not only had the factory been heavily damaged by Allied bombing raids, but filing cabinets were empty. Paperwork had been destroyed or removed. There were no chemical weapons found. The following morning, March 24, 1945, while at breakfast, the Alsace team met up with the T-forces and the Sios team. Both had come to inspect the Farben factory. It was interesting to watch the effect of bombshells casually dropped by our scientists, Posh recalled, sounding something like, Oh sure, you'll be able to go to the Farben plant tomorrow, after the T-forces secures it. You'll find it interesting, we know, because we were there yesterday. The rivalry between the teams was evident. The two men leading the Sios chemical weapons team were an American officer named Lieutenant Colonel Philip R. Tarr and a British officer named Major Edmund Tilly. These men would soon become critical players in the Operation Paperclip story. Each was considered an expert in chemical warfare, but Major Tilly had a leg up on his American counterpart, at least in the field, in that he spoke fluent German. In addition to his role as a PSYOS leader, Colonel Tarr was chief officer in the U.S. Army's Intelligence Division of the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, Europe. Unknown to Major Tilly at this time was that Colonel Tarr's U.S. Army objective would soon supersede his loyalty to their work together as a PSYOS team. With American forces now on German soil, the fear that Hitler might unleash a devastating chemical weapons attack in a last-ditch attempt to make good on his wonder weapons promise was real. But Tarr and Tilly had very few leads as to where the chemical weapons might be stashed. German counterintelligence agents had done a brilliant job concealing the Reich's nerve agent programs from foreign intelligence agencies during the war. Tobin had been given various code names including Trillin-83, Substance-83, and Galon-1. Even its raw materials were coded. Ethanol was A4, and sodium was A17, making identification all but impossible. In 1942, a U.S. intelligence report entitled New German Poison Gas concluded that the possibility that Germany had new chemical weapons was no longer seriously regarded. Only in May of 1943, after capturing a German chemist in North Africa, did British agents learn of a colorless nerve agent of astounding properties, being developed by IG Farben chemists in Berlin. The British interrogation officers found the German chemists' information to be credible and wrote up a ten-page secret report for the Chemical Defense Experimental Establishment, which operated out of Porton Down. But the captured scientists knew only the substance's code name, Trillin-83. Without further information, no action was taken by the British. Now, in March 1945, Tarr and Tilly were on the hunt for this mysterious Trillin-83 and anything else like it. Leading the Sios team into Germany, Tarr and Tilly inspected IG Farben factories at Ludwigshaven, Mannheim, and Elberfeld. At each location, the officers noted with suspicion how remarkably little each town's Farben scientists claimed to know. As far as intelligence collection was concerned, the scenario at each seized Farben factory was always strikingly similar. Where there should have been huge troves of company records, there were empty cabinets instead. Farben scientists, who were taken into custody and questioned, always said the same thing. IG Farben made chemical products for domestic use, detergent, paint, lacquer, and soap. And none of the scientists interviewed by SIOS officers claimed to have any idea where the bosses had gone. In a SIOS memorandum, Tilly and Tarr expressed mounting frustration. One scientist after the next lied vigorously about his activities, the men wrote in their intelligence report, entitled, Interrogation of German Scientific Personnel. 
good, actionable intelligence remained out of reach. Then, as circumstance would have it, Alsace agents caught a huge break farther north in the city of Bonn. Alsace had been trailing the 3rd Armored Division since it first rolled into Ludwigshafen on March 23rd. Several days later, the soldiers liberated the city of Cologne and then set their sights on Bonn, some 15 miles to the north. Scouting soldiers reported seeing men who might be professors burning caseloads of documents in Bonn University courtyards. What they couldn't see was that inside university bathrooms, professors were also desperately flushing documents down the toilet hoping to destroy evidence that might implicate them in war crimes. When the Allies finally secured the university, a Polish lab technician approached a British soldier to say that he had salvaged a large pile of documents that did not properly flush down a toilet bowl, as had apparently been intended. These papers looked important, the lab technician said, and indeed they were. The man had turned over to British intelligence a classified list of the Reich's top scientists. The officer handed the list over to Samuel Goodsmith of Operation Alsace. This group of documents would lead to what would become known as the Osenberg List. Dr. Warner Osenberg, a mechanical engineer, was a dedicated Nazi and member of the SS. He was also a high-ranking member of the Gestapo, the secret police. In June 1943, Osenberg was assigned by Goering to run the so-called planning office of the Reich Research Council, which was dedicated to warfare. Per a Führer decree of June 9, 1942, the Research Council's charter read, Leading men of science, above all, are to make research fruitful for warfare by working together in their special fields. From the Council's planning office, Osenberg's job was to coordinate a who's-who list of German scientists, engineers, doctors, and technicians. With bureaucratic precision, Osenberg set to work, tracking down and cataloging every scientist in Germany. Osenberg's mission was to put these men into service for the Reich. In short order, he had compiled a list of 15,000 men and 1,400 research facilities. All across Germany, scientists, engineers, and technicians were recalled from the front lines, an act Hitler called the Osenberg Action. This led to the release of 5,000 scientists from the German armed forces. After being screened for skill level, the men of science were set up in appropriated universities and institutions across Reich territory, where they could work on weapons-related research programs in service of the war effort. The mystery of how the Osenberg list ended up in a Bonn University toilet was never solved. But for Alsace, it was an intelligence gold mine. Not only was this list a record of who had been working on what scientific project for the Reich, but it contained addresses, including one for Warner Osenberg himself. Goodsmith dispatched a team to a little town near Hanover. There, Alsace agents captured Ossenberg and his complete outfit. The papers found in the toilet were valuable, but it was an index of cards in Ossenberg's office that was priceless. The primary index consists of a four-drawer cabinet containing approximately 2,000 large printed cards, 10-inch by 7-inch, adapted for multiple entry on both sides of the card, reported Alsace. Secondary indexes included three additional sets of approximately 1,000 cards each, 6 inch by 4 inch, containing the same information but classified from a different standpoint and facilitating searches along different lines. This was an overwhelming trove of information, too much for any one organization to handle. Alsace shared the Osenberg list with SIOS. There were thousands of leads that needed following up on. Osenberg's card catalog would allow the various teams to begin piecing together how science programs worked under the Reich and who had been in charge. The Alsace officers packed up Osenberg's office and took him to Paris, where he was put to work organizing information. 
Goodsmit was appalled by the hubris Osenberg displayed after he was installed in an office in a guarded facility in Versailles. Here, Osenberg had set up business as usual. He merely had his secretary change the address on his letterhead to At Present in Paris, Goodsmit explained after the war. He also became exasperated when Osenberg tried repeatedly to convince Goodsmit of his sworn loyalty to the Allies. I became impatient, Goodsmith explained, and told Osenberg, One cannot trust you. You were in charge of the scientific section of the Gestapo, which you never revealed to us, and you burned all the relating papers. Osenberg was enraged by the accusation. No, I did not burn those papers, he told Goodsmith. I buried them. And, moreover, I was not the chief of the scientific section of the Gestapo. I was merely the second in command. After that, it was easy for Goodsmith to find out from Osenberg where those papers were buried and where the missing Berlin papers were stored. But no one from the Allied forces was going to Berlin just yet. In these last days of March 1945, Berlin continued to be the heart of the Reich, and it was being fiercely defended. It would remain German-held territory for another month, until the last day of April 1945. It was a city in ruins, and Berliners' morale was sinking with each passing day. With nearly 85% of the city destroyed, Berlin had been reduced to rubble piles. The majority of buildings still standing had broken windows. Everyone was cold. The underground shelters were vastly overcrowded. Heating fuel was scarce. During early April, explains historian Anthony Beaver, as Berlin awaited the final onslaught of the Red Army, the atmosphere in the city became a mixture of febrile exhaustion, terrible foreboding, and despair. Nazi radio broadcasts reminded Berliners that they were required to fight to the end. According to Goebbels, a single motto remains for us, conquer or die. Hitler blamed everything on the Jews and the Slavs. The deadly Jewish Bolshevik enemy with his masses is beginning his final attack, he told troops on the Eastern Front in a last appeal on April 15th. The Russians were determined to exterminate all German people, Hitler promised. The old men and children will be murdered. Women and girls will be degraded as barracks whores. Everybody else would be marched off to Siberia. In the heart of Berlin, in the Wilhelmstrasse district, where the Reich's ministries were located, Colonel Siegfried Kneemeyer tried to maintain order over the vast group of personnel he was responsible for at the Air Ministry. It was a miracle that the building was still standing. Constructed of reinforced concrete, the Air Ministry was a prized symbol of Nazi Party intimidation architecture, seven stories tall, with 2,800 rooms, 4,000 windows, and corridors that totaled four miles in length. At the height of the air war, the place bustled with 4,000 Nazi bureaucrats and their secretaries. This was no longer the case. The Luftwaffe was in ruins. Since 1943, Siegfried Kneemeyer had served as chief of all Air Force technical developments for the Luftwaffe. His title was technical advisor to Reichsmarschall Göring, who adored Kneemeyer, calling him my boy. From aircraft engines to instruments, if a new component was being developed for the Luftwaffe, Göring wanted to know what Kneemeyer had to say about it before he gave the project the go-ahead. But now, in the second week of April 1945, most orders that arrived at the Air Ministry were impossible for Kneemeyer to fulfill. In the second half of 1944, the German Air Force had lost more than 20,000 airplanes. The Speer Ministry had since managed to produce approximately 3,000 new aircraft, but they were of little use now. Across the Reich, German aircraft sat stranded on tarmacs. The Allies had bombed Luftwaffe runways, and there was barely any aviation fuel left. The plan for IG Farben to make synthetic fuel at its Buna factory had ended when the Red Army liberated Auschwitz on January 27, 1945. Germany's fuel sources in Hungary and Romania were tapped out. 
The German jet was superior to conventional Allied fighter planes in the air, but that didn't mean much anymore, with most Luftwaffe aircraft stuck on the ground. Soon, Kneemeyer would flee Berlin, but not before he completed a final task assigned to him by Speer. According to Nuremberg trial testimony, Speer instructed Kneemeyer to hide Luftwaffe technical information in the forest outside Berlin. Stashing official documents was a treasonable offense, but according to Kneemeyer's personal papers, Speer and Kneemeyer had agreed that Germany's seminal scientific progress in aeronautics could not, under any circumstances, fall into Russian hands. There was also a second unofficial job that Speer tapped Kneemeyer for, one that was not discussed at Nuremberg, but which Speer admitted to decades later. Speer asked Kneemeyer to help plot his escape. Speer's plan to flee Germany had been in the works for some time. It was the details he needed help ironing out. Ever since Speer had seen the film S.O.S. Iceberg, starring Leni Riefenstahl, and Ernst Ude, he knew he wanted to escape to Greenland should Germany lose the war. In Greenland, Speer could set up camp and write his memoirs, he later explained. Of course, he'd need a pilot, which is where Kneemeyer fit in. Kneemeyer was an aeronautical engineer, but he was also one of the Luftwaffe's most revered pilots, ranked among the top ten aviators in all of Germany. His specialty, back when he flew missions in the early stages of the war, had been espionage. From 1938 to 1942, Kneemeyer flew a number of the most dangerous Abwehr, military intelligence, missions on record, including ones over England and Norway. And it was Kneemeyer who made the first high-altitude sortie over North Africa, flying at 44,000 feet. But Kneemeyer was also a pragmatist. He knew, apparently more so than Speer, that attempting to fly out of Germany and into Greenland, transporting one of the most wanted war criminals of the Third Reich during the final days of the war, would be a near-to-impossible feat. There was brutal weather in Greenland and fierce terrain. The mission would require a very specific aircraft that could handle the harsh conditions and difficult landing, namely the BV-222, designed by Blum and Foss. Only 13 had ever been built. There was only one man who had access to that kind of airplane, and that was Kneemeyer's friend, Warner Baumbach, a 28-year-old dive bomber pilot whom Hitler had made general of the bombers. Kneemeyer knew that bringing Baumbach on board was imperative for a successful Greenland escape. During the war, Baumbach had flown missions between Norway and a German weather station located in Greenland. Speer agreed, and Baumbach was brought into the plan. In secret, Baumbach and Kneemeyer began gathering food, medicine, rifles, skis, tents, fishing equipment, and hand grenades at Speer's behest. At the Travemunde airfield, north of Berlin, Baumbach earmarked a BV-222 for use. The only thing that remained was Speer's command for the group to flee. Time was running out. Berlin was nearing its downfall. Chapter 4 Liberation All across Germany, the liberations were beginning. In one location after the next, Prisoners in concentration camps and slave labor factories were being freed by Allied soldiers who stormed across Germany in tanks and jeeps and on foot. The action had begun in western Germany and continued steadily as the Allies marched east, headed toward Munich and Berlin. Alongside these liberations, soldiers also discovered Reich laboratories and research facilities one after the next. After each discovery, a team of PSYOS scientists was called in to investigate. During the second week of April in 1945, four key facilities were seized. At Nordhausen, Gerberg, Volkenrode, and Raubkammer, each of which would lead to the capture of key scientists who would in turn become part of Operation Paperclip. 
On the morning of April 11, 1945, a unit of American soldiers with the 104th Infantry Division, also known as the Timberwolves, entered the slave tunnels at Nordhausen. Among the liberating soldiers was an infantry sharpshooter, a private first class named John Rison Jones, Jr. In his bag, he carried a camera, a gift given to him by his family before he shipped off to war. Expensive and sleek-looking, Jones's Leica III was one of the first portable 35mm cameras ever made. It had been seven months since John Rison Jones landed in France back in September 1944. He had spent 195 days on the continent thus far, many of them engaged in fierce combat, all the while pushing through snow, sleet, and mud, much of it on foot. Jones had walked across France, Belgium, and Holland, and now here he was in the deep mountains of central Germany, the Haars. He had lost friends in battle and taken many photographs of the war. When his unit arrived in this little mountain town, he imagined the day would pass like the one before, just one step closer to the end of this brutal war. No amount of fighting prepared John Rison Jones for what he saw through the lens of his Leica when his unit entered Nordhausen. The photographs he took documented the tragedy that had befallen thousands of V-2 rocket laborers condemned to die as slaves in the tunnels here. Hundreds of corpses were stretched out across the tunnel floors. Equally disturbing was the condition of hundreds more still alive, emaciated humans covered with bruises and sores too weak to even stand. It was a fabric of moans and whimpers, of delirium and outright madness, recalled fellow soldier Staff Sergeant Donald Schultz. John Rice and Jones would not speak of it for 51 years. Following along behind the soldiers was a team of seven war crimes investigators. Among them was a young Dutch officer working for the U.S. Army, William J. Almans. Like John Rice and Jones, Almans was deeply affected by what he saw and smelled. Stench, the tuberculosis, and the starved inmates, he told journalist Tom Bauer after the war. Four people were dying every hour. It was unbelievable. Almans and his team began taking witness statements from prisoners who sipped watered-down milk for strength. The job facing the war crimes investigators was overwhelming, and their schedule was intense. After five days in Nordhausen, they were ordered to move on. Most of the official paperwork regarding rocket production had been hidden or destroyed, but Almans and his team found a single sheet of paper inadvertently left behind, tacked to the wall. It was the Middlework telephone list, a directory of who was in charge. At the very top were two names, George Rickhe, Director of Production, and Arthur Rudolph, Deputy Production Manager. Almans found the document interesting enough to staple it to the report. Although it would take years to come to light, this single sheet of paper would eventually lead to the downfall of Rudolf and Ricke and threaten to expose the dark secrets of Operation Paperclip. Seventy-five miles south of Nordhausen, in the Thuringian forest at the edge of the Haars, Allied soldiers liberated the town of Gerberg. Here, they came upon a curious-looking research facility concealed in a thick grove of trees. Clearly, the place had recently been abandoned. It comprised a laboratory, an isolation block, animal houses, and living quarters for 14 men. Part of the facility was still under construction. Word was sent to Schaaf headquarters in Versailles that a team of bacteriologists was needed in Gariburg. Alsace scientists were dispatched to investigate. One of the first biological warfare experts to arrive was Bill Cromarty, who had been hunting for evidence of Hitler's biological weapons program since the mission began back in Strasbourg, France. Back in November, Cromarty had been one of the men scouring files with Samuel Goodsmith inside the apartment of Dr. Eugen Hagen.
when Alsace agents first learned that the Reich was testing deadly vaccines on prisoners in concentration camps. Arriving at Gerberg, Cromarty determined that the laboratory here was a significant lead. The building and sites were on either side of a small valley and constructed under tall trees, read Cromarty's classified report. On one side there was a building that was to have been the experimental laboratory, he surmised, suggesting this facility was designed to produce experimental vaccines to protect German soldiers against a biological weapons offensive. A local villager provided Cromarty and a colleague, J. M. Barnes, with two key pieces of information in the biological weapons puzzle. The villager explained that an SS man named Dr. Karl Gross had been overseeing work at this facility. Gross kept dozens of trunks and boxes locked in the upper floors of a local schoolhouse, and while he had recently disappeared, he had left the trunks behind. The villager took the American scientist to the schoolhouse to investigate. An inventory was taken of Dr. Gross's possessions, mostly laboratory equipment. There were crates of test tubes and small flasks and large numbers of test tube racks. There were two incubators and an autoclave. There were two boxes of gas mask filters and some rubber hoods and gowns, read the report. Everything was military-grade protective gear, marked as having been obtained from the Hygiene Institute of the Waffen SS. There was also a large collection of books, several boxes of periodicals all dealing with infectious diseases. The ones that really caught the scientists' attention were Russian Contributions on Plague. Next, the villager took the Alsace agents to the nearby boarding house, where Dr. Gross had been renting a room. The place was cleared out and void of personal possessions. His landlady said she believed he had burnt a lot of papers the night before he left, the Alsace scientists noted in their report. But Dr. Gross was only the intermediary, the landlady said. There was another man who came to the facility and appeared to be in charge. He was an older man, about fifty, five foot nine, with a mustache and black hair. On his upper lip, he had a pronounced dueling scar. He had to have been of high rank, because everyone on the staff deferred to him. When cross-referenced by Alsace against the Osenberg list, the situation became even clearer. Dr. Karl Gross worked under Dr. Kurt Blomme the individual in charge of biological weapons research and the deputy surgeon general of the Third Reich. All indicators pointed to the idea that Gerberg was a Reich facility for biological weapons research. Alsace agents photographed the site, the animal house, the vaccine station, the experimental laboratory, and the isolation hospital. They typed up a report and filed it away for future use. Now. Near the top of the biological weapons blacklist was the name Dr. Kurt Blomme. Sixty miles north of Nordhausen, a battalion of American soldiers with the 1st U.S. Infantry moved cautiously through the forest on the western edge of a small city called Braunschweig. It was April 13, 1945, when they came upon a compound of about 70 buildings. Great care had gone into camouflaging this place, the soldiers noted. Thousands of trees had been planted closely so that the area would appear from the air to be dense forest. The buildings in the compound had been designed to look like simple farmhouses. Traditional gardens had been planted and tended to. Stork nests covered the rooftops. Inside the buildings, soldiers discovered state-of-the-art aircraft laboratories including entire warehouses filled with airplane parts and rocket fuel. There were wind and weapons tunnels that were radically more advanced than anything the Army Air Forces had at Wright Field. The oldest division in the United States Army had unexpectedly happened upon the most scientifically advanced aeronautics laboratory in the world. It was called the Hermann Göring Aeronautical Research Center at Vulcan Road. The Allies had never heard of it before. 
It didn't appear on any Sios blacklists. It was an incredible find. At first, it seemed as if the place had been abandoned. But after an hour of looking around, the soldiers came upon the Institute's scientific director, a man named Adolf Busmann. Busmann told the soldiers that this facility was called Vulcan Road for short, and that it had been up and running for ten years. A team of Army Air Force's technical intelligence experts working as part of a mission called Operation Lusty and stationed in Saint-Germain, France, was dispatched to investigate. By now, the U.S. strategic air forces in Europe had destroyed the Luftwaffe, and the bombing campaign had essentially stopped. Its commander, General Carl A. Tuey Spatz, had just received a fourth star for his success commanding the largest fleet of combat aircraft ever assembled for war. Now, Spatz had a new mission for his field commanders. Operation Lusty, Spatz wrote in a memo, was in effect, and everyone not engaged in critical operational duties was to seek out technical and scientific intelligence that would be of material assistance in the prosecution of the war against Japan. The man Spatz chose to lead the hunt for Luftwaffe scientists and engineers was Colonel Donald L. Putt. When Putt arrived at Vulcan Road on April 22, 1945, he was thrilled by what he saw. All he could think about was how quickly he could get all this equipment back to the United States. Putt was a legendary test pilot who had been at Wright Field since 1933, assigned to various branches, including the flying branch. He had walked away from a deadly air crash that killed his colleagues and left him with second-degree burn scars on his face and neck. Putt was a hard-charging, type-A personality, a tiger among men. He displayed the ability to withstand great emotional shock, to absorb it and take it in stride, explained a colleague from Wright Field. Putt was also intellectually gifted, with a degree in electrical engineering from the Carnegie Institute of Technology and a master's in aeronautical engineering from the California Institute of Technology. As an older man, Donald Putt recalled the pre-war mindset regarding pilots who were also engineers. Then, the philosophy was, don't put an engineering pilot in the cockpit because he tries to figure out why things happen. But when the air wars in Europe and Japan escalated, the Army Air Forces found itself in need of fast, out-of-the-box thinking from American pilot engineers like Putt. The Army Air Forces put the old philosophy to the side and Putt's expertise to use. In 1944, Putt's career milestone arrived when he was put in charge of modifying a B-29 bomber so that it could deliver an extraordinarily heavy, top-secret payload on Japan. This payload was eventually revealed to be the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After Putt finished his B-29 bomber retrofitting jobs, in January 1945, he was sent overseas as Director of Technical Services for the Air Service Command. Now, here he was in the last week of April 1945 at Vulcan Road. With his engineer's expertise, Putt was able to clearly judge the revolutionary nature of the technology he was looking at. Most astonishing to Putt were Volkenrode's seven wind tunnels that had allowed the Luftwaffe to study how a swept-back wing would behave at the speed at which an aircraft broke the sound barrier. This transition place between Mach 0.8 and Mach 1.2 was still unknown to American flyers in 1945. When Putt learned from Vulcan Road's director, Adolf Busmann, that the sound barrier had already been breached by German scientists in these wind tunnels, he was amazed. Putt knew immediately that the facility had the most superb instruments and test equipment in the world. Putt was taking orders from the U.S. Army European Theater of Operations, Directorate of Intelligence, Exploitation Division which meant that he had access to strip-down B-17s and B-24s if he needed them, a means to transport much of this equipment.
to the United States, which Pot very much wanted to do. He wrote to his boss, Major General Hugh Knair, Deputy Commander of U.S. Strategic Air Force in Europe, outlining his proposition and suggesting a second idea. Why not also fly scientists like Adolf Boosmann out of Germany, along with the captured Luftwaffe equipment? If we are not too proud to make use of this German-born information, much benefit can be derived from it, and we can advance where Germany left off, Putt wrote. The German scientists would be of immense value in our jet engine and airplane development program. Putt and Knair both knew that the War Department general staff was filled with individuals who were wary of Germans in general and totally opposed to making deals of any kind with the very Nazi scientists who had helped to prolong the war. But if anyone could get the War Department to bend, Knair and Putt believed they could. Major General Knair sent a memo to the War Department in Washington, D.C., explaining that using Luftwaffe technology to fight the war in Japan was imperative. He added that the scientists' Nazi Party membership needed to be overlooked. Pride and face-saving have no place in national insurance, wrote Knair. The War Department general staff was not so easily convinced, at least not now. Colonel Putt was informed that the equipment could come out of Vulcan Road immediately, but that getting German scientists to right field would take some more time. Putt oversaw the massive airlift of German aircraft and rocket parts from Vulcan Road to the United States. 5,000 scientific documents were also shipped. Meanwhile, he and his staff rounded up as many Luftwaffe personnel as they could, tracking down leads and making deals with scientists and engineers in their homes. Putt informed the Germans that he could not offer them U.S. Army contracts just yet, but that he would most likely be able to do so soon. In the meantime, he arranged for dozens of Luftwaffe scientists and engineers to be quartered in the Hotel Wittelsbacherhof in the spa town of Bad Kissingen and made sure that the men had plenty to eat, drink, and smoke. Wait here, the scientists were told. The U.S. Army contracts are on the way. Colonel Putt and Major General Knair would then put their heads together and figure out a way to convince the War Department that their point of view was best for the United States. Around this time, the single largest cache of chemical weapons discovered to date was found 75 miles west of Hanover. On April 16, 1945, British soldiers from Montgomery's 21st Army Group pulled up to the entrance of an abandoned German army proving ground called the Robber's Lair, or Raubkammer. The place appeared to be abandoned, but Waffen-SS snipers still were known to be hiding in the woods. The soldiers exercised caution as they drove their armored personnel cars through a pair of entrance pillars adorned with Reich eagles and swastikas. At first glance, the facility looked like a standard military proving ground, a place where bombs were exploded and blast measurements recorded. Raubkammer was located in a rural forested area called Munster Nord, and it extended more than 76 square miles. Large craters and open fields suggested that Luftwaffe airplanes had practiced dropping bombs here. There was fancy housing for hundreds of officers. There were large administrative buildings and an officer's mess hall. Then the soldiers came upon the zoo. It was a large zoo, capable of housing a vast array of animals of all sizes. There were cages for mice, cats, and dogs, as well as large pens and stables for farm animals like horses, cows, and pigs. There were also monkey cages but it was the discovery of a massive, round wooden cylinder, most likely an aerosol chamber, that triggered alarm. The structure was 65 feet tall and 100 feet wide, and it was ringed with a network of scaffolding, pipes, and ventilator fans. Between the zoo and the large chamber, the soldiers were now relatively certain that Raubkammer was no ordinary military proving ground. The robber's lair bore the hallmarks of a field-testing facility that likely involved poison gas. 
An urgent memo was sent to Shafe, asking for a team of chemical warfare experts to be dispatched to Raubkammer. Two teams descended, one from the British Chemical Defense Experimental Establishment at Porton Down, and another from Sios, including Major Tilly and Colonel Tarr. At the same time, a second unit of British troops, working just a few miles to the southwest of the robber's lair, came upon two bunker clusters totaling almost 200 structures. The area had been artfully concealed from overhead view by dense forest cover. The first cluster consisted of several dozen small wooden buildings intermittently spaced between similarly sized concrete blockhouses. The soldiers inventoried the contents with caution. Inside one set of bunkers, they found thousands of bombs stacked in neat piles. Each bomb was marked with a single yellow ring painted around the sides of the munition. This was the standard marking to denote mustard gas, the chemical weapon used by both sides in World War I. The British soldiers took inventory and counted 100,000 mustard gas shells. The second munitions depot was marked as belonging to the Luftwaffe. Here, 175 bunkers were filled with bombs that were unidentifiable to the Allies. Each bomb had been marked with three green rings painted around its sides. Montgomery's soldiers sent an urgent memo to Schaaf, asking for a team of chemical weapons experts to come investigate the munitions in the forest. The scientists from Sios and Porton Down were nervous about what might be inside the mysteriously marked bombs. They decided that it was best to try to locate German scientists in the area who might be familiar with the contents of the bombs before they opened the casings themselves. So they began knocking on the doors of the nicer houses in the vicinity of the robber's lair. As they had suspected they would, Sios officers located a number of individuals who confessed to being German army scientists and having worked at Raubkammer. While each scientist claimed to have no idea what kind of weapons testing had been going on at the military facility, Sios officers were able to persuade several of the German scientists to assist them in extracting the liquid substance from the center of the bombs. By this time, chemists with the U.S. Army's 45th Chemical Laboratory Company had arrived, bringing with them a mobile laboratory unit and cages filled with rabbits. The original thought was that the substance marked by three green rings was some kind of new Nazi blister agent, similar to, but perhaps more powerful, than mustard gas. The chemists were wrong. Extractions were made, and when tested on the rabbits in the mobile laboratory, whatever this liquid substance was, killed a warm-blooded rabbit five times faster than anything that British or American scientists had ever seen or even heard about before. Even more alarming, the liquid substance did not have to be inhaled to kill. A single drop on the rabbit skin killed the animal in just a few minutes. The millions of gas masks England had distributed to city dwellers during the war would have offered no defense against a chemical weapon as potent as whatever this killing agent was. Sios field agents wrote up a top-secret report for their superiors at Schaefe. A menacing new breed of chemical weapons had been discovered. Aerial bombs, found to contain a markedly potent and hitherto unknown organophosphorus nerve agent had been developed by the Nazis during the war and stashed in 200 bunkers in the forest nearby. No chemical this lethal to man had ever been developed before. Sios agents did not know it yet, but this nerve agent was Tabin. The three green rings had been painted on the Luftwaffe bombs at Farben's Duernfort facility in Poland. Allied chemical weapons experts were suddenly in possession of one of the most dangerous wonder weapons and one of the best-kept secrets of the Third Reich. That these weapons were never used was astonishing. Who were the scientists who had discovered this nerve agent, and where were they now? Underground in the center of Berlin, 
in a makeshift hospital set up in a subway tunnel beneath the Reich Chancellery, Major General Dr. Walter Schreiber performed emergency surgeries on wounded Wehrmacht soldiers. He gave blood transfusions, performed amputations, whatever it was that needed to be done. As Surgeon General of the Third Reich, Schreiber was not a hospital doctor accustomed to dealing with triage. But as he would later testify at Nuremberg, all of his physician colleagues had fled Berlin. This was not necessarily the truth. Schreiber was a short, squat man, five foot six, with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a nose that ended in a fleshy point. A man of great willpower and stamina, he prided himself as setting his mind to a task and getting it done. Today was the Führer's 56th birthday, April 20th, 1945. And because it was Hitler's birthday, this Berlin morning began with propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels' happy birthday broadcast, calling on all Germans to trust Hitler and to follow him faithfully to the bitter end. While Major General Dr. Schreiber performed surgeries in his makeshift underground hospital, a group of his Nazi Party colleagues had gathered for a party almost directly above where he was located, in the half-destroyed Reich Chancellery building. Around noon, Hitler's inner circle made its way into a cavernous room with polished marble walls and floor-to-ceiling doors. Speer, Goring, Himmler, S.A. Obergruppenführer, and police and Waffen SS General Ernst Kaltenbrunner. Nazi Party Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, Grand Admiral Karl Dunitz of the Navy, General Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, Military Commander Alfred Jodl, and SS Brigadefuhrer Hans Krebs. The men gathered around an enormous table covered with bottles of champagne and a spread of food. Hitler said a few words and promised that the Russians would soon suffer their most crushing defeat yet. That morning, the Red Army had in fact begun its final assault on Berlin. Before dawn, German soldiers had retreated from the Zelo Heights, 55 miles from the center of Berlin, leaving no front line. The Soviet operation to capture Berlin was colossal, involving 2,500,000 Red Army soldiers, 41,600 guns and mortars, 7,500 aircraft, and more than 6,000 tanks. Rumor, panic, and chaos enveloped the city at an unstoppable pace. The majority of Berliners were now living underground, in cellars and air raid shelters, appearing above ground only to scavenge for food. Every road out of Berlin leading west was overwhelmed with refugees. Casualties were skyrocketing. To the south, a detachment of Hitler youth fighting near the Buckau Forest became trapped in a forest fire. Most were burned alive. Major General Dr. Walter Schreiber's makeshift hospital could not keep up with the wounded. During the course of the next 12 days, the Red Army would fire 1.8 million shells on the city. Hitler's birthday was also the day Knehemeyer and Baumbach would flee Berlin for good. In the morning, Baumbach had received a cryptic message from Göring, who instructed him to go meet with SS Brigadefuhrer Walter Friedrich Schellenberg, the notorious chief of military intelligence and Himmler's number two man. The end was near and everyone seemed to know it. So what did Schellenberg want from Baumbach now? Schellenberg told Baumbach that a warrant had been issued for his arrest and that he was scheduled to be taken into custody during the Fuhrer's birthday party. Baumbach should leave the city immediately, Schellenberg said. Anyone close to Hitler who was arrested this late in the war, usually suspected of treason, faced a quick execution. This was happening all across Berlin. Had Hitler found out about the Greenland escape plan? Schellenberg, whom I had known for years, Baumbach later explained, was a clever man. Baumbach interpreted the tip-off to mean only one thing. Schellenberg needed Baumbach alive to help facilitate an escape. 
It was known among a core group of SS officers that Himmler had been trying to use concentration camp inmates as bargaining chips for clemency through an intermediary, the Swedish Red Cross. Baumbach explained. Of course, Himmler would never be granted clemency. Baumbach figured that Schellenberg and Himmler wanted him alive so he could help them escape somewhere overseas. Baumbach located Knaemeyer, and the two pilots agreed to flee Berlin immediately. They got in Baumbach's BMW and headed north to the Travemunde airfield, 200 miles north of Berlin on the Baltic Sea. The long-range aircraft they planned to use for their escape with Speer sat stocked and fueled on the tarmac. We were supplied with everything we needed for six months, Baumbach explained after the war. Knaemeyer and Baumbach found many Luftwaffe officers packing up their belongings, stripping themselves of military identification, and preparing to disappear among civilians. An aide delivered an urgent message to Baumbach. This time it was from Himmler himself. The Reichsführer SS wanted to see Baumbach immediately. Baumbach was to come to Mecklenburg, halfway back to Berlin, where Himmler was staying. Baumbach asked Knaemeyer to accompany him. The road leading to Mecklenburg was swamped with refugees. This part of Germany was one of the only regions still in German control. SS guards herded concentration camp prisoners along the roads like cattle in a last-ditch effort to keep them out of the liberators' hands. The roads were almost impassable, and it took five hours for Baumbach and Knaemeyer to drive a hundred miles. When they finally arrived at a large country home referred to as the Manor of Daubin, Himmler's SS guards escorted them inside. The Reichsfuhrer will receive you now, a guard said. Knaemeyer was told to wait outside Himmler's office, while Baumbach was led down a long, narrow corridor, up a winding staircase, and into Himmler's study. Behind the desk, Himmler sat alone. He wore a gray field uniform covered with SS insignia, the death's head, Totenkopf. The sleeves on Himmler's uniform were too long, and Baumbach noted a cheap ring on the pinky finger of his left hand. Himmler sized up the General of the Bombers from behind his signature pince-nez and got to the point. I've sent for you to clear up some Luftwaffe problems, Himmler said, as recalled by Baumbach after the war. The war has entered the final stage, and there are some very important decisions I shall have to take. Baumbach listened. In the very near future, I expect to be negotiating with our enemies, probably through some neutral country, Himmler said. I've heard that all aircraft suitable for this purpose are under your command. Baumbach looked out the windows and across the carefully pruned gardens outside, considering his response. Yes, Baumbach told Himmler. He had aircraft at his disposal, ready at any time. Himmler assumed an even friendlier tone, Baumbach recalled, and asked where he could get hold of Baumbach in the coming days. At the Travemunde airfield, Baumbach said. An aide interrupted to announce the arrival of Field Marshal Keitel. Baumbach was dismissed. Baumbach made his way back to the sitting room where Knaemeyer waited. By now, Knaemeyer had figured out whose fancy manor Himmler was living in. The home once belonged to Sir Henry Detterding, the English lord known as the Napoleon of Oil. Next to Knaemeyer on a side table were two portraits in silver frames. One showed Goring wearing a medieval hunting costume and holding a large knife. It read, To my dear Detterding, in gratitude for your noble gift of Romanton Reich's hunting lodge, a detail Knaemeyer shared with his son decades after the war. The second photograph was a portrait of Hitler. Sir Henry Detterding, it read, in the name of the German people for the noble donation of a million Reichsmarks, Adolf Hitler. Knaemeyer and Baumbach headed outside. 
the SS officer posted to guard the hallway gave the two men a stiff salute. He told them that the Reichsfuhrer SS had arranged a tray of coffee and sandwiches for them to enjoy before they headed back to Travemunde. The reason that the Greenland escape plan was still on hold was because Speer decided to visit Hitler one last time at the Führer bunker, compelled by an overwhelming desire to see him once more. Driving alone in his private car from Hamburg back into Berlin, Speer was 55 miles outside the city when the road became impassable, clogged with what Speer later recalled to be a 10,000 vehicle traffic jam. No one was driving into Berlin anymore. Everyone was getting out. All lanes in both directions were being used for travel west. Jalopies and limousines, trucks and delivery vans, motorcycles, and even Berlin fire trucks blocked the road. Unable to advance, Speer turned off the road and drove to a divisional staff headquarters in Kiritz, where he learned Soviet forces had encircled Berlin. He also learned that there was only one landing strip inside Berlin that remained under German control, Gatow Airport, on the bank of the Havel River. Speer decided that he would now fly into Berlin. But the nearest aircraft with fuel were parked on the tarmac at the Luftwaffe's Reiklin test site near Mecklenburg. Jet fuel was now as rare as hen's teeth, and the aircraft was undoubtedly needed for other things. Speer insisted that the commandant at Reiklin locate a pilot capable of flying him into Berlin. The commandant at Reiklin explained that from Gatow, Speer would never be able to get to the Führer bunker if he traveled by car or by foot. The Russians controlled the way there. In order to get to the Führer bunker, under the new Reich Chancellery, Speer would need a second, smaller aircraft to fly him from Gatow to the Brandenburg Gate. He would need a short takeoff and landing aircraft or stall, like the Feisler Fi-156 Stork. Escorted by a squadron of fighter planes, we flew southward at an altitude of somewhat over 3,000 feet, a few miles above the battle zone, remembered Speer. Visibility was perfect. All that could be seen were brief, inconspicuous flashes from artillery or exploding shells. The airfield at Gatow was deserted when they landed, with the exception of one of Hitler's generals, who was fleeing Berlin. Speer and his pilot climbed into a waiting stork and flew the short distance over Berlin, landing amid rubble piles directly in front of the Brandenburg Gate. Speer commandeered an army vehicle and had himself driven to the chancellery, or what was left of it. American bombers had reduced the building to ruins. Speer climbed over a pile of rubble that had once been a ceiling and walked into what used to be a sitting room. There, Hitler's adjunct, Julius Schaub, stood drinking brandy with friends. Speer called out. Schaub appeared stunned by the sight of Speer. The companions dispersed. Schaub hurried off to inform Hitler that Speer had come to see him. Speer waited next to a rubble pile. Finally, he heard the words he had come to hear. The Führer is ready to see you now. Speer walked down into the bunker where he was met by Martin Bormann, Hitler's Mephistopheles, holding court. Bormann wanted to know if Speer had come to try to get Hitler to fly with him out of Berlin. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels and his wife Magda were also in the bunker, plotting the murder-suicide of their six children and themselves. Hitler's girlfriend, Eva Braun, invited Speer into her quarters to eat cake and drink Moet and Chandon until Hitler was ready to see him. At 3 a.m., Speer was told he could come in. I was both moved and confused, Speer later recalled. For his part, he, Hitler, showed no emotion when we confronted one another. His words were as cold as his hand. So you're leaving? Hitler asked Speer. Then he said, Good. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. Speer felt scorned. No regards to my family, no wishes, no thanks, no farewell. For a moment, Speer lost his composure and mumbled something about coming back. But Hitler dismissed his Minister of War and Weapons and Speer left. 
Six days after Speer's final meeting with Hitler, the U.S. Army liberated Dachau, a concentration camp located 12 miles outside Munich. It was 7.30 in the morning on April 29th when 50 tanks from the 7th Army, 3rd Battalion of the 157th Infantry Regiment, pulled up to what at first seemed like an ordinary military post, located adjacent to an SS training camp. The weather was cold and there was a dusting of snow. The post was surrounded by high brick walls, an electrified barbed wire fence, and a deep ditch. Seven fortified guard towers loomed overhead. The large iron front gates were closed and locked. A few American soldiers scaled the fence, cut the locks, and opened the gates. The soldiers rushed inside. A brief exchange of rifle fire ensued. Turkish newspaper correspondent Naren E. Gun, imprisoned in Dachau for his reports on the Warsaw Ghetto, bore witness as some of the SS guards in the watchtowers began shooting at prisoners. But the American soldiers, Gunn said, put a quick end to that. The SS guards promptly came down the ladders, their hands raised high in surrender. Other accounts describe brutal acts of vengeance inflicted by prisoners against their former SS guards. More gunfire ensued as a second unit, the 45th Thunderbird Division, approached Dachau from the southwest. They discovered 50 open freight cars abandoned just outside the garrison. Each train car was filled with emaciated bodies. There were several thousand corpses in all. Dachau, the first Nazi concentration camp, had been established by Himmler on March 20, 1933. It was originally a place where communists and other political enemies of National Socialism, the ideology of the Nazi Party, were sent. The name came from the fact that prisoners could be concentrated in a group and held under protective custody following Nazi law. Quickly, this changed. Himmler made concentration camps legally independent administrative units outside the penal code and the ordinary law. Dachau had served as a training center for SS concentration camp guards and became a model for how hundreds of other concentration camps were to be set up and run. It was also a model for Nazi medical research programs involving doctors who would later become part of Operation Paperclip. A young U.S. Army lieutenant and physician, Dr. Marcus J. Smith, arrived at Dachau early on the morning of April 30, 1945, and in his journal, Smith noted how cold and gloomy the thousand-year-old city was. Before noon, it started to hail. Dr. Smith was the sole medical officer attached to a ten-man displaced persons team sent to the concentration camp the day after it was liberated. He and his fellow soldiers had instructions to do what they could to help the 32,000 starved, diseased, and dying camp survivors as they waited for Red Cross workers to arrive. The newly liberated suffered from dysentery, tuberculosis, typhus, pneumonia, scabies, and other infectious diseases in early, late, and terminal stages, Smith wrote. Even my callous, death-hardened, County hospital exterior begins to crack. One of my men weeps. During breaks, Dr. Smith walked around Dachau's gas chamber to try and make sense of what had gone on there. I cannot believe this is possible in this enlightened age, he wrote. In the rear of the crematorium is a sign depicting a man riding a monstrous pig. Wash your hands, says the caption. It is your duty to remain clean. In his spare time, Dr. Smith wandered through the camp. On one of these walks, I enter a one-story building that contains laboratory counters and storage shelves, Smith wrote. Almost everything in it has been smashed. I step over broken benches and drawers, twisted instruments and shattered glassware. In the debris, I am surprised to find a few specimen jars and bottles intact, filled with preserved human and insect tissues. Smith asked questions around the concentration camp to try to learn more. 
Prisoners told him that the laboratory had served Nazi doctors as an experimental medical ward and that everyone was afraid of it because it was a place where selected prisoners were used as experimental subjects without their consent. Although it was not yet known by American or British intelligence at the time, what Dr. Marcus Smith had come upon at Dachau was the place where a group of Luftwaffe doctors had been conducting medical research experiments on humans. This work took place in a freestanding barracks, isolated from the others, and was called Experimental Cell Block 5. Many of the Reich's elite medical doctors passed through the laboratory here. The work that was performed in Experimental Cell Block 5 was science without conscience, bad science for bad ends. That at least six Nazi medical doctors involved in this research at Dachau would be among the first scientists given contracts by the U.S. Army would become one of the darkest secrets of Operation Paperclip. Chapter 5 The Captured and Their Interrogators The capturing of Nazi scientists would now become a watershed. One by one, across the Reich, Hitler's scientists were taken into custody and interrogated. The day after Dachau was liberated, 375 miles to the north, Soviet commanders planned their final assault on the iconic Reichstag building in Berlin. Sometime around 3.30 in the afternoon, inside the Führer bunker, Hitler fired a bullet into his head. The Russians were just 500 meters from the Führer bunker's emergency exit door. Around the corner, under the Reich Chancellery, Red Army soldiers took over the underground subway tunnels, including the one Major General Dr. Walter Schreiber had been using as a hospital. Soviet film footage, alleged by Schreiber to have been filmed days later as a reenactment, shows Schreiber coming out of a cellar with his hands over his head. Up north, Siegfried Knemeyer was captured by the British. Baumbach, Knemeyer, and Speer never escaped to Greenland after all. Shortly after Hitler killed himself, Baumbach was ordered by Grand Admiral Dunitz to go to the small town of Eutin, 40 miles north of the city of Hamburg. Hitler had named Dunitz his successor. Dunitz set up his new government in the naval barracks at Eutin because it was one of the few places not yet controlled by Allied forces. Siegfried Knemeyer hadn't been invited to join the new inner circle. Baumbach let him keep the BMW and Knemeyer fled west. On a country road outside Hamburg, Knemeyer spotted a vehicle filled with British soldiers on approach. He knew that the BMW he was driving would be recognized as belonging to a senior military officer, so he pulled off the highway, ditched the car, and fled on foot. British soldiers found him hiding under a bridge and arrested him. Knemeyer was taken to a newly liberated concentration camp outside Hamburg, where hundreds of other German officers and Nazi party officials were held. He was a prisoner of war now and was accordingly stripped of his valuables and military insignia. Years later, Knemeyer would share with his son that he managed to hide his one remaining meaningful possession in his shoe a 1,000 Swiss franc note given to him by Albert Speer. Von Braun and Dornberger were not captured. So confident were they as to their future use by the U.S. Army that they turned themselves in. Since departing from Nordhausen several weeks before, Von Braun, Dornberger, and hundreds of other men from the rocket program had been hiding out in a remote ski village in the Bavarian Alps. Their resort... House Ingeborg was located at an elevation of 3,850 feet along a windy mountain road then called the Adolf Hitler Pass, known before and after the war as the Uberjoch Pass. Thanks to the resources of the SS, the scientists had plenty of fine food and drink. There was a sun terrace and, as von Braun reflected after the war, little for any of them to do but eat, drink, sunbathe, and admire the snow-capped Algoy Alps. There I was, living royally in a ski hotel on a mountain plateau, Von Braun later recalled. 
the French below us to the west and the Americans to the south. But no one, of course, suspected we were there. On the night of May 1st, 1945, the scientists were listening to the national radio as it played Bruckner's Symphony No. 7, when at 10.26 the music was interrupted by a long military drum roll. Our Führer, Adolf Hitler, fighting to the last breath against Bolshevism, fell for Germany this afternoon in his operational headquarters in the Reich Chancellery, the radio announcer declared. The fight was a fabrication. But Hitler's death spurred Warner von Braun to action. Von Braun approached General Dornberger, suggesting that they move quickly to make a deal with the Americans. I agree with you, Warner, Dornberger was overheard saying late that night. It's our obligation to put our baby into the right hands. At House Ingeborg, the rocket scientists had been using a network of German and Austrian intelligence sources to keep track of U.S. Army developments in the area. Von Braun and Dornberger knew that a unit of U.S. soldiers had set up a base at the bottom of the mountain on the Austrian side. The two men agreed it was best to send Von Braun's younger brother, Magnus, down the mountain to try to make a deal with the Americans. Magnus was trustworthy. He understood what could be said about the V-2 and what could never be said. Magnus von Braun had been in charge of overseeing slave labor production of the gyroscopes that each rocket required, and he understood why the subject of slave labor was to be avoided at all cost. He also was the best English speaker in the group. On the morning of May 2nd, Magnus von Braun climbed onto a bicycle and began pedaling down the steep mountain pass through the bright alpine sunshine. Shortly before lunchtime, he came upon an American soldier manning a post along the road. It was Private First Class Fred Schneikert, the son of a Wisconsin farmer, now a soldier with the 44th Infantry Division of the U.S. Army. When Private Schneikert spotted a lone German on a bicycle, he ordered the man to drop the bike and raise both hands. Magnus von Braun complied. In broken English, he tried explaining to the American soldier that his brother wanted to make a deal with regard to the V-2 rocket. It sounded like he wanted to sell his brother to the Americans, Private Schneikart recalled. Private Schneikart escorted Magnus von Braun further down the mountain so he could speak with a superior at the 44th Division's U.S. Counterintelligence Corps, CIC, headquarters, located in Reuter, just over the border in Austria. There, CIC contacted Schaaf headquarters in Versailles, which contacted a SIOS team. The SIOS blacklist for rocket research included 1,000 names of scientists and engineers slated for interrogation. Warner von Braun was at the top of that list. It was May 2, 1945, and although Hitler was dead, the German Reich had not yet surrendered. Allies feared members of a fanatical resistance group, the werewolves, were lurking in Bavaria, planning a final attack. Thinking that the von Braun brother could be part of a trap, the counterintelligence corps told Magnus to go tell his brother Warner to come down and surrender himself. Magnus headed back up the mountain with the news. At the House Ingeborg Ski Resort, Warner von Braun and General Dornberger had selected a small group to join their deal-making team. They were Magnus von Braun, General Dornberger's chief of staff, Herbert Axter, the engine specialist, Hans Lindenberg, and the two engineers who had hidden the V-2 documents inside the Dorton mine, Dieter Hutzel and Bernard Tessmann. The men stuffed their personal belongings into three gray passenger vans and headed down the Adolf Hitler Pass. Heavy snow gave way to driving rain. When the group of seven arrived in Reuter later that night, they found First Lieutenant Charles Stewart doing paperwork by candlelight. Their welcome was by many accounts warm. I did not expect to be kicked in the teeth, Von Braun told an American reporter years later. The V-2 was something we had and you didn't have. Naturally, you wanted to know all about it. The rocket scientists were served fresh eggs, coffee, and bread with real butter. Fancy, 
but not quite as good as what was being provided at House Ingeborg. The scientists were given private rooms to sleep in with pillows and clean sheets. In the morning, the press had arrived. The capture of the scientists and engineers behind the deadly V2 was a big story for the international press. The group posed for photographs, and in the pictures they are all smiles. Von Braun boasted about having invented the V2. He was its founder and guiding spirit, Von Braun insisted. Everyone else was secondary to him. Some members of the 44th Division Counterintelligence Corps found Von Braun's hubris appalling. He posed for endless pictures with individual GIs, in which he beamed, shook hands, pointed inquiringly at medals, and otherwise conducted himself as a celebrity rather than a prisoner, noted one member, treating our soldiers with the affable condescension of a visiting congressman. Second Lieutenant Walter Jessel was the American intelligence officer originally in charge of interrogating Von Braun. His first and most lasting impression was the lack of remorse. There is recognition of Germany's defeat, but none whatsoever of Germany's guilt and responsibility. So confident were Von Braun and Dornberger about their value to the U.S. Army, they demanded to see General Eisenhower, whom they called Ike. Another observer noted, If we hadn't caught the biggest scientist in the Third Reich, we certainly caught the biggest liar. Hitler's chemists, sought after as they were, were nowhere to be found. It was early May, and the Seventh Army was in control of the beautiful old city of Heidelberg, located on the Neckar River. Twenty-five agents attached to the U.S. military government's Cartels Division, including clerks with OSS and the Foreign Economic Division, had descended on the town looking for board members from I.G. Farben. In addition to being wanted for war crimes, the I.G. Farben Board of Directors was being investigated for international money laundering schemes. A number of high-ranking Farben executives were known to have houses in Heidelberg, but to date no one had been able to find Hermann Schmitz, the company's powerful and secretive CEO. Schmitz was also a director of the Deutsche Reichsbank, the German central bank, and director of the Bank for International Settlements in Geneva. He was believed to be the wealthiest banker in all of Germany. The reason no one had been able to locate Hermann Schmitz was not because he was hiding out or had fled, but because officers were going around Heidelberg looking for Schmitz Castle. Despite the vast wealth he had accumulated during the war, Hermann Schmitz was actually a miser. He lived in a modest, if not ugly, little house. No one would associate the legend of Schmitz with the house he lived in, Nuremberg prosecutor Josiah Dubois recalled after the war. Working on a tip and as part of a door-to-door -door search for suspected war criminals, a group of enlisted soldiers knocked on the door of a stucco pillbox of a house, overlooking the city, where a short man with a red face and a thick neck answered the door. Behind him, on a placard nailed to the wall, it was written that God was the head of this house. Schmitz had dark eyes and a goatee and was accompanied by his wife, described by soldiers as a dumpy Frau in a crisp gingham dress. Frau Schmitz offered the soldiers coffee, but Schmitz intervened and told her no. Schmitz said he had no interest in answering the questions of the enlisted men whom he considered beneath him. If an officer came to speak with him, Schmitz said he might have something to say. The men conducted a cursory search of the house. Schmitz's office was plainly furnished and contained nothing expensive or of any obvious value. Searching through his desk, however, the soldiers learned that Schmitz had friends in high places. They found a collection of birthday telegrams sent from Hitler and Goring, both of whom addressed Schmitz as Justizrats, Doctor of Laws. Doctor of Laws Schmitz, the soldiers asked, mocking him. How much money do you have in this house, and where is it? Schmitz declined to say, and the soldiers were only able to locate a small stash of about 15,000 Reichsmarks, or about half the annual salary of a field marshal.
So they left, letting Schmitz know that they would return the following day. On the second day, Schmitz let the soldiers back in. This time, the soldiers found an air raid shelter behind the house, where Schmitz had hidden a trunk filled with IG Farben documents. There was still not enough evidence to justify arresting Schmitz. It would be a few more days until an incredible discovery was made. When Sayas team leader Major Tilly learned that Hermann Schmitz had been located, he rushed to Heidelberg. Tilly and Tar had been leading the Sayas chemical weapons mission across Germany. Ever since they had discovered the Tabin nerve agent cache hidden in the forest outside the robbers' lair, they had been looking for Farben executives. Now they had the man at the top. If anyone could skillfully interrogate Hermann Schmitz, Major Tilly could. Not only did he speak fluent German, but he was deeply conversant on the subject of chemical warfare. In Heidelberg, Tilly went directly to Schmitz's house. He suggested that the two men discuss a few things in Herr Schmitz's private study. Schmitz said that would be fine. Tilly asked the Farben CEO a series of banal questions, all the while tapping on the walls of Schmitz's study. Slowly, Tilly made his way around the room this way, listening for any inconsistencies in the way the walls were built. Schmitz grew increasingly uncomfortable. Finally, he began to cry. Tilly had found what he was looking for, a secret safe buried in Schmitz's office wall. Hermann Schmitz was one of the wealthiest bankers in Germany and one of the most important players in the economics of the Third Reich. What secret was contained in his safe? Major Tilly instructed Schmitz to open it. Inside, lying flat, was a photo album. The photographs were in a wooden inlaid cover dedicated to Hermann Schmitz on his 25th jubilee, possibly as a Farben director. Tilly explained in a Sios intelligence report. Tilly lifted out the photo album from its hiding place, flipped open the cover, and began reviewing the pictures. On page one of the scrapbook, the word Auschwitz was written. Tilly's eyes scanned over a picture of a street in a Polish village. Next to the photograph was a cartoonish drawing depicting individuals who had once been part of the Jewish population who lived there, portrayed in a manner that was not flattering to them, Tilly explained. The caption underneath the cartoon read, The Old Auschwitz, as it was, Auschwitz in 1940. At this point, Tilly wrote in his Sias report, he was surprised at how highly emotional Schmitz became. What Tilly did not yet know was that he was looking at Schmitz's secret photo album that chronicled the building history of Farben's labor concentration camp, IG Auschwitz, from the very start. In May of 1945, almost no one, including Major Tilly, had any idea what really had happened at Auschwitz, that at least 1.1 million people had been exterminated there. The facts about the camp had not yet come to light. On January 27, 1945, Soviet troops liberated Auschwitz, and Red Army photographers took film footage and photographs of the atrocities they discovered there. But that information had not yet been shared openly with the rest of the world. A short report about the extermination camp had appeared in Stalinovsk Zamnaya, the Red Army's newspaper, on January 28, 1945. Stalin was waiting to release the bulk of information until after Germany surrendered. What was clear to Major Tilly was that this photo album was important to Schmitz and that he wanted it to remain hidden. Why, exactly, Major Tilly had no idea. As Sayas' team leader, Major Tilly was on a hunt for Farben chemists who had developed nerve gas. Hermann Schmitz, while important to Farben in the bigger picture, was not a chemist. He claimed to have no idea where the Farben chemists had gone. The scrapbook was taken into evidence, and Tilly moved on in his search. Meanwhile, in southern Germany, in an Austrian border town called Gindorf, the man Major Tilly was really looking for, Dr. Otto Ambrose, had just been located by U.S. Army soldiers.
the soldiers had no idea who Ambrose really was. When American soldiers rolled into the town of Gindorf, about sixty miles southeast of Munich, they noticed one man in particular because he stood out like a sore thumb. This first encounter with Ambrose, later recounted at the Nuremberg trials, stuck out in the soldiers' minds because Ambrose had been dressed in a fancy suit to greet the victors. The man hardly looked like he'd been through a war. The soldiers asked the man his rank and serial number. My name is Otto Ambrose, he said, smiling. He added that he was not a military man, but a plain chemist. Was he German, the soldiers asked? Yes, I am German, Ambrose replied, and made a joke. He said that he had so many French friends, he could almost be considered a Frenchman. In fact, his true home was in Ludwigshafen, on the border with France. He told the soldiers that the reason he was here in southern Bavaria was because he was the director of a large business concern called I.G. Farben. The company had a detergent factory here in Gindorf, Ambrose explained. As a Farben board member, he'd been asked to oversee production. German society might be experiencing a collapse, he told the soldiers, but everyone needed to stay clean. The soldiers asked to be taken to the detergent factory. Inside, they inspected huge vats of soap and other cleaning products. Work at the factory appeared to have been uninterrupted by the war. Ambrose took the soldiers to his office, where someone had taped a rainbow of color spectrum cards to the wall. In addition to cleaning products, the facility made lacquers, Ambrose explained. The soldiers looked around, thanked Ambrose for the tour, and asked him not to leave town. I have no reason to flee, said Ambrose. The soldiers noted how much he smiled. Over the next few days, more soldiers arrived in Gindorf. These filthy, grimed-covered American G.I.s were delighted when the so-called plain chemist offered them free bars of soap. Some of the soldiers hadn't washed in more than a month. The chemist's generosity did not stop there. Otto Ambrose gave the soldiers powerful cleaning solvents so that they could wash their mud-covered armored tanks. Soldiers interviewed Otto Ambrose a second time. This time, Ambrose voluntarily offered up character witnesses. Working at the Farben factory in Gindorf were skinny men with shaved heads. Ambrose said they were war refugees and that they could vouch for his kindness as a boss. They were from Poland, just across the border to the east. Ambrose told the soldiers that he had personally brought these poor workers here to Gindorf. He'd hand-picked the men and trained them how to work hard. This way, when the refugees went home, they would have skills that could help them earn a living, Ambrose explained. The skinny refugees were quiet and said nothing to dispute the plain chemists' claims. Some of them even helped the American soldiers wash their tanks. Otto Ambrose was a talkative man. He regaled the Americans with stories about the joys of chemistry. For example, did the soldiers realize what a miracle it was that man could make 100 wonders from a single chemical compound like ethylene oxide? Or how amazing rubber was? Ambrose told the soldiers that he'd been to Ceylon, where the rubber plant grows. Rubber had so much in common with man, Ambrose said. He was a rubber expert, so he knew this to be fact. Rubber was civilized neat and perfect if kept clean. Ambrose told the soldiers that a rubber factory and a man must always be very clean. A single flake of dust or dirt in a vat of liquid rubber could mean a blowout on the Autobahn one day. I.G. Farben had synthetic rubber factories and, like natural rubber, the laboratories and factories must always be kept perfectly clean. Ambrose talked a lot but he did not mention anything about the rubber factory he had built and managed at Auschwitz. The soldiers thanked him for his generosity with the soap and the cleaning agents. Before they left, they reminded Ambrose again that it was important he not leave town. He was technically under house arrest. When American officials of higher rank finally arrived in Gindorf a few days later, they had more specific questions for Ambrose. Why was part of the Farben detergent factory built underground? 
It would take months for Sios investigators to learn that the factory here in Gindorf produced chemical weapons during the war, and that after Ambrose had fled Auschwitz in late January 1945, he and his deputy, Jürgen von Klink, had come to Gindorf to destroy evidence, hide documents, and disguise the factory so that it appeared to produce only detergents and soap. In Munich, on May 17, 1945, U.S. soldiers at a checkpoint were conducting a routine identification request when a well-dressed man, 134 pounds, 5 foot 9, with dark black hair, hazel eyes, and a pronounced dueling scar on the left side of his face, between his nose and his upper lip, presented a German passport bearing the name Professor Dr. Friedrich Ludwig Kurt Blomme. Dr. Blomme's name triggered an alert. Immediate arrest. First priority. Samuel Goodsmith and the entire team of biological warfare experts with Operation Alsace had been on the hunt for Dr. Blomme. Agent Arnold Weith, with the Army's Counterintelligence Corps, made the arrest. Agent Weith completed the necessary paperwork while the prisoner was processed. Dr. Blomme was sent to the 12th Army Group Interrogation Center for questioning. Several days later, a document arrived via teletype from the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, America's wartime espionage agency and the precursor to the CIA. They, too, had been searching for Dr. Blomme. The War Crimes Office had considerable information about Dr. Kurt Blomme. He was Deputy Surgeon General of the Third Reich and Vice President of the Reich's Physicians League, Reich's Arzakama. He was believed to have reported directly to Goring and maybe even Himmler or to both. Blomme had been named head of Reich Cancer Research in 1942. Alsace and OSS presumed that this was a cover name for biological weapons work. Blomme was a dedicated and proud Nazi. His book, Arts on Kampf, Doctor in Battle, compared a doctor's struggle with the struggle of the Third Reich. Soldiers, officers, and doctors weren't all that different, each constantly in battle against invading forces and disease. Investigators were trying to piece together the labyrinthine medical hierarchy of the Third Reich so as to understand who was in charge of what organization. Particularly interesting to the interrogators was the fact that Dr. Kurt Blomme had been part of a top-tier group of Nazi doctors who focused on hygiene. This word connotated disease control, but was also believed to have been used by the Reich as a euphemism for ethnic cleansing and extermination of Jews. Alsace was in possession of correspondence between Blomme and Himmler that discussed giving certain groups of sick individuals, in this case tubercular poles, special treatment. Zunderbehandlung. What exactly did special treatment mean? At the time of Blomme's capture and interrogation, Allied intelligence agencies believed that there was only one physician higher than Blomme in the hierarchy of the Reich Hygiene Committee, and that was the notorious Reich health leader, Reich's Gesundheitsführer, Leonardo Conti. Dr. Blomme spoke fluent English with his first army interrogator. He described himself as a good Nazi, obedient, and promised that he was willing to cooperate with the Allies. At first, his interrogators were thrilled by the prospect of learning more about Reich medicine from such a big fish as Dr. Blomme. Why was he cooperating? Blomme was asked. I cannot approve of the way new advances in medical science have been used for atrocities, declared Dr. Blomme. What kind of atrocities? Blomme's investigator wanted to know. Blom stated that in his capacity as Deputy Surgeon General of the Reich, he had observed new scientific studies and experiments which led to later atrocities, e.g. mass sterilization, gassing of Jews. It was an astonishing admission. 
Until Dr. Blama gave up this information so freely, no physician in the inner circle had admitted to having known about such wide-scale atrocities as mass murder and sterilization programs. That Blama was willing to talk was extremely promising news. Blama was cooperative and intelligent, noted his interrogator. Most important, he was willing to supply information. But the U.S. investigator's excitement did not last long. By his next interrogation, Dr. Kurt Blama had shut down entirely. He told his interrogating officer, Major E. W. B. Gill, that he had only ever been an administrator for the Reich, that he did nothing hands-on. Major Gill pressed Blama for information about his direct superior, Dr. Leonardo Conti. Blama said he knew nothing about Conti's job. When I pointed out that the deputy must presumably know something about his chief's job, Major Gill wrote in his report, he said the organization was extremely complicated and really he would like to draw me a diagram on it. Gill lost his temper. I told Blama I didn't want his damn diagrams, but an answer to a simple question. How did he take Conti's place if he, Conti, were absent or ill if he knew nothing of the job? Bloma repeated his position, that it was all too complicated to explain to a man like Major Gill. Outraged by the sidestepping, Gill kept at it. But by the end of Bloma's Alsace interrogation, Major Gill had been unable to get even a scrap of new information from Bloma. He claimed never to have heard of the majority of the names of fellow doctors that Major Gill asked him about. Instead, Blama insisted that he knew nothing about the medical chain of command inside the Third Reich or the SS, despite the fact that he had personally met with Himmler five times since 1943. Gill asked how Blama, a cancer expert, had been put in charge of the Reich's bioweapons program, a subject he claimed to know very little about. Blama said he had no answer for that. On my suggestion that a most important branch of war research would not be assigned to a complete ignoramus, he, after endless explanations of the complexity of the German world, finally said it must have been because, as an undergraduate, he wrote on B.W., biological weapons, as his thesis for a doctorate. Major Gill felt for certain that Dr. Bloma was lying. But there was nothing he could do except present Bloma with information and evidence that Alsace had compiled about him since they had seized Dr. Eugen Hagen's apartment six months before. Gill told Bloma that in a series of interrogations with 16 Reich doctors also involved in bioweapons-related research, Alsace officers had learned about many horrific medical crimes. Gill explained that Alsace had documents that tied Bloma to the crimes. For example, Alsace had found letters inside the apartment of Dr. Eugen Hagen that linked Dr. Bloma to Dr. Hagen, and also to an SS colleague named Dr. August Hurt. These letters made clear that someone was providing Reich doctors with human guinea pigs. Who exactly was in charge of this program, Gill asked Bloma. Gill needed a name. Bloma denied having any idea what Gill was referring to. Major Gill told Bloma he had a letter that implicated Bloma. In another letter, Gill said, Dr. Bloma had instructed Dr. Hurt to conduct research on the effect of mustard gas on living organisms. The phrase, Living organisms was a code name for people, wasn't it? Gill asked Bloma. Dr. Bloma kept stonewalling. On the whole subject of SS research, his attitude was always that it was so secret that not even the Reich chief medical advisor knew anything about it, Major Gill wrote in his report. Gill was convinced that Dr. Kurt Bloma was lying. He felt certain that Drs. Hagen, Hurt, Bloma and the SS were connected to medical research on prisoners at concentration camps. This interrogation was extremely unproductive, a frustrated Major Gill summarized in his report. Although I do not wish to be definitive, my first impression is that Bloma is a liar and a medical charlatan. Down south in the Bavarian Alps, 
While the V-2 rocket scientist angled for a deal with the U.S. Army, George Rickey, former general manager of the Middlework, tried to blend in. Rickey had taken a job 90 miles from Nordhausen, running operations in a salt mine. For several weeks, no one was looking for him. Then, Colonel Peter Beasley of the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, USSBS, arrived in the area on a mission from the War Department. Beasley's job was to locate the engineers who had built the fortified underground weapons facilities in the Haars. These bomb-proof bunkers were extraordinary engineering feats, and the USSBS was impressed with how so many of them had withstood relentless Allied air bombing campaigns. The rocket facility at Nordhausen was of particular importance to USSBS officers, and Colonel Beasley set up shop in an abandoned barracks just north of the former Middlework factory in a town called Eelfeld to investigate. As circumstance would have it, the barracks he chose to occupy was the building in which the former office of George Rickey was located. From documents and equipment left behind, Colonel Beasley learned that Rickey possessed extremely valuable information about how the tunnel factory had been built. Beasley asked around, but none of the locals claimed to know where Rickey had gone. I made daily visits to the jails in the small towns to see if I could locate anyone who might interest me, Beasley wrote in a report. Eventually, he found a man who gave him a tip. George Rickey was running operations at a salt mine in the Black Forest, the man said. Colonel Beasley sent two officers into the field to track Rickey down. Meanwhile, Beasley and his team followed another lead. In Blankenburg, Beasley wrote, we found a school building with some miscellaneous papers bearing the Speer Ministry insignia. From these documents, Beasley learned that George Rickey was the liaison between the Middlework and the Ministry of Armaments. When Beasley's two officers returned with George Rickey in custody, Beasley placed Rickey under arrest and began to interrogate him. He was a nervous little man who smoked incessantly and always brought the conversation back to scientific or technical matters, Beasley recalled after the war, but in the end, he was a most profitable catch. I've got a job for you, Beasley told Rickey. I want you to begin right now writing out a full description of yourself and all the activities of the V2 factory and what your people were working on. Riquet complied. When the task was complete, Beasley told the former general manager of the Middlework, We accept you as an official of the German government. We have patience and time and lots of people. You have lost the war, and so as far as I am concerned, you are a man who knows a lot about rockets. As an American officer, I want my country to have full possession of all your knowledge. To my superiors, I shall recommend that you be taken to the United States. Rickey embraced this news with open arms. He told Beasley that he was a scientist and only wanted to work in pleasant surroundings, like the United States. He agreed to tell Beasley where some important records had been hidden. Rickey took Colonel Beasley to a cave several miles away. There, 42 boxes of worksheets, engineering tables, and blueprints relating to Nordhausen and the V-2 had been stashed. This was certainly not Warner Von Braun's document stash, but for the USSBS, it was more than they possessed up to this point. Now that he was in possession of a huge trove of documents, Colonel Beasley realized that he needed to have them translated by someone with technical expertise. He had promised Rickey a recommendation for a job in the United States, but first he needed Rickey to come with him to London to translate and analyze these documents for him. Albert Speer, one of the most wanted Nazi war criminals in the world, was finally captured on the morning of May 23, 1945. He was standing in one of the bathrooms of a friend's castle, Schloss Glücksburg, near Flensburg in northern Germany. Hitler's successor, Grand Admiral Dunitz, had by now moved his new government from Eutin to Flensburg, which was located just a few miles from the Danish border. 
Speer, a Dunitz cabinet member, had been making the daily six-mile drive from Schloss Glücksburg to the new government's headquarters. The way Speer told the story of his capture, he had been shaving when he heard the sounds of heavy footsteps and loud orders being delivered in English. Sensing that the end of his freedom had arrived, Speer opened the bathroom door a little, his face half covered in shaving cream, and saw the British soldiers standing there. Are you Albert Speer, sir? A British sergeant asked. Yes, I am Speer, he answered in English. Sir, you are my prisoner, the sergeant said. Speer got dressed and packed a bag. Outside, on the castle lawn, a unit of British soldiers with anti-tank guns had surrounded Schloss Glücksburg. Speer was arrested and taken away. By the time the British arrested Speer, American officials had known for nearly two weeks where he had been hiding out. Speer's previous eleven days in the castle had been spent in discussions with American officials with the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, USSBS. The head of that organization, Paul Nitz, had managed to be the first person in an international manhunt to track down Albert Speer. Nitz considered Speer his most desired intelligence target, and on May 12, 1945, he boarded his DC-3 from where he was stationed in London and headed to Castle Glücksburg before you could say knife, Nitz recalled after the war. Because Flensburg was in the British zone of control, it was the British who needed to arrest Albert Speer. Until then, Nitz, an American, felt at liberty to get as much information from Speer as he could. We were looking for absolutely vital information and knowledge, and he was literally the only person in Germany who was in a position to provide it, Nitz recalled years later. Specifically, Nitz's organization wanted to know which Allied bombing campaigns had proved the most devastating against Germany during the war. America was still at war with the Japanese, and the USSBS believed Speer could provide them with information that might help America defeat them. Nitz was joined at the castle by two of his colleagues, George Ball and John Kenneth Galbraith. For the next eleven days, the three men questioned Speer. From inside an elegant sitting room, wallpapered in red and gold brocade, the men discussed which Allied bombing campaigns had done the most damage to Nazi Germany and which had had the least effect. Of particular interest to Nitz, Ball, and Galbraith was how the Reich's armaments industry had been able to hold out for so long. Speer explained that at his initiative, the majority of the Reich's weapons facilities had been moved underground. These weapons complexes had proved to be impervious to even the heaviest bombing campaigns. They were engineering triumphs, their construction spearheaded largely by Franz Dorsch and Speer's deputy, Walter Schieber, Speer said. Speer's secretary, Anna-Marie Kempf, took notes. The only interruption was when the cook for the castle summoned everyone for lunch. Speer did not mention that his deputy, SS Brigadefuhrer Schieber, a chemist, also worked with Speer in chemical weapons production. That would be opening up a can of war crimes-related worms. The Americans were not interested in pressing Speer about his involvement in war crimes, and Speer was certainly not offering up any incriminating evidence against himself. Mostly, he boasted about his ministry's feats. George Ball recalled that only once, maybe twice, during the USS BS questioning was Speer asked about the concentration camps. I asked him what he knew about the extermination of the Jews. He said he couldn't comment because he hadn't known about it, but he added that it was a mistake not to have found out, Ball told Speer's biographer, Gita Zarene, after the war. John Kenneth Galbraith was the only one of the three men from the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey who had toured a liberated concentration camp before interviewing Speer. Galbraith had seen the atrocities at Dachau and Buchenwald. He explained, One was just beginning to hear rumors about Auschwitz. D. 
Did Galbraith believe that Speer did not know about the extermination of the Jews? No, I don't believe he didn't know, Galbraith told Zarene. Certainly he knew about all the slave laborers. I remember him saying to us, You should hang Saukel, Speer's deputy in charge of slave labor. And then a few weeks later, Saukel said to us, You should hang Speer. Nice people, weren't they? After eleven days of discussions with the Americans, the British located and arrested Speer. They drove him the six miles to Flensburg, where the remaining members of Hitler's government were also arrested. Under an escort of more than thirty armored vehicles, the prisoners were driven to waiting aircraft. There, in a field of grass, the men of Hitler's inner circle were loaded onto two airplanes and flown to a top-secret interrogation center codenamed Ashcan. That same afternoon, one hundred miles south of Flensburg, at the 31st Civilian Interrogation Camp near Lüneburg, a former Wehrmacht sergeant was making a lot of noise. The officer in charge of Camp 31, Captain Thomas Sylvester, found the man's behavior odd. Wehrmacht soldiers who were prisoners rarely did anything to draw attention to themselves. Captain Sylvester sent for the agitated man, whom he described as a short, ill-looking person in civilian clothing with a black eye patch over his left eye. Face to face with Captain Sylvester, the small, ugly man ceremoniously pulled off the eye patch, revealing a pale, unshaven face. The man then produced a pair of horn-rimmed glasses from his pocket and put them on his face. Heinrich Himmler, the prisoner announced in a quiet voice. With the glasses on, Captain Sylvester recognized Heinrich Himmler at once. Before him stood a man many considered the most powerful man in the Third Reich after Hitler. Himmler was Reichsfuhrer SS and chief of the German police, commander of the reserve army of the Wehrmacht, and Reich Minister of the Interior. That face, the cleft chin and the sinister, smiling eyes. Ever since a drawing of Himmler had appeared on the cover of Time magazine on October 11, 1943, portraying the police chief of Nazi Europe in front of a mountain of corpses, he had become synonymous with evil. Now that the little round glasses were on, Sylvester was certain this person was indeed Heinrich Himmler. Still, Captain Sylvester followed protocol and asked for signature verification. When Himmler had been captured days before, he'd presented forged military papers that identified him as a Wehrmacht sergeant named Heinrich Hitzinger. The signature matched, and Captain Sylvester sent for the most senior interrogator in Camp 31, a captain named Smith. Once Smith arrived, Sylvester ordered Himmler searched again. This time, British soldiers found two vials of poison hidden in Himmler's clothes. It was medicine to treat stomach cramps, Himmler said. Captain Smith ordered a second physical exam of the prisoner, and the camp's doctor, Captain Clement Wells, spotted a blue-tipped object hidden in the back of Himmler's mouth. When Dr. Wells tried to remove it, Himmler jerked his head back and bit down. The vial contained poison. Within seconds, the prisoner collapsed. Now Heinrich Himmler was dead. An assistant to Dr. Wells noted in his diary, this evil thing breathed its last breath at 2314. The war in Europe was over. Germans called it Die Stunde Null, zero hour. Cities lay in ruins. Allied bombing had destroyed more than 1.8 million German homes. Of the 18.2 million men who had served in the German Army, Navy, Luftwaffe, and the Waffen-SS, a total of 5.3 million had been killed. Sixty-one countries had been drawn into a war Germany started. Some 50 million people were dead. The Third Reich was no more. Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Hitler were dead. Albert Speer was in custody. So were Siegfried Kneemeyer and Dr. Kurt Blomma. Otto Ambrose was under house arrest in Gindorf, with no one in Sayas or Alsace, 
yet having figured out who he really was. Warner Von Braun, Walter Dornberger, and Arthur Rudolph were in custody, working toward contracts with the U.S. Army. George Rickey had a job in London, translating documents for the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey. The future of war and weapons hung in the balance. What would happen to the Nazi scientists? Who would be hired and who would be hanged? In May 1945, there was no official policy regarding what to do with any of them. The question, who is a Nazi, is often a dark riddle. An officer with the Third Army, G5, wrote in a report sent to Shave headquarters in May. The question, what is a Nazi, is also not easy to answer. Over the next few months, critical decisions about what to do with Hitler's former scientists and engineers would be made, almost always based on an individual military organization's needs and justified by perceived threats. Official policy would follow, one version for the public and another for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS. A headless monster called Project Paperclip would emerge. Part 2 The scale on which science and engineering have been harnessed to the chariot of destruction in Germany is indeed amazing. There is a tremendous amount to be learnt in Germany at the present time. W. S. Farin, British aviation expert with the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Chapter 6 Harnessing the Chariot of Destruction what to do about Hitler's former scientists. The fighting had stopped and the Allied forces were transitioning from a conquering army to an occupying force. Germany was to be disarmed, demilitarized, and denazified, so its ability to make war would be reduced to nil, and science and technology were at the very heart of the matter. Clearly, German science must be curbed, noted Army Air Force's Lieutenant Colonel John O'Mara in the SIAS report he authored on the rise of the Luftwaffe. But how? World War I had ended with a peace treaty that, among other restrictions, sought to prevent the rise of German air power by forbidding powered flight. The result, explained O'Mara, was as ludicrous as it was tragic. By the time Germany started World War II, its air force was the most powerful in the world. The mistake could not be repeated, and the U.S. procedural guidelines for an occupied Germany, contained in a directive known as JCS, Joint Chiefs of Staff, 1076, promised to nullify Germany's appetite for war. All military research was to cease. Scientists were rounded up and taken to detention centers for extensive questioning. Across the former Reich, Schaeff had set up internment centers where more than 1,500 scientists were now being held separate from other German prisoners of war. The U.S. Army had approximately 500 scientists in custody at Garmisch-Partenkirchen in the Bavarian Alps, including the von Braun and Dornberger group. There were 444 persons of interest detained in Heidenheim, north of Munich. 200 were in Zell am See in Austria. 30 kept at Chateau de Grand Chesnay in France. The U.S. Navy had 200 scientists and engineers at a holding facility in Kochel, Germany, including many wind tunnel experts. The Army Air Forces had 150 Luftwaffe engineers and technicians in Bad Kissingen, Germany, a majority of whom had been rounded up by Colonel Donald Putt. SIOS had 50 scientists, including Warner Ossenberg in Versailles. But there was no clear policy regarding what lay ahead for the scientists, engineers, and technicians in Allied custody, and General Eisenhower sought clarification on the issue. From Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force in France, he sent a cable to the War Department General Staff in Washington, D.C., asking for specific direction about longer-term goals. Restraint and control of future German scientific and technical investigations are clearly indicated, General Eisenhower wrote. But this headquarters is without guidance on the matter and is in no position to formulate long-term policy. Were these men going to be detained indefinitely, interrogated and released? 
The War Department responded to Eisenhower's cable by letting him know his query was considered a matter of urgency. Tentative responsibility was assigned to the captured personnel and materiel branch of the Military Intelligence Service, Europe. Now that group was in charge of overseeing the scientists' basic needs, including living quarters, food, and in some cases, pay. But it would be another two weeks before the War Department would get back to General Eisenhower with any kind of a statement regarding policy. In the meantime, a number of events were unfolding, in America and in Germany, that would affect the decision-making of the War Department General Staff. In the absence of policy, ideas were floated at the Pentagon. Some, like Major General Kenneth B. Wolfe of the Army Air Forces, took matters into their own hands. General Wolfe was Chief of Engineering and Procurement for Air Technical Service Command at Wright Field, and he supported Major General Knair and Colonel Putt in their quest for capturing Luftwaffe spoils discovered at Vulcan Road. But General Wolfe envisioned an even bigger science exploitation program and felt strongly that policy needed to be set now. Wolfe flew to Schaeff headquarters in France to meet with Eisenhower's deputy, General Lucius D. Clay, to promote his idea. General Clay told General Wolfe that he was not opposed to such a program, but that now was hardly a good time to broach it. Besieged by the countless demands and the chaotic conditions relevant to ending the war and the burdensome complexities of planning for the peace, Clay considered such efforts six months premature, explains historian Clarence Lasby. General Clay told General Wolfe to come back and talk to him in six months. Instead, Wolfe set out for Nordhausen, Germany, where his colleague at the Pentagon, Colonel Gervais William Trichel, was running Special Mission V-2, the top-secret scientific intelligence operation for the U.S. Army Ordnance Rocket Branch. Inside the abandoned rocket production facility in the underground tunnel complex at Nordhausen, Special Mission V-2 was just getting underway. When General Wolfe saw the vast numbers of V-weapons left behind, he became even more convinced that a U.S. program to exploit Nazi science had to happen now. Upon his return to Washington, D.C., General Wolfe wrote to General Clay with a revised idea. Not only did the United States military need to act immediately to capture Nazi armaments, Wolfe said, but America needed to hire the German scientists and engineers who had created the weapons and put them to work in America. If steps to this end are taken, the double purpose of preventing Germany's resurgence as a war power and advancing our own industrial future may be served. Clay did not respond. He had already told General Wolfe to back off for six months. Meanwhile, the work that was going on at Nordhausen under the auspices of Special Mission V-2 would greatly influence the future of all the Nazi science programs that would follow. The man in charge of Special Mission V-2, 28-year-old Major Robert B. Staver, was no stranger to the military significance of the Nazis' rockets. While preparing for Special Mission V-2 in London the winter before, Staver was nearly killed by one. He and a British colleague had been working inside an office at 27 Grosvenor Square one afternoon in February when a loud blast knocked both of them to the floor. Staver went to the window and saw a big, round cloud of smoke where a V-2 had exploded overhead. Watching pieces of burning metal rain down from the sky, Staver did a few calculations in his head and determined that the V-2 had likely been heading very directly at the building in which he was working when it blew up prematurely. A few weeks later, Major Staver was asleep in a hotel room near the Marble Arch, when he was thrown out of bed by an enormous blast. A V-2 had landed in nearby Hyde Park and killed 62 people. The near-death experiences made him ever more committed to Special Mission V-2. For six weeks, Staver worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, studying aerial photographs of Nordhausen supplied to him by the British, and otherwise learning everything he could about V-weapons. As soon as the Allied forces liberated the tunnel complex, Major Staver would be one of the first intelligence officers inside. 
Now, finally, here he was at Nordhausen. It was May 12, 1945, and though his mission was almost complete, time was running out because the Russians were headed into this area soon. By U.S. Army calculations, they would most likely arrive in 18 days from Berlin. U.S. Army Ordnance believed that the V-2 rocket could help win the Pacific War, and for nearly two weeks, Staver had been hard at work. He had overseen the collection of 400 tons of rocket parts, which had been loaded onto rail cars for delivery to the port of Antwerp, from where they would be shipped to the United States. But with his degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University, Staver knew that the V-2 rocket was a lot more than the sum of its parts. Without blueprints or technical drawings, it was highly unlikely that American engineers could simply cobble the rocket components together and make the V-2 fly. The drawings and blueprints had to have been stashed somewhere near Nordhausen. If only Major Staver could find a German scientist to bribe, he might be able to find out where the crucial documents were hidden. For two weeks now, Staver had been traveling through the Harz Mountain, touring underground weapons factories, searching for a clue or a lead as to who might know more about the V-2 document stash. Locals told a wide variety of stories. Some spoke of paperwork going up in flames. Others talked about truckloads of metal trunks being hidden away in abandoned buildings, in beer gardens, and in castle walls. But this was all hearsay. No one could produce a concrete lead, and it was not exactly difficult to understand why. War crimes investigators were also in Nordhausen, asking locals lots of questions. And as Staver trolled for rocket scientists, American G.I.s continued to dig mass graves for the thousands of corpses found at Nordhausen Dora slave labor camp. The entire town of Nordhausen still smelled of death. While driving around on his hunt, Staver kept boxes stashed in the back of his army jeep filled with cigarettes, alcohol, and cans of spam. These valuable black market goods worked well in exchange for information, and finally Staver got the lead he was looking for. A source told him that there was a V-2 rocket scientist by the name of Carl Otto Fleischer who lived nearby. Fleischer had been an engineer inside the Nordhausen tunnels, as well as the Wehrmacht's business manager, and he knew a lot more than he was letting on. Fleischer reported directly to General Dornberger. He knew things. Staver drove to the scientist's residence with a proposition more powerful than a can of spam. Major Staver told Carl Otto Fleischer that he could cooperate or go to jail. Important V-2 documents had been hidden somewhere around Nordhausen, Staver said. If anyone knew, Fleischer did, Staver surmised. Dieter Hutzel and Bernard Tessmann had indeed told Fleischer about the document stash in the Dorton mine before they fled for the Bavarian Alps. But Fleischer's allegiance was to his colleagues, so he lied to Staver and said he had no idea what Staver was talking about. He pointed the finger at another colleague, an engineer and Vaughn Brown deputy named Dr. Eberhard Reis. Ask Reis, Fleischer said. He was the former chief in charge of the Pinamunde assembly line. When interviewed by Staver, Dr. Eberhard Reis played his own disinformation card, using Major Staver's influence to help spring a third colleague from jail. Walter Riedel, chief of V-2 rocket motor and structural design, had been one of the four men honored at the Castle Varlar event the previous December. Now, Riedel was receiving rough treatment in a jail 80 miles away, in Saalfeld. He had been mistaken by military intelligence as having been Hitler's biological weapons chief. Agents with the counterintelligence corps had knocked out several of Riedel's front teeth. His security report listed him as an active Nazi who wore the uniform and the party badge, Ardent. Riedel joined the Nazi party in 1937 and was a member of five Nazi organizations. In a series of interviews with Riedel, Major Staver found him to be a strange bird. Riedel was obsessed with outer space vehicles, which he called passenger rockets. In one interview, Riedel insisted he designed these passenger rockets for short trips around the moon. 
and that he'd been pursuing space mirrors, which would be used for good and possibly evil. Riedel said he knew of at least 40 rocket scientists besides himself who should be brought to America to complete this groundbreaking work. If the Americans didn't act, Riedel said, the Russians surely would. Staver asked Riedel if he knew where the V-2 technical drawings were hidden. Riedel said he had no idea. Staver was working on a number of problems, all compounded by the fact that the Russians were coming. That much was real. Nordhausen had been liberated by the Americans and was originally designated to be part of the American zone. Stalin protested, saying Russia had lost 17 million men in the war and deserved greater reparations for the greater losses sustained. The Allies agreed to turn over a large swath of American-held German territory to the Soviets on June 1st. This territory included all of Nordhausen and everything in it. But Staver had more to worry about than the Russians. On May 18, 1945, an airplane arrived, carrying a physicist and ordnance expert named Dr. Howard Percy H.P. Robertson. Robertson had been a team leader for Operation Alsace, and now he served President Eisenhower as chief of the Scientific Intelligence Advisory Section under Schaefe. Dr. H.P. Robertson told Major Staver that he intended to take rocket engineers Fleischer, Riedel, and Race to Garmisch-Partenkirchen for interrogation, where they would be held alongside General Dornberger and Warner von Braun until the War Department general staff decided on a policy regarding Nazi scientists. Major Staver refused to give up Fleischer, Riedel, and Race. They were his charges, he told Robertson. As far as exploiting Nazi science for American use, Staver and Robertson saw eye to eye. But as far as giving Nazi scientists special privileges, the two men were on opposite sides of the aisle. The idea outraged Robertson, who saw Nazi scientists as amoral opportunists who were hostile to the Allied cause. Dr. Robertson was a mathematical physicist who had taken a leave of absence from a professorship at Princeton University to help in the war effort. He was a jovial gentleman who liked crossword puzzles, Ivy League football matches, and scotch. Robertson spoke German fluently and was respected by Germany's academic elite, not just for his scientific accomplishments, but because he had studied in 1925 in Göttingen and Munich. Before the war, Dr. Robertson counted many leading German scientists as his friends. World War II changed his perspective, notably regarding any German scientists who stayed and worked for Hitler. While at Princeton, Dr. Robertson had become friendly with Albert Einstein. The two men worked on theoretical projects together and spent time discussing Hitler, National Socialism, and the war. Einstein, born in Germany, had worked there until 1933, becoming director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Physics and professor at the University of Berlin. But when Hitler came to power, Einstein immediately renounced his citizenship in defiance of the Nazi party and immigrated to the United States. Dr. Robertson shared Einstein's core view. It had been the duty of German scientists to protest Hitler's racist policies beginning in 1933. Anyone who had served the Reich's war machine was not going to be given a free pass by H.P. Robertson now. Determined to keep the Nazi scientists in his custody, Staver played the Russian card. Robertson may have been anti-Nazi, but he was also deeply patriotic. With access to secret Alsace intelligence information, Robertson was well aware that Russian rocket development was a legitimate and growing threat. Both men knew that in as little as 12 days, the Russians would arrive in Nordhausen. If Staver was not able to locate the V-2 documents by then, the Russians would eventually find them. Major Staver appealed to Dr. Robertson, arguing that his keeping Fleischer, Riedel, and Race was the Army's last and best shot at locating the hidden V-2 documents. Ultimately, Dr. Robertson agreed. 
In a final appeal, Staver asked Robertson if there was anything Robertson could offer up that might help him in his search for the V2 stash, some clue or detail that Staver might be overlooking. Indeed, there was. Dr. Robertson's fluency in science and his familiarity with German scientific intelligence had thus far made him an extremely effective interrogator of the Nazi scientific and military elite. Wehrmacht generals, SS officers, and scientists were notoriously eager to speak with him. Listening to Staver, Dr. Robertson had an idea. He pulled a small writing pad out of his shirt pocket and looked over his notes. During an earlier interrogation of a rocket scientist named von Plutz, Robertson had gotten an interesting lead. He decided to share it with Major Staver. Von Plutz said that General Dornberger told General Rossmann, the German Army's weapons office department chief, that documents of V-weapon production were hidden in Kalewerk, salt mine, at Bleicherod, walled into one of the mine shafts, read Robertson from his notes. Robertson suggested that Staver use that information to his advantage. He agreed to leave Fleischer, Riedel, and Race with Major Staver while he headed to Garmisch-Partenkirchen to interview General Dornberger and Warner von Braun. At Garmisch-Partenkirchen, Robertson found the rocket scientist sunbathing in the Alps. This lovely Bavarian ski resort was the place where Adolf Hitler had hosted the Winter Olympics in 1936. Now, the U.S. Army had hundreds of scientists set up in a former military barracks here. The food was plentiful, and the air was fresh and clean. Mountain springtime, Dieter Hutzel recalled in his memoir. Trees by now had donned their fresh, new green flowers everywhere as far as one could see from our windows and balconies. Rain was infrequent, and almost every day sunbathing was possible on a lawn-covered yard. Hutzel's only complaint was that he didn't receive mail and couldn't make telephone calls. Warner von Braun, General Dornberger, and their group had been here since being transferred from CIC headquarters in Reuta. Isolated in the Alps, the two scientists had been frustrating their interrogators, stonewalling and withholding information. Dr. Robertson came to see if he could get any better information out of the scientists. Most of the rocket team was here, including the two men who had stashed the V-2 documents that Staver was now searching for, Dieter Hutzel and Bernard Tessmann. Neither Hutzel nor Tessmann had shared with von Braun or Dornberger the fact that they told Carl Otto Fleischer the location of the stash in the Dorton mine. Dornberger and von Braun were under the assumption that they held all the bargaining chips. The intelligence officer Walter Jessel had sensed something was amiss with Dornberger and von Braun, that the two rocket scientists were playing games. Control was exercised by Dornberger in the course of the Sios investigations, Jessel noted in one report. Dornberger's first instructions to other scientists, probably under the impression of immediate transfer of the whole group to the United States, were to cooperate fully with the investigators, Jessel explained. But as the days wore on and no deal was offered by the Allies, Jessel watched Dornberger become intractable. Sometime later, he, Dornberger, gave the word to the others to hold back on information and say as little as possible. The scientists were walking on the razor's edge. If they said too much, many of them could be implicated in the slave labor war crimes, as was the case with Arthur Rudolph, Middlework Operations Director. For Rudolph, it was best to say as little as possible. He described his time at Garmisch-Partenkirchen as enjoyable because it meant that the horrible days of fleeing were over. Years later, he described his weeks of internment in the Alps as ones where he could finally enjoy a few days of relief, but this relief was short-lived owing to his restless intellect. Rudolf demanded more of himself than a suntan, he later said. There were already rumors that the Americans would take us to the USA, 
so I decided I needed to learn English. Arthur Rudolph's interrogator saw Rudolph differently than he saw himself. In military intelligence documents, Rudolph was described as 100% Nazi, a dangerous type. There was a decision to be made whether to use Rudolph as an intelligence source or to intern him for denazification and investigation into possible war crimes. Denazification was an allied strategy to democratize and demilitarize post-war Germany and Austria through tribunals in local civilian courts, Spruchkammern, that were set up to determine individual defendants' standings. Each German who was tried was judged to belong in one of five categories or classes. One, major offenders. Two, party activists, militarists, and profiteers. Three, individuals who were less incriminated. Four, Nazi party followers. Five, those who were exonerated. Rudolph's interrogator did not believe a committed Nazi like Arthur Rudolph would make a viable intelligence source, and he wrote, suggest internment. Rudolph hoped he would be hired by the Americans. He located a murder mystery in the Garmisch-Partenkirchen Library, the Green Archer, and attempted to learn English for what he believed, correctly, would be a new job. Back in Nordhausen, Major Staver was making headway. Working on the new tip from Dr. Robertson, Staver drove to meet with his new source, Carl Otto Fleischer, in the parking lot. This time, Staver had Walter Riedel with him. In the parking lot, Staver demonstratively pulled a notebook from his breast pocket, just as Dr. Robertson had done with him. Staver read aloud a narrative he'd composed, part truth, part fiction. Von Braun, Ernst Steinhoff, and all the others who fled to the South have been interned at Garmisch, Major Staver told his two prisoners. Our intelligence officers have talked to von Plutz, General Dornberger, General Rossmann, and General Kamler, Staver said, also partially true. They told us that many of your drawings and important documents were buried underground in a mine somewhere around here, and that Riedel or you, Fleischer, could help us find them, Staver said, which was made up. Staver told the men that it was in their best interest to think over their next move very carefully. They could cooperate, he said, and give up the location of the V-2 documents. Or they could stonewall and risk being put in prison for withholding information. They had one night to consider the offer. Staver would meet the two men the following morning in the same parking lot at exactly 11 a.m. When Staver arrived at the rendezvous point the next day, he was disheartened to find Riedel waiting for him, but not Fleischer. Even odder, Riedel said he had a message from Fleischer to pass along. Fleischer was waiting for Major Staver in Heinroda, a nearby village, with some very important news. Staver needed to travel to Heinroda, find a boarding house called the Inn of the Three Lime Trees, and ask for the concierge. Was this some kind of a trap or just another wild goose chase? Staver and Walter Riedel drove together to the Inn of the Three Lime Trees. There they met up with the innkeeper, who produced a message from Fleischer. Staver and Riedel were to walk through town, pass down a long alleyway, and head to the edge of the village, where they were to go to the home of a local priest. Staver and Riedel followed the trail, finally arriving at the priest's house. There, in flawless English, the priest told Major Staver that Fleischer would see him soon. Fleischer emerged at the top of the stairs, came down, and asked Staver to follow him outside so the two men could talk privately under an apple tree. There, in almost inaudible, somewhat apologetic tones, Fleischer admitted he had not been completely frank about the whereabouts of the V-2 document stash, Staver explained. In fact, he knew where they were hidden and believed he was the only one in Nordhausen who did. But there was a problem, Fleischer said. He described to Staver how the caretaker at the mine had dynamited a wall of rubble over the entrance so no one could find them. This man was an ardent Nazi and would never turn over the documents to an American officer like Major Staver. 
Fleischer said he'd take Dr. Race with him to do the job. As unreliable as he was, Staver decided to take Fleischer at his word. He gave him passes that allowed for travel around Nordhausen, as well as enough gasoline to get back and forth between Nordhausen and the mine. Fleischer and Race succeeded in getting the mine's caretaker, Herr Neblung, to cooperate. Local miners were paid by Fleischer using money from the U.S. Army to excavate through the rubble and retrieve the documents hidden in the mine. The stash was enormous, the crates weighing more than 14 tons. Only now there was a new hurdle to overcome. British soldiers were set to arrive in Nordhausen on May 27th to oversee the transition to Red Army rule. This meant that Major Staver had to get the documents out fast. The original agreement between the British and the Americans was that the two allies would share with one another everything they learned about the V-weapons. If the British found out Staver was planning to secretly ship 100 V-2 rockets back to the United States, they would likely consider it a double-cross. Major Staver needed to get to Paris. It was the only way he could obtain access to the 10-ton trucks necessary for moving such a large cache in such a short period of time. Staver assigned a colleague to oversee the Dorton Mine operation, while he attempted to hitch a ride to Paris in a P-47 Thunderbolt. The pilot said it was impossible, that the Thunderbolt was a single-seat fighter. Staver said that his mission was urgent and offered to ride in the tiny space behind the pilot's seat. The pilot finally agreed. Avoiding terrible weather higher up, the men flew all the way to Paris at treetop level and arrived safely at Orly Field. Staver found a ride down the Champs-Élysées in a U.S. Army jeep. At Ordnance Headquarters, he found the exact man he was looking for, Colonel Joel Holmes, sitting at his desk. As chief of the technical division, Colonel Holmes had the authority to grant Major Staver the semi-trailers he needed to evacuate the Dorton mine stash before the British and the Russians arrived. But Staver had a second plan that he had been conceiving, and, as he later explained, this moment in Paris was his prime opportunity to act. He told Colonel Holmes that there was a third element necessary to make the V-2 rocket program in America a success. Staver had been locating rocket parts and the documents necessary to assemble them correctly. But to make the rockets fly, the Americans needed the German scientists. The Army needed to bring these scientists to the United States, Staver explained. Their superior knowledge could be used to help win the war in Japan. You write the cable and I'll sign it, Staver remembered Colonel Holmes having said. In Paris, Staver sat down and wrote a cable that would have a huge impact on the future of the Nazi scientist program. Have in custody over 400 top research development personnel of Pinamunde, developed V2, Staver wrote. The thinking of the scientific directors of this group is 25 years ahead of U.S. Later version of this rocket should permit launching from Europe to U.S. Given the enormity of this idea in 1945, that a rocket could one day actually fly from one continent to another, Staver pushed. Immediate action recommended to prevent loss of whole or part of this group to other interested parties. Urgently request reply as early as possible. The cable was sent to Colonel Trichel's office at the Pentagon, and Major Staver returned to Nordhausen. The documents were loaded up and driven to Paris under armed guard. From there, they were shipped to the Foreign Documents Evaluation Center at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. Special Mission V-2 was declared a success. The U.S. Army Ordnance Rocket Branch now had 100 rockets and 14 tons of technical documents in its possession. But Staver did not view Special Mission V-2 as entirely complete. He still had his sights set on the rocket scientists themselves. With the arrival of the Soviets into Nordhausen less than 48 hours away, Staver got the approval he'd been waiting for from Schaaf headquarters. He went to Garmisch Partenkirchen, picked up von Braun, and returned to Nordhausen. The clock was ticking. 
Staver needed Von Braun's help getting every last rocket scientist out of the Harz before the Soviets arrived. We landed running, remembered Staver's team member, Dr. Richard Porter. Back in Nordhausen, the men got to work locating the scientists who were still living in the area. Staver had a stack of note cards with the names and addresses of the V-2 engineers. He instructed every available U.S. soldier he could find to round up anything with wheels, trucks, motorcycles, and donkey carts, and sent soldiers fanning out across the Harz. Scientists and their families were given an offer. They could be transported out of what would soon become the Russian zone, or they could stay. Arthur Rudolph's wife was in Stepferhausen, 85 miles south of Nordhausen, when a U.S. soldier arrived. A black G.I. drove into town in a truck looking for me, remembered Martha Rudolph. He had a list of names and mine was on it. He told me that if I wanted to leave to get ready, he would be back in 30 minutes to pick me up. My friends all said, go, go, the Russians are coming, why would you want to stay here? So I packed up what I could and left on the truck when the G.I. came back. The Rudolph's daughter, Marianne, accompanied her to the train station. The scene at the station was surreal, recalling the horrific transport of prisoners during the war, but with the roles reversed, fate and outcome turned upside down. Over 1,000 Germans, scientists, and their families stood on the platforms waiting to fit themselves into boxcars and passenger cars. The train's engine had yet to be attached, and there was no announcement explaining the delay. Tension escalated, but the crowd remained calm until a mob of displaced persons flooded the station. Word had leaked out that German scientists were being evacuated out of Nordhausen in advance of the Red Army's arrival. Suddenly, many other locals wanted out of the Harz, too. The Red Army had a terrible reputation. There were stories of entire units arriving in towns drunk and seeking revenge. At the railroad station, U.S. soldiers were called to the scene. Using the threat of weapons, they prevented any displaced person who was not a scientist or an engineer from boarding the boxcars and passenger cars. At the eleventh hour, Major Staver and Dr. Porter learned of one last potential disaster that needed to be dealt with. Right before boarding the train, General Dornberger confessed to having hidden his own stash of papers, an ace in the hole had Dornberger been double-crossed by Von Braun and left out of the American deal. General Dornberger told Major Staver that he had buried five large boxes in a field in the spa town of Badzacher. The boxes, which were made of wood and lined in metal, contained critical information about the V-2 rocket that would compromise the U.S. Army if it fell into Russian hands. In a last-ditch effort to find Dornberger's secret stash, Staver and Porter set out on a final mission. The men drove 60 miles to the headquarters of the 332nd Engineering Regiment at Kossel, where they borrowed shovels, pickaxes, three men, and a mine detector. Back in a large field in Badzakar, they searched the ground as if looking for a buried mine. Finally, they located Dornberger's metal-lined cases, which contained 250 pounds of drawings and documents. The stash was loaded onto a truck and driven to an army facility in the American zone. On their way out of the Harz, Staver and Porter passed by Nordhausen to have one last look. I wanted to blow up the whole factory at Nordhausen before we pulled out, but I couldn't swing it legally. I was afraid at the time to do the job unofficially and have regretted it ever since, Porter recalled. He was referring to the European Advisory Commission decree signed by General Eisenhower on June 5, 1945, in Berlin, which prohibited the destruction of military research installations in another power's zone. The Soviets were now heirs to the Harz. Major Staver had succeeded in secretly shipping out enough parts to reassemble 100 V-2 rockets in America. Still, thousands of tons of rocket parts remained. For all the effort and moral compromise that went into Special Project V-2, the Red Army would now have no shortage of Wonder Weapons parts to choose from. 
the underground slave labor factory at Nordhausen was still virtually intact. Thousands of machine tools sat on the assembly lines, ready to manufacture more parts. After an eleven-day delay, the Russians finally arrived. Leading the pack were technical specialists from Soviet missile program chief Yurge Malenkov's special committee for rocket research. For every German scientist that had taken up the U.S. Army's offer to evacuate, between two and ten remained behind. The Soviet secret police began rounding up hundreds of former rocket scientists and engineers and put them back to work. A Soviet guidance engineer named Boris Chertok even managed to move into von Braun's old villa, the one the SS had confiscated from a Jewish businessman a few years before. Chertok oversaw the renaming of the Nordhausen Tunnel Complex from the Middlework to the Institute Rab, an abbreviation for Rocket Antrieb Bleischerode or Rocket Enterprise Bleischerode. Von Braun, eighty scientists, and their families were taken to the town of Witzenhausen, forty miles from Nordhausen in the American zone. There, they were set up in a two-story schoolhouse and paid to get to work on future rocket plans. While Army Ordnance worked on a plan to bring them to the United States, to the Fort Bliss Army base in Texas, the Americans had been obsessed with the V weapons during the war. Now they had the science and the scientists. In Washington D.C., officials with the War Department General Staff remained undecided on a policy regarding what to do with Nazi scientists. General Eisenhower's questions about long-term plans had not yet been answered, and Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson was asked to weigh in. Major Staver's cable from Paris. Regarding the 400 rocket scientists in custody, drew attention to the issue. In America, five Nazi scientists had already been secreted into the United States for classified weapons work. Just a few days after the German surrender, the director of naval intelligence successfully lobbied the War Department General Staff to circumvent State Department regulations, so that a Nazi guided missile expert named Dr. Herbert Wagner. And four of his assistants could begin working on technology meant to help end the war with Japan. The War Department gave approval, and in mid-May, Dr. Wagner and his team were flown from Germany to a small airstrip outside Washington D.C. inside a military aircraft with the windows blackened to keep anyone from seeing who was inside. During the war, Dr. Herbert Wagner had been chief missile design engineer at Henschel Aircraft. He was the man behind the first guided missile used in combat by the Reich, the HS-293. This remote control bomb was the nemesis of the U.S. Navy and the British Royal Navy, and had sunk several Allied ships during the war. Not only did the U.S. Navy see glide bomb technology as critically important in the fight in the Pacific, but they saw Dr. Wagner as a man. With knowledge, experience, and skills unmatched anywhere in the world, the perceived importance of having Wagner's expertise in the fight against Japan was illuminated by a dramatic event unfolding in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, just as he and his team arrived. On May 15, 1945, a Nazi submarine, identified in a New York Times headline as the Japan-bound U-234. Surrendered itself to the USS Sutton in the waters 500 miles off Cape Race, Newfoundland. Inside the submarine, which was en route to Japan, was a cache of Nazi wonder weapons, said to contain what few aviation secrets may be left, as well as other war weapon plans and pieces of equipment. One of the wonder weapons on board was Dr. Wagner's HS-293 glider bomb. Meant for use against the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. Additionally, there were drawings and plans for the V-1 flying bomb and the V-2 rocket, experimental equipment for stealth technology on submarines, an entire Me-262 fighter aircraft, and ten lead-lined canisters containing 1,200 pounds of uranium oxide, a basic material used in making an atomic bomb.
The specifics of the weapons cache were not made public, but the notion that the Nazis had sold the secrets of some of their most prized wonder weapons to their Axis partner Japan was alarming. The scenario was made even more foreboding by the fact that also on board the U-234 was a top Reich scientist whose job it was to teach Japanese scientists how to copy and manufacture these Nazi wonder weapons for themselves. The scientist in the submarine was Dr. Heinz Schlicke, director of naval test fields at Kiel. To the public, he was only identified as a German technician. In fact. Dr. Schlicke was one of the most qualified Nazi scientists in the field of electronic warfare. His areas of expertise included radio location techniques, camouflage, jamming and counterjamming, remote control, and infrared. The Navy took Dr. Schlicke prisoner of war and brought him to the Army Intelligence Center at Fort Meade in Maryland. As for Dr. Wagner. The Navy felt it needed to keep him happy, so that his work would continue to bear scientific fruit. To soften the reality of his being a prisoner, his incarceration was called voluntary detention. Wagner and his assistants required a classified but comfortable place to work. The Navy noted in an intelligence report, ideally in an ivory tower or a gilded cage, where life would be pleasant, the guards courteous, the locks thick, but not too obvious. The Navy found what it was looking for in Hempstead House, a great stone castle on Sands Point on the north shore of Long Island, that was formerly the home of Daniel and Florence Guggenheim. The 160-acre estate had been donated by the Guggenheims to the Navy for use as a training center. With its three stories, 40 rooms, and sweeping view of the sea, the Navy decided it was an ideal location. Hempstead House was given the code name the Special Devices Center, and Dr. Wagner and his assistants got to work. There were more problems afloat in Washington, this time coming from the FBI. If Nazi scientists were going to work for the U.S. military, the Department of Justice said it needed to perform background checks. J. Edgar Hoover's FBI looked into Dr. Wagner's past, based on information collected by Army intelligence in Europe. And learned that Dr. Wagner had once belonged to the German SS, the paramilitary wing of the Nazi Party run by Himmler. This meant that Wagner was an ardent Nazi. If he had stayed in Germany as a former SS member and per the laws of the occupying forces, he would have been arrested and subject to a denazification trial. But the FBI was made aware of how badly the Navy needed Wagner, and they labeled him. An opportunist who is interested only in science. The FBI's bigger concern, read an intelligence report, was how much Dr. Wagner had been drinking lately. The FBI did not consider Wagner to be a drunkard, but blamed his near nightly intoxication on the recent death of his wife. The scientist in the submarine, Dr. Heinz Schlicke, became a prisoner at Fort Meade. Where it did not take long for the U.S. Navy to learn how eminently qualified he was. Soon, Schlicke was giving classified lectures on technology he had developed during the war. The first was called a general review of measures planned by the German Admiralty in the electronic field in order to revive U-boat warfare. The Navy wanted to hire Schlicke immediately, but State Department regulations got in the way. Schlicke was already in military custody in the United States as a prisoner of war. He would have to be repatriated back to Germany before he could be given a contract to work in the United States, according to the State Department. The saga of the U-234 and its passenger made one thing clear: if the War Department was going to start hiring German scientists on a regular basis. It needed to create a committee to deal with the intricacies of each specific case. Finally, on May 28, 1945, Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson weighed in on the classified subject of hiring Nazi scientists for U.S. military research. Patterson wrote to the Chief of Staff to the President, Admiral William D. Leahy. I strongly favor doing everything possible to utilize fully in the prosecution of the war against Japan, 
all information that can be obtained from Germany or any other source, Patterson wrote. He also expressed concern. These men are enemies, and it must be assumed they are capable of sabotaging our war effort. Bringing them to this country raises delicate questions, including the strong resentment of the American public, who might misunderstand the purpose of bringing them here and the treatment accorded them. Patterson believed that the way to avoid foreseeable problems with the State Department, which handled visa approvals, was to involve the State Department in decision-making now. Until a new committee was formed to deal specifically with Nazi scientists, Patterson suggested that the State, War, Navy, Coordinating Committee, SWINK, be in charge. Patterson's letter to the President's Chief of Staff, which was not shared with President Truman, prompted a meeting at the Pentagon by the War Department General Staff. The group agreed on a temporary policy. Contracts would be given to a limited number of German scientists, provided they were not known or alleged war criminals. The scientists were to be placed in protective military custody in the United States, and they were to be returned to Germany as quickly as possible after their classified weapons work was complete. A cable was sent to General Eisenhower at Schaaf headquarters in Versailles, fulfilling his two-week-old request to be advised on longer-term policy. But what had been decided in Washington, D.C., had very little impact on the reality of what was going on in the European theater with scientists who had spent years serving Adolf Hitler. Chapter 7 Hitler's Doctors During the war, physicians with the U.S. Army Air Forces heard rumors about cutting-edge research being developed by the Reich's aviation doctors. The Luftwaffe was highly secretive about this research, and its aviation doctors did not regularly publish their work in medical journals. When they did, usually in a Nazi party-sponsored journal like Aviation Medicine, Luftfahrtsmedicine, the U.S. Army Air Forces would circumvent copyright law, translate the work into English, and republish it for their own flight surgeons to study. Areas in which the Nazis were known to be breaking new ground were air-sea rescue programs, high-altitude studies, and decompression sickness studies. In other words, Nazi doctors were supposedly leading the world's research in how pilots performed in extreme cold, extreme altitude, and at extreme speeds. At war's end, there were two American military officers who were particularly interested in capturing the secrets of Nazi-sponsored aviation research. They were Major General Malcolm Groh, Surgeon General of the U.S. Strategic Air Forces in Europe, and Lieutenant Colonel Harry Armstrong, Chief Surgeon of the 8th Air Force. Both men were physicians, flight surgeons, and aviation medicine pioneers. Before the war, Groh and Armstrong had co-founded the Aviation Medicine Laboratory at Wright Field, where together they initiated many of the major medical advances that had kept U.S. airmen alive during the air war. At Wright Field, Armstrong perfected a pilot-friendly oxygen mask and conducted groundbreaking studies in pilot physiology associated with high-altitude flight. Groh developed the original flyer's flak vest, a 22-pound armored jacket that could protect airmen against anti-aircraft fire. Now, with the war over, Groh and Armstrong saw unprecedented opportunity in seizing everything the Nazis had been working on in aviation research, so as to incorporate that knowledge into U.S. Army Air Force's understanding. According to an interview with Armstrong decades later, a plan was hatched during a meeting between himself and General Gros at the U.S. Strategic Air Forces in Europe headquarters in Saint-Germain, France. The two men knew that many of the Luftwaffe's medical research institutions had been located in Berlin, and the plan was for Colonel Armstrong to go there and track down as many Luftwaffe doctors as he could find, with the goal of enticing them to come to work for the U.S. Army Air Forces. As Surgeon General, Groh could see to it that Armstrong was placed in the U.S. occupied zone in Berlin as Chief Surgeon with the Army Air Forces contingent there. 
This would give Armstrong access to a city divided into U.S. and Russian zones. General Grow would return to Army Air Force's headquarters in Washington, D.C., where he would lobby superiors to authorize and pay for a new research laboratory exploiting what the Nazi doctors had been working on during the war. With the plan set in motion, Armstrong set out for Berlin. The search proved difficult at first. It appeared as if every Luftwaffe doctor had fled Berlin. Armstrong had a list of 115 individuals he hoped to find. At the top of that list was one of the Reich's most important aviation doctors, a German physiologist named Dr. Hubertus Strughold. Armstrong had a past personal connection with Dr. Strughold. The roots of that story go back to about 1934, Armstrong explained in a U.S. Air Force oral history interview after the war, when both men were attending the annual convention of the Aero Medical Association in Washington, D.C. The two men had much in common and became quite good friends. Both were pioneers in pilot physiology and had conducted groundbreaking high-altitude experiments on themselves. We had some common bonds in the sense that he and I were almost exactly the same age. He and I were both publishing a book on aviation medicine that particular year, and he held exactly the same assignment in Germany that I held in the United States, Armstrong explained. The two physicians met a second time in 1937 at an international medical conference at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. This was before the outbreak of war. Nazi Germany was not yet seen as an international pariah, and Dr. Strughold represented Germany at the conference. The two physicians had even more in common in 1937. Armstrong was director of the Aeromedical Research Laboratory at Wright Field, and Strughold was director of the Aviation Medical Research Institute of the Reich Air Ministry in Berlin. Their jobs were almost identical. Now, at war's end, the two men had not seen one another in eight years, but Strughold had maintained the same high-ranking position for the duration of the war. If anyone knew the secrets of Luftwaffe medical research, Dr. Hubertus Strughold did. In Berlin, Harry Armstrong became determined to find him. One of the first places Armstrong visited was Strughold's former office at the Aviation Medical Research Institute, located in the fancy Berlin suburb of Charlottenburg. He was looking for leads. But the once grand German Military Medical Academy, with its formerly manicured lawns and groomed parks, had been bombed and was abandoned. Strughold's office was empty. Armstrong continued his journey across Berlin, visiting universities that Strughold was known to be affiliated with. Every doctor or professor he interviewed gave a similar answer. They claimed to have no idea where Dr. Strughold and his large staff of Luftwaffe doctors had gone. At the University of Berlin, Armstrong finally caught a break when he came across a respiratory specialist named Ulrich Luft, teaching a physiology class to a small group of students inside a wrecked classroom. Luft was unusual looking, with a shock of red hair. He was tall, polite, and spoke perfect English, which he had learned from his Scottish mother. Ulrich Luft told Harry Armstrong that the Russians had taken everything from his university laboratory, including the faucets and sinks, and that he, Luft, was earning money in a local clinic treating war refugees suffering from typhoid fever. Armstrong saw opportunity in Luft's predicament and confided in him, explaining that he was trying to locate German aviation doctors in order to hire them for U.S. Army-sponsored research. Armstrong said that in particular he was trying to find one man, Dr. Hubertus Strughold. Anyone who could help him would be paid. Dr. Luft told Armstrong that Strughold had been his former boss. According to Luft, Strughold had dismissed his entire staff at the Aviation Medical Research Institute in the last month of the war. Luft told Armstrong that Strughold and several of his closest colleagues had gone to the University of Göttingen.
They were still there now, working inside a research lab under British control. Armstrong thanked Luft and headed to Göttingen to find Strughold. Whatever the British were paying him, Armstrong figured he would be able to lure Strughold away because of their strong personal connection. There was also a great deal of money to be made pending the authorization of the new research laboratory. Armstrong and Groh's plan meant hiring more than 50 Luftwaffe doctors. There was a lot of work to be had, not just for Strughold, but for many of his colleagues as well. A great drama was now set in motion, owing to the fact that there was a second army officer also looking for Dr. Hubertus Strughold, a medical war crimes investigator and physician named Major Leopold Alexander. Dr. Strughold's name had been placed on an army intelligence list of suspected war criminals with the Central Registry of War Criminals and Security Suspects, or CROCAS. Major Alexander was on a mission to locate him. It is not known if Armstrong was aware of the allegations against Strughold and chose to ignore them, or if he was in the dark as to Strughold's having been placed on the CROCAS list. But as Armstrong forged ahead with plans to hire Dr. Strughold and to make him a partner in the U.S. Army Air Force's laboratory, he did so in direct violation of the policy that had just been set by the War Department. German scientists could be hired for U.S. military contract work, provided they were not known or alleged war criminals. The Krokas allegations against Dr. Strughold were serious. They included capital war crimes. The Krokas list came out of the immediate aftermath of the German surrender, when public pressure to prosecute Nazis accused of war crimes had reached fever pitch. On May 7, 1945, Life magazine published a story on the liberation of Buchenwald, Bergen-Belsen, and other death camps, complete with graphic photographs. This was some of the first documentary evidence presented to the public. When confronted by these ghastly images, people all over the world expressed their outrage at the scale of atrocity that had been committed by the Nazis. Death camps, slave labor camps, the systematic extermination of entire groups of people. This defied the rules of war. The idea of having a war crimes trial appealed to the general public as a means of holding individual Nazis accountable for the wickedness of their crimes. The group responsible for investigating war crimes was the United Nations War Crimes Commission, UNWCC, located in London and founded by the Allies in 1942. It was originally called the United Nations Commission for the Investigation of War Crimes. The War Crimes Commission was not responsible for hunting down the criminals. That job was delegated to Schaefe. The War Crimes Commission had three committees. Committee 1 dealt with lists. Committee 2 coordinated enforcement issues with Schaefe. And Committee 3 gave advice on legal points. The Commission and its committees worked in concert with Crocas, also located in Paris, which was responsible for gathering and maintaining information about suspected war criminals. After the fighting stopped, Schaefe sent war crimes investigators into the field to locate German doctors with the purpose of interrogating them. One of these investigators was Major Leopold Alexander, a Boston-based psychiatrist and neurologist and a physician with the U.S. Army. Dr. Alexander had been tending to wounded war veterans at a military hospital in England when he learned about his new assignment just two weeks after the end of the war. With this undertaking, his whole life would change, as would his understanding of what it meant to be a doctor and what it meant to be an American. Dr. Alexander would unwittingly become one of the most important figures in the Nuremberg doctors' trial, and he would inadvertently become a central player in one of the most dramatic events in the history of Operation Paperclip. That would take another seven years. For now, at war's end, Dr. Alexander accepted his orders from Schaefe, boarded a military transport airplane in England, and headed for Germany to begin war crimes investigative work. 
His first stop was the Dachau concentration camp. Dr. Alexander did not yet know that it was inside Dachau, in the secret barracks called Experimental Cell Block 5, that Luftwaffe doctors had conducted some of the most barbaric and criminal medical experiments of the war. On May 23, 1945, Dr. Alexander, 39, was seated inside an American military transport airplane flying into Munich when approximately 15 miles north of the airport, his plane circled low and he saw the liberated Dachau concentration camp for the first time. Surviving inmates were waving and cheering at the plane, and you could see that two American field hospitals were set up on the camp grounds, Alexander wrote in his journal late at night. American aircraft brought fresh corned beef, potato salad, and real coffee by the ton to the newly liberated prisoners, many of whom were still too weak to leave the camp. The airplanes also brought doctors and nurses with the American Red Cross and the U.S. Army Typhus Commission, and also, on occasion, a medical war crimes investigator like Dr. Alexander. The Dachau concentration camp was the first stop on a long list of Reich medical facilities and institutions that Dr. Alexander was scheduled to visit, locations where medical crimes were suspected of having taken place. With him, Dr. Alexander carried Schaeff instructions that granted him full powers to investigate everything of interest, and also gave him the authority to remove documents, equipment, or personnel as deemed necessary. Fate and circumstance had prepared him for the job. Like Samuel Goodsmith, the scientific director of Operation Alsace, Dr. Alexander had a unique background that qualified him to investigate German doctors and had also made things personal. A Jew, he had once been a rising star among Germany's medical elite. In 1933, Germany's race laws forbade the 28-year-old physician from practicing medicine any longer. Devastated, he left the country and wound up in America. Now, 13 years later, he was back on German soil. His former existence here seemed like a lifetime ago. From as far back as he could remember, Leopold Alexander longed to be a doctor, like his father, Gustav. One of the strongest unconscious motives for becoming a physician was the strong bond of identification with my father, he once said, explaining the pull toward medicine. Gustav Alexander was an ear, nose, and throat doctor in turn-of-the-century Vienna, a distinguished scholar who published more than 80 scientific papers before Leopold was born. His mother, Gisela, was the first woman awarded a Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Vienna, the oldest university in the German-speaking world. From a young age, Leopold led a charmed life. The Alexanders were sophisticated, wealthy professionals who lived in intellectual bohemian splendor in a huge house with live peacocks on the lawns. Sigmund Freud was a frequent guest, as was the composer Gustav Mahler. By the time Leopold was 15, he was allowed to accompany his father on weekend hospital rounds. The father-son bond grew deep. On weekends, they would walk through Vienna's parks or museums, always engaged in lively conversation about history, anthropology, and medicine, as Dr. Alexander later recalled. In 1929, Leopold Alexander graduated from the University of Vienna Medical School and became a doctor specializing in the evolution and pathology of the brain. For almost every aspiring physician in Europe at the time, the goal was to study medicine in Germany, and in 1932, Dr. Alexander was invited to enroll at the prestigious Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Brain Research in Berlin. There, he first rubbed elbows with Germany's leading medical doctors, including Karl Kleist, the distinguished professor of brain pathology who would become his mentor. Alexander focused his studies on brain disorders and began fieldwork on patients with schizophrenia. Life was full of promise. Tragedy struck in two cruel blows. 
In 1932, Gustav Alexander was killed by a former mental patient, murdered in cold blood on the streets of Vienna by a man who ten years earlier had been hospitalized and declared insane. The second tragedy occurred in January of 1933, when Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. National Socialism was on the rise. For every Jew in Germany, life was about to change inexorably. Fortune blessed Dr. Alexander. On January 20, 1933, just days before Hitler took power, the ambitious physician prepared to decamp to rural China to study mental illness. I have accepted an invitation to go for half a year to Beijing Union Medical College in Beijing, China, as an honorary lecturer in neurology and psychiatry, Dr. Alexander wrote to his professors at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, promising to return to Germany by October 1, 1933. It was a promise he was never to fulfill. Within two months of Hitler's taking power, the Nazis initiated a nationwide boycott of Jewish doctors, lawyers, and business professionals. This was followed in April 1933 by the Reich's Law for the Restoration of the Professional Civil Service. It was now illegal for non-Aryans to work as civil servants, a ban that included every university teaching position throughout Germany. In Frankfurt, where Dr. Alexander had lived, 69 Jewish professors were fired. The news of Germany's radical transformation reached Dr. Alexander in China. The Alexander family lawyer, Maximilian Friedmann, wrote him a letter warning against return. The prospects in Germany are most unfavorable, Friedmann said. An uncle, Robert Alexander, was even more candid about what was happening in Nazi Germany when he wrote to Dr. Alexander to say the nation had succumbed to the swastika. A Jewish colleague and friend, a neurologist named Arnold Mersbach, also penned a letter to Dr. Alexander in despair, telling him that all of their Jewish colleagues in Frankfurt had been dismissed from their university posts. Our very existences are falling apart, Mersbach wrote. We are all without hope. For months, Dr. Alexander lived in denial. He clung to the fantasy that Nazi laws would not apply to him, and he vowed to return once his fellowship ended. In China, Dr. Alexander was in charge of the neurological departments of several field hospitals, where he tended to soldiers with head injuries received on the battlefield. Ignoring the Nazi mandate that now barred Jews from working as doctors or professors, he wrote a letter to Professor Kleist, his mentor in Germany, saying how much he looked forward to returning home. Kleist wrote back to say that his return to Germany was totally impossible. You, as a Jew, since you have not served as a soldier in the First World War, cannot be state-employed. In closing, Kleist wrote, Have no false hopes. The letter may have saved Dr. Alexander's life. Untethered in China, Alexander was now a nomad, a man without a home to return to. With remarkable ambition and fortitude, he pressed on. As his father had done before him, he wrote and published scientific papers. His were on mental illness, which made him a viable candidate for a fellowship in America. Fortune again favored him when, in the fall of 1933, he learned that he had been awarded a position at a state mental hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts, 50 miles outside Boston. Dr. Alexander boarded an American steamship called President Jackson and set sail for America by way of Japan. Out at sea, a strange event occurred. It happened in the middle of the long journey, when his ship was more than a thousand miles from land. A series of violent storms struck, sending passengers inside for days, until finally the weather cleared. On the first clear day, Dr. Alexander ventured outside to play shuffleboard. Gazing out across the wide sea, he spotted an enormous single wave, traveling with great speed and force, bearing down on his tiny steamship. There was no escape from what he quickly recognized as a tidal wave. Before Dr. Alexander could run back inside the ship, the President Jackson was lifted up by this great wave. 
The ship traveled up the steep slope very slowly, further and further, until we finally reached the top, he wrote to his brother Theo. And then, with the ship balancing precariously at the top of the wave, he described the terrifying feeling that followed. Suddenly, there was nothing behind it, nothing but a steep descent. The ship began to freefall. Its nose plunged deep into the water. The impact was harsh. Water splashed to all sides. And things fell to this side and that, in the kitchen and common rooms. The ship regained its balance almost effortlessly and steamed on. The whole thing happened so unbelievably fast, Alexander wrote. When it was over, I said to myself, now I understand the meaning of the saying, the ocean opens up before you and swallows you whole. It did not take long for Dr. Alexander to thrive in America. He was a supremely hard worker. On average, he slept five hours a night. Working as a doctor at a New England mental institution was endlessly fascinating to him. He once told a reporter that what interested him most was determining what made men tick. Only a few months after his arrival in New England, he was promoted to a full-time position in the neuropsychiatric ward at Boston State Hospital. While performing hospital rounds in 1934, he met a social worker named Phyllis Harrington. They fell in love and married. By 1938, they had two children, a boy and a girl. A prolific writer, Dr. Alexander published 50 scientific papers. By the end of the decade, he'd been hired to teach at Harvard Medical School. He was a U.S. citizen now. Journalists wrote newspaper articles about the doctor from Vienna, citing his outstanding accomplishments in the field of mental illness. He had a new home. He'd been accepted as one of Boston's medical elite. In December 1941, America went to war. Dr. Alexander joined the fight and was sent to the 65th General Hospital in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then to an army hospital in England. For the duration of the war, Dr. Alexander helped wounded soldiers recover from shell shock. He also collected data on flight fatigue. After the Germans surrendered, he expected to be sent home. Instead, he received his unprecedented order from Schaeff. He was to go to Germany and investigate allegations of Nazi medical crimes. In doing so, he would come face to face with former professors, mentors, and fellow students. It was his job to figure out who might be guilty and who was not. Dr. Alexander's first trip to Dachau did not produce any significant leads, despite rumors that barbaric medical experiments had gone on there. On June 5, 1945, he traveled the 12 miles to Munich to visit the Luftwaffe's Institute for Aviation Medicine. This research facility was headed by a radiologist named Georg August Veltz, still working despite Germany's collapse. On paper, Veltz was a man of repute. He was gentle-looking, 56 years old, with a shock of white hair and a wrinkled, sun-tanned face. In their first interview, Veltz told Alexander he had worked as a military doctor his entire life, beginning as a balloon corps physician in World War I. Dr. Alexander had a Schaeff dossier on Veltz that revealed Veltz had joined the Nazi party in 1937, after which he had moved quickly up the Reich's medical chain of command. By 1941, he reported directly to the air marshal of the Luftwaffe, Erhard Milch who reported to Reichsmarshal Hermann Göring. By the war's end, there were only a few men with more medical authority on Luftwaffe issues than Georg August Veltz, one of them being Dr. Hubertus Strughold. In their first interview, Veltz told Dr. Alexander that it had been his job to conduct a variety of research on methods of saving Luftwaffe pilots' lives. Veltz cited what happened to Luftwaffe pilots in 1940 during the Battle of Britain. Many had been shot down over the English Channel by the British Royal Air Force and had bailed out of their crashing airplanes and initially survived. The fatalities, Veltz explained, often occurred hours later, usually from hypothermia. 
The bodies of many Luftwaffe pilots had been rescued from the icy waters of the Channel just minutes after they had frozen to death. The Luftwaffe wanted to know if, through medical research, doctors could learn how to unfreeze a man, to bring him back to life. Dr. Veltz told Dr. Alexander that he and his team of researchers had performed groundbreaking research in this area. Veltz declared that they had in fact made a startling and useful discovery. The results, said Veltz, were simply astounding. Dr. Alexander asked what kind of results. Veltz hesitated to provide details, but promised that the U.S. Army would be very interested in the knowledge he possessed. Veltz asked Dr. Alexander if a deal could be made. Veltz said that he was interested in securing a grant with the Rockefeller Foundation. Dr. Alexander explained that he had no authority with any private sector foundation, and that, before anything else, he needed Veltz to tell him about this so-called astounding discovery. Veltz said he and his team had solved an age-old riddle. Can a man who has frozen to death be brought back to life? The answer, Veltz confided, was yes. He had proof. He and his team had solved this medical conundrum through a radical rewarming technique they'd invented. Alexander asked Veltz to be more specific. Veltz said success was dependent upon precise body temperature and duration of rewarming in direct proportion to a man's weight. He was not at liberty to provide data just yet, but the method his team had developed was so effective that the Luftwaffe Air Sea Rescue Service had employed this very technique during the war. The experiments, said Veltz, had been conducted on large animals, cows, horses, and adult pigs. Dr. Alexander was in Germany to investigate Nazi medical war crimes. He got straight to the point and asked Veltz whether human beings had ever been used in these Luftwaffe experiments. Veltz explicitly stated that no such human experiments had been done by him and that he did not know of any such work having been done, Dr. Alexander wrote in his classified report. But the way in which Veltz responded made Dr. Alexander deeply suspicious of him. Dr. Alexander was in a conundrum. Should he have Veltz arrested, or was it best to try to learn more? I still felt it was wiser for the purposes of this investigation not to resort to coercive measures such as an arrest, Alexander explained. He asked Veltz to take him to the laboratory where these experiments on large animals were performed. Veltz claimed that because of heavy bomb damage in Munich, the Luftwaffe's test facilities for its rewarming techniques had been moved out to a dairy farm in the rural village of Weinstepfan. Alexander and Veltz drove there together in an army jeep. An inspection of the farm revealed a state-of-the-art, low-pressure chamber concealed in a barn. This, Veltz explained, was where Luftwaffe pilots learned performance limits under medical supervision. Also called a high-altitude chamber, the apparatus allowed aviation doctors to simulate the effects of high altitude on the body. But the rewarming facilities were nowhere to be seen. Where were they? Dr. Alexander asked. Veltz hesitated and then explained. They'd been moved, Veltz said, this time to an estate near Freising at a government-owned experimental agricultural station. Dr. Alexander insisted on seeing the Freising facility, and the two men got back into the army jeep and drove on. In Freising, Alexander was shown yet another impressive medical research facility, also hidden in a barn, complete with a library and x-ray facilities all meticulously preserved. But the laboratory was clearly designed to handle experiments on small animals, mice and guinea pigs, not larger animals like cows, horses, and adult pigs. There were records, drawings, and charts of the freezing experiments, all carefully preserved. But again, they chronicled experiments on small animals, mostly mice. Where had the large animal experiments taken place? 
Veltz took Alexander to the rear of the barn, behind a stable, and into a separate shed located far in the back of the property. There, Veltz pointed to two dirty wooden tubs, both cracked. It was an extraordinary moment, Dr. Alexander would later testify, horrifying in its clarity. Neither of the tubs could possibly fit a submerged cow, horse, or large pig. What these tubs could fit was a human being, Dr. Alexander said. The grim reality of Dr. Veltz's Luftwaffe research became painfully clear. I came away from all these interviews with the distinct conviction that experimental studies on human beings, either by members of this group themselves or by other workers well-known to and affiliated with the members of this group, had been performed but were being concealed, Dr. Alexander wrote. Without an admission of guilt, he had only suspicion. To make an arrest, he needed evidence. He thanked Dr. Veltz for his assistance and told him that he would be returning sometime in the future for a follow-up visit. Dr. Alexander had been on German soil for two weeks, and the deviance of Nazi science overwhelmed him. In a letter to his wife, Phyllis, he described what had become of German science under Nazi rule. German science presents a grim spectacle, he wrote, grim for many reasons. First, it became incompetent, and then it was drawn into the maelstrom of depravity of which this country reeks. The smell of the concentration camps, the smell of violent death, torture, and suffering. German doctors were not practicing science, Alexander said, but really depraved pseudo-scientific criminality. In addition to investigating crimes committed in the name of aviation medical research, Dr. Alexander was the lead investigator looking at crimes committed in the name of neuropsychiatry and neuropathology. In this capacity, he came face to face with the odious and core Nazi belief that had informed the practice of medicine under Hitler's rule. Not only were all people not created equal in the eyes of the Third Reich, but some people were actually not humans at all. According to Nazi ideology, Untermenschen, subhumans as they were called, a designation that included Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, Poles, Slavs, Russian prisoners of war, the handicapped, the mentally ill, and others, were no different from white mice or lab rabbits whose bodies could thereby be experimented on to advance the Reich's medical goals. The subhuman is a biological creature crafted by nature, according to Heinrich Himmler, which has hands, legs, eyes, and mouth, even the semblance of a brain. Nevertheless, this terrible creature is only a partial human being. Not all of those who appear human are, in fact, so. German citizens were asked to believe this pseudoscience. Millions did not protest. German scientists and physicians used this racial policy to justify torturous medical experiments resulting in maiming and death. In the case of the handicapped and the mentally ill, the Untermenschen theory was used by German doctors and technicians to justify genocide. As a war crimes investigator, Dr. Alexander was one of the first American servicemen to learn that the Reich had first sterilized and then euthanized nearly its entire population of mentally ill persons, including tens of thousands of children, under the law for the prevention of genetically diseased offspring. All across southern Germany, one German physician after the next admitted to Dr. Alexander his knowledge of the child euthanasia program. This included Dr. Alexander's own mentor and former professor, the neurologist Carl Kleist. During an interview in Frankfurt, Kleist confessed to Dr. Alexander that he had known of the policy of euthanasia, and he handed over military psychiatric reports that allowed him to circumvent personal responsibility and claim he was just following orders. Kleist was not arrested, but a few days later he was removed from his teaching job. The former teacher and student never spoke again, and it remains a mystery if Dr. Alexander requested that Kleist be fired.
Within a few years, Kleist's name would appear on a secret paperclip recruiting list. It is not known if he came to the United States. Each day brought atrocious new information. It sometimes seems as if the Nazis had taken special pains in making practically every nightmare come true, Dr. Alexander later told his wife, comparing Reich medicine to something out of a dark German fairy tale. Whereas doctors who knew about the euthanasia program tended to be forthcoming with information, the program was justified by a German law kept secret from the general public. It struck Dr. Alexander that criminal human experiments by Luftwaffe doctors, like the freezing experiments Veltz was involved in, appeared to have been more skillfully concealed. If Dr. Alexander wanted to learn the facts about what Luftwaffe doctors had been up to during the war, he knew that he had to understand the bigger picture. And he also had to determine where else the crimes might have taken place. The best way to do this was to interview the man nearest the top, Dr. Hubertus Strughold. Strughold had directed the Aviation Medical Research Institute for the Luftwaffe for ten of the twelve years of Nazi Party rule. When Dr. Alexander learned that Dr. Strughold was in Göttingen, in the British zone, he headed there. En route to Göttingen, Dr. Alexander had a fortuitous break. A curious coincidence played into my hands, he wrote. On my way to Göttingen, while having dinner in the officer's mess of the 433rd AABN, Army Battalion, in Camp Rennerald, Westerwald, I happened to meet another casual guest, an Army chaplain, Lieutenant Bigelow. In the course of our conversation, Lieutenant Bigelow told me he was quite eager to get my ideas about rather cruel experiments on human beings which had been performed at Dachau concentration camp. He had learned of them from a broadcast a few days earlier when ex-prisoners of Dachau had talked about these grim experiments over the Allied radio in Germany. This was exactly the kind of lead Dr. Alexander was looking for, and he asked Lieutenant Bigelow to share with him anything else he remembered from the radio report. Lieutenant Bigelow told Alexander that as a member of the clergy, he had ministered to many war victims. He had heard frightful stories about what had gone on in the medical blocks at the concentration camps, but nothing compared to what he had heard in that radio report. Doctors at Dachau had frozen people to death in tubs of ice-cold water to see if they could be unfrozen and brought back to life. These experiments were apparently meant to simulate conditions that Luftwaffe pilots went through after they'd been shot down over the English Channel, Bigelow said. Dr. Alexander now had a solid new lead. To his mind, the experiments Bigelow was referring to sounded strikingly similar to the animal experiments performed by Dr. Veltz and his group at the Freising Farm. Was the Luftwaffe involved in medical research at the concentration camps? Dr. Alexander asked the chaplain if he had caught any of the names of the doctors involved in the Dachau medical crimes. Bigelow said that he couldn't recall, but that he was certain he had heard that the Luftwaffe was involved. More determined than ever to investigate, Dr. Alexander continued on to Göttingen to interview Dr. Hubertus Strughold. At the Institute for Physiology in Göttingen, Dr. Alexander located Strughold and arranged to interview him, getting straight to the point. Dr. Alexander told Dr. Strughold about the radio report claiming that freezing experiments had been conducted by the Luftwaffe at Dachau. Did Strughold, as the physician in charge of aviation medical research for the Luftwaffe, know about these criminal experiments at Dachau? Dr. Strughold said that he had learned of the experiments at a medical symposium he attended in Nuremberg in October 1942. The conference, called Medical Problems of Sea Distress and Winter Distress, took place at the Hotel Deutscherhof, and involved 90 Luftwaffe doctors. During that conference, Strughold said, a man named Dr. Sigmund Rascher presented findings that had been obtained from experiments performed on prisoners at the Dachau concentration camp. This was the same man 
who had been mentioned over the Allied radio the other day, Strughold said. He called Rasher a fringe doctor, whose only assistant at Dachau was his wife, Nini. Both Rashers were now dead. Did Strughold approve of these experiments? Strughold told Dr. Alexander that even though Dr. Rasher used criminals in his experiments, he, Strughold, still disapproved of such experiments in non-consenting volunteers on principle. Dr. Strughold promised Dr. Alexander that within his institute in Berlin, he had always forbidden even the thought of such experiments, firstly on moral grounds and secondly on grounds of medical ethics. Alexander asked Strughold if he knew of any other Luftwaffe doctors who had been involved in human experiments at Dachau. Strughold said, Any experiments on humans that we have carried out were performed only on our own staff and on students interested in our subject on a strictly volunteer basis. He did not reveal that a number of doctors on his staff had visited Dachau regularly and worked on research experiments there. Also in Göttingen, Dr. Alexander interviewed several other doctors who had worked for Strughold, asking each of them specific questions about human experiments. Each doctor told a strikingly similar story. Dr. Sigmund Rascher was to blame for everything that went on at Dachau, and now Rascher was dead. But one man, a physiologist named Dr. Friedrich Hermann Rhein, let an important clue slip. Dr. Rasher had been an SS man, Rhein said. This information gave Dr. Alexander a significant new piece of the puzzle he did not have before, namely that the SS was also involved in the concentration camp freezing experiments. This was a revelation. The day after this disclosure, Dr. Alexander received further extraordinary related news. I learned that the entire contents of Himmler's secret cave in Halline, Germany, containing a vast amount of miscellaneous, specially secret SS records, had recently been discovered and taken to the Seventh Army Document Center in Heidelberg. This huge trove of papers had been discovered by soldiers hidden away in yet another cave. The papers had been stamped with the unmistakable logo of the SS, and they bore Himmler's personal annotations, drawn in the margins in the green pencil he liked to use. Dr. Alexander set out for the document center to see what he could glean from the files. These papers would turn out to be among the war's most incriminating discoveries in a single document find. In Heidelberg, Himmler's documents were being inventoried and sorted out when Dr. Alexander first arrived. One of the men tasked to the job was Hugh Iltis, the son of a Czech doctor, who, with his family, fled Europe in advance of the genocide. Iltis was a 19-year-old American soldier fighting on the front lines in France during the last months of the war when, he recalls, a car showed up and an officer leapt out and pointed at me, then shouted, You, come with me. Iltis climbed into the car and sped away from the battlefield with the officer. Someone had learned that Hugh Iltis was a fluent German speaker, and perhaps that his father was a leading geneticist and anti-Nazi. Iltis was needed in Paris to translate captured Nazi documents, and the work kept on coming. Now, six months later, here he was, in Heidelberg, documenting atrocities for the War Crimes Commission. His discovery of the Himmler papers, it was Iltis who identified how important they were, would also become the most important collection of documents on Nazi human experimentation to be presented at the doctor's trial. Alexander told Iltis what it was that he was looking for, documents written by Dr. Sigmund Rascher, that involved experiments on humans. Together, the two men broke the original seals on the innocuously named Case No. 707 Medical Experiments, papers that turned out to include years of correspondence between Rascher and Himmler. The idea to start the experiments with human beings in Dachau was obviously Dr. Rascher's, Alexander explained in his classified Scientific Intelligence Report. But as Alexander learned from the papers, 
Rasher was far from the only Luftwaffe doctor involved. Nor were the human experiments limited to freezing experiments. Even more damning, Dr. Alexander learned that one of Dr. Strogold's closest colleagues and his co-author, a physiologist named Dr. Siegfried Ruf, was in charge of overseeing Rasher's human experiments at Dachau. This was stunning news. Dr. Roof and his assistant, Dr. Ronberg, joined forces with Rasher and arrived in Dachau with a low-pressure chamber which they supplied, Alexander wrote in his report. This low-pressure chamber was used for a second set of deadly experiments involving high-altitude studies. Sitting inside the 7th Army Documentation Center reading the Himmler papers, Dr. Alexander realized that Dr. Strughold had lied to him when he said that the only Luftwaffe doctor involved in the Dachau experiments had been the fringe doctor, Rasher. In fact, Strughold's friend and colleague, Dr. Roof, was deeply implicated. Most disturbing to Alexander were a group of photographs showing what happened in the course of the experiments as healthy young men, classified by the Nazis as Untermenschen, were strapped into a harness inside the low-pressure chamber and subjected to explosive decompression. These photographs, astonishing in their sadism, were essentially before, during, and after pictures of murder in the name of medicine. Other photographs among the Himmler papers documented the freezing experiments as they were being conducted at Dachau. Rasher's experiments were by no means the solo act of one depraved man. There were photographs of yet another of Dr. Strughold's Luftwaffe colleagues, Dr. Ernst Holtzlerner, holding prisoners down in tubs of icy water while their body temperatures were recorded as they died. It is believed that Rasher's wife, Nini, took the photographs. In a classified SIAS report, Dr. Alexander expressed doubts about the veracity of Dr. Strughold's earlier testimony from their first interview in Göttingen. The Dachau experiments were joint endeavors by the Luftwaffe and the SS, and despite Strughold's denials, several aviation doctors on his staff, including individuals who reported directly to him, were named in the Himmler papers. Strughold at least must have been familiar with the parts played by his friend and co-worker, Ruf, Dr. Alexander wrote. In his report, he advised Schaaf that while he could not yet say if Dr. Strughold was directly involved in the death experiments, clearly Reich medical crimes were still being covered up by him. On June 20th, Alexander headed back to Munich to confront Dr. Veltz. Instead, he found a colleague of Dr. Veltz's, a Dr. Lutz, who broke down and confessed that he'd been aware of the human experiments, but that they'd been conducted by his team members, not him. Lutz claimed to have been offered the human job by Veltz, but declined to accept on grounds that he was too soft. Before confronting Strughold, Dr. Alexander first returned to Dachau to locate eyewitnesses. There, he found three former prisoners who offered testimony, John Baudwin, Oscar Hausermann, and Dr. Paul Husserach, who managed to stay alive at the concentration camp by working as orderlies for the SS. After Dachau was liberated, the three men chose to stay behind so as to help investigators piece together medical crimes. They formed a group, calling it the Committee for the Investigation of SS Medical Crimes. From them, Dr. Alexander learned that the experiments had been conducted on Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and Catholic priests in the secret, freestanding barracks called Experimental Cell Block 5. In general, the death of prisoners transferred to Block 5 was expected within two to three days, testified John Baudwin. The second witness, Dr. Husserach, a Czech scholar sent to Dachau for committing literary crimes, told Dr. Alexander that only a few experimental subjects survived the low-pressure experiments. Most were killed. All three men agreed that only one individual was known to have survived the experiments, a Polish priest named Leo Michalowski. 
Father Michalowski's testimony provided a critical missing link in the medical murder experiments and how they were so skillfully concealed. Luftwaffe reports used the words guinea pigs, large pigs, and adult pigs as code words for their human subjects. In one of Veltz's papers confiscated by Dr. Alexander, entitled Alcohol and Rewarming, Veltz wrote that shipwreck experiments have been simulated in large pigs. The pigs were placed in tubs of water with blocks of ice and given alcohol to see if a rewarming effect occurred. The results, wrote Veltz, showed that alcohol in pigs does not increase or accelerate the loss of warmth. In sworn testimony, Father Michalowski described what had been done to him at Dachau. I was taken to room number four on block five. I was dropped in the water in which ice blocks were floating. I was conscious for one hour, then given some rum. In Veltz's paper, the word large pig really meant Catholic priest. On June 22, Dr. Alexander returned to the Heidelberg Document Center to locate more information with the help of Hugh Iltis. Armed with new details and key words culled from survivor testimony, Dr. Alexander found what Dr. Rasher had called his experiment reports. These charts, Alexander noted, were a scientific chronicle of medical murder. Rasher had also had bigger plans. He was working with the SS to have the aviation medicine experiments relocated from Dachau to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is in every way more suitable for such a large serial experiment than Dachau because it is colder there and the greater extent of open country within the camp would make the experiments less conspicuous, Rasher wrote. Dr. Alexander also learned about a grotesque, motion picture of the record of the experiments that had been shown at a private screening at the Air Ministry at the behest of Himmler. The Luftwaffe doctor overseeing this event was yet another close colleague of Dr. Strogold's, a physiologist and government official named Dr. Theodore Benzinger. Dr. Alexander was unable to locate Benzinger, but noted the name in his report. He then returned to Göttingen to interview Strughold a second time to see if he could confirm that Strughold had been lying to him. In Göttingen, things had changed. Investigators working on scientific intelligence projects for the U.S. Army Air Forces, AAF, and the Royal Air Force, RAF, had interviewed many of the Luftwaffe doctors, including Dr. Strughold. Their conclusions were remarkably different from Dr. Alexander's. None of the RAF or AAF officers had traveled to the document center in Heidelberg to read the Himmler files. Instead, their reports were meant to serve and support Armstrong and Groh's secret new research lab. RAF Wing Commander R. H. Winfield wrote in his report, Strughold was the mainspring of German aviation medical research and had a large staff of colleagues, including Dr. Siegfried Ruf, all of whom appeared to have suffered tremendously from their isolation during the war years. Winfield, having no idea that Dr. Ruf had been the person in charge of overseeing Rasher's work at Dachau, stated that his interrogations of Ruf revealed very little information not already known to the Allies. Winfield saw Dr. Strughold as a patrician figure, considerably disturbed about the welfare of his staff who, unable to evacuate Berlin, were now threatened by the Russians. Representing the U.S. Army Air Forces was Colonel W.R. Lovelace, an expert in high-altitude escape and parachute studies. The following decade, Lovelace would become famous as the physician for NASA's Cold War-era Project Mercury astronauts. For his confidential PSYOS report, entitled Research in Aviation Medicine for the German Air Force, Lovelace interviewed Dr. Strughold and many of his colleagues, including the freezing expert Georg Veltz. Like Winfield, 
Lovelace was in the dark about the medical murder experiments going on inside the concentration camps. He saw Veltz's research as benign and dedicated five pages of his Sios report to praising his studies on rapid rewarming of the cooled animal. Lovelace was particularly impressed by the fact that Veltz had frozen a guinea pig to death and was still able to record a heartbeat after death. The heartbeat may continue for some time if the animal is left in the cold, Lovelace wrote in summation of Veltz's findings. Unlike Dr. Alexander, Colonel Lovelace was able to interview Strughold and Ruff's colleague, Dr. Theodore Benziger, the high-altitude specialist who ran the Reich's experimental station of the Air Force Research Center, Reiklin, located north of Berlin. This was the same Dr. Benzinger who had overseen for Himmler the film screening at the Reich Air Ministry in Berlin of Dachau prisoners being murdered in medical experiments. And while Dr. Alexander had this information, Colonel Lovelace had no idea. Lovelace was particularly interested in Benzinger's work involving high-altitude parachute escapes, for which Benzinger had gathered much data and produced studies in reversible and irreversible deaths. Benzinger told Lovelace that he performed his studies on rabbits. Finally, Lovelace interviewed Dr. Conrad Schaffer, a chemist and physiologist whose wartime efforts to render salt water drinkable made him famous in Luftwaffe circles. With high praise from RAF and AAF officers, Drs. Roof, Benzinger, and Schaffer were now each being considered for leading positions at the new research lab. It was the end of June 1945, and Dr. Alexander's allotted time in the field as a war crimes investigator had drawn to a close. He was ordered back to London, where he would type up seven classified PSYOS reports, totaling more than 1,500 pages. Two weeks after Alexander left Germany, the chief of the Division of Aviation Medicine for the Army Air Forces, Detlev Bronck, and an AAF expert on the psychological and physiological stresses of flying named Howard Burchell, arrived in Germany to evaluate progress on the new research laboratory envisioned by Armstrong and Grow. Bronck and Burchell interviewed many of the same doctors and determined that they were all good candidates for the AAF Center. Unlike Wing Commander Winfield and Colonel Lovelace, Bronck and Burchell had been made aware of some of the controversy surrounding Strughold and his Luftwaffe colleagues. In a joint report, they explained... No effort was made to assess the doctor's political and ethical viewpoints or their responsibility for war crimes. They also concluded Strughold was not always quite honest in presenting the true significance of the work which he supported. But Bronck and Burchell stated that it was their position that Army intelligence was better qualified to determine who was inadmissible for political reasons and who could be hired. As it turned out, military intelligence objected to hiring Dr. Benzinger and Dr. Roof on the grounds that both men had been hardcore Nazi ideologues. But in the following month, Army intelligence determined that the doctor's work at Heidelberg would be short-term, and both men were cleared for U.S. Army employment. A deal was made between the U.S. Army Air Forces and Dr. Strughold. He would serve with Armstrong as co-chairman of a top-secret research center that the AAF was quietly setting up at the former Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Heidelberg and to be called the Army Air Force's Aeromedical Center. No one outside a small group could know about this controversial project because, per JCS 1076, no foreign power was permitted to carry out military research of any kind in Germany, including in medicine. Dr. Strughold hand-picked 58 Luftwaffe doctors for the research program, including Dr. Siegfried Ruf, Dr. Theodore Benzinger, and Dr. Conrad Schaffer, the first Nazi doctors to be hired by the U.S. Army Air Forces. In Munich, 
Dr. Georg Veltz, was arrested and sent to an internment facility for processing. From there, he would be sent to the prison complex in Nuremberg to await trial. In less than two years, many of the Nazi doctors chosen by Dr. Strughold would quietly begin their secret journeys to the United States. Chapter 8 Black, White, and Gray In Washington, with policy now informally set, the debate over the Nazi scientist program became intense inside the State War Navy Coordinating Committee, SWINC. Like its successor organization, the National Security Council, SWINC acted as the president's principal forum for dealing with issues related to foreign policy and national security. The State Department was vocal in its opposition to the program. Exacerbating the situation for the State Department was a parallel issue it had recently become embroiled in. South American countries, Argentina and Uruguay in particular, were known to be giving safe haven to Nazi war criminals who had escaped from Germany at the end of the war. The State Department had been putting pressure on these countries to repatriate Nazis back to Europe to face war crimes charges. If it came out that the State Department was providing not only safe haven but employment opportunities for Nazi scientists in the United States, that would be cause for an international scandal. And while some generals and colonels in the War Department were decidedly for the Nazi science programs, others were fundamentally opposed to the idea. A secretly recorded conversation between two generals at the Pentagon summed up the conflict that the very idea of German scientists working for the U.S. military created. One of the ground rules for bringing them over is that it will be temporary and at the return of their exploitation they will be sent back to Germany, said one general, whose name was redacted. The second general agreed. I'm opposed and Pop Powers, a nickname for a Pentagon official, is opposed. The whole War Department is opposed, he said. To open our arms and bring in German technicians and treat them as honored guests was a very bad idea. The Department of Justice was not happy about the voluminous workload that background checks on former enemy aliens would require. The Department of Labor was concerned about laws governing alien labor, and the Department of Commerce was concerned about patent rights. In an attempt to ease the contention, Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson sent a memorandum to the War Department General Staff, stating that the person to mediate these issues was John J. McCloy, the Assistant Secretary of War and Chairman of SWINC. John J. McCloy would become an especially significant player in Operation Paperclip starting in 1949. But now, in the summer of 1945, he wore two hats related to the issue of Nazi scientists. On the one hand, Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson had put McCloy in charge of coordinating policy regarding Nazi scientists coming to the United States to work. On the other hand, Patterson's boss, Secretary of War Henry Stimson, had given McCloy the job of helping to develop the war crimes program. McCloy's position regarding the exploitation of Nazi science and scientists was clear. He believed that the program would help foster American military superiority while engendering economic prosperity. To McCloy, those ends justified any means. It was not that McCloy believed that the Nazis should go unpunished, at least not in the summer of 1945. For that, McCloy was a strong supporter of the International Military Tribunal, IMT, and the idea of a war crimes trial. But he was someone who saw these two categories as black and white. There were scientists, and there were war criminals. In McCloy's eyes, a war criminal was a Himmler, a Hess, a Goring, or a Bormann. Scientists, like industrialists, were the backbone of a healthy economy in this new, post-war world. In the summer of 1945, McCloy was regularly briefed on the capture and arrest of these war criminals as they were rounded up and taken to a top-secret interrogation facility in Luxembourg, codenamed Ashcan.
where they would be squeezed for information before facing judgment at Nuremberg. John Dollabaugh, an officer with Army Intelligence G2, the Collecting and Dissemination Division, spent a significant portion of the last eight months of the war watching and re-watching Triumph of the Will, the three-hour-long Nazi propaganda film by Hitler's favorite filmmaker, Lenny Riefenstahl. Every Thursday night, inside a screening room at Camp Ritchie, America's Military Intelligence Training Center, located 80 miles north of Washington in the Catoctin Mountains, the 26-year-old Dollabois used the film to teach German order of battle and Nazi party hierarchy to colonels, generals, and intelligence officers preparing to go off to war. The Triumph of the Will documentary was an ideal teaching tool and enabled Dollabois to point out to his students how individuals within the Nazi party hierarchy spoke and gestured, what insignia they wore, who was subordinate to whom. Between the hateful speeches and the endless parades, the fawning inner circle and the Nuremberg rallies, John Dollabois had become so familiar with Hitler's inner circle that he could almost recite their speeches himself. He enjoyed teaching, but like so many dedicated Americans of his generation, Dollabois wished to see action overseas. There was a tinge of envy as well. He stayed in touch with his former colleagues from Officer Candidate School, most of whom had been sent to Europe months ago. Many had already been promoted to captains and majors. As the war in Europe drew to a close, John Dollabois had accepted that he was, in all likelihood, not going to be sent overseas as part of an interrogation team, called an IPW team, to interview newly captured prisoners of war. Then, on Easter Sunday, April 1, 1945, he received orders to ship out with the next detachment. Steaming out of the New York Harbor only days later, he was standing on the deck of the Ile de France when someone handed him a telegram. He'd been promoted to first lieutenant. Things moved fast after he'd crossed the Atlantic. On April 13th, Dollabois' ship landed in West Scotland. Every vessel in the harbor was at half-mast. President Roosevelt had died the day before. A quick train trip to London bore witness to appalling devastation. Piles of rubble filled both sides of every street. Dollabois' channel crossing took place under a full moon, and he was grateful to arrive in the war-torn port of Le Havre, France, without incident. Up until then, our move from Camp Ritchie to Le Havre had been well orchestrated, explains Dollabois. Now chaos set in. Driving into Munich, destroyed vehicles and weaponry littered the road. In the clearings in the woods sat small fleets of wrecked Luftwaffe airplanes, their wings torn off and their fuselages pockmarked with holes. Corpses rotted in ditches. Suddenly the war was very real, Dollabois recalls. His first assignment was at the Dachau concentration camp, just two days after its liberation. Dollabois had been sent to Dachau to look over groups of captured German soldiers to see if important generals, party officials, or scientists were hiding out among the crowd. Primarily, I was to watch for high-ranking Nazis in disguise, remembers Dollabois. We had reports that many of them were passing themselves off as ordinary German soldiers, thus hoping to be overlooked in the confusion and to disappear. His job was to intuit the meaning of certain manners of walk, greeting, and speech. Dollabois was on the lookout for anyone who might be useful to the Allies for a more detailed interrogation at a facility elsewhere. At Dachau, John Dollabois scoured faces in the crowd for telltale marks, things that could not be hidden. The most obvious among them were the dueling scars of the Nazi elite. But at Camp Ritchie, Dollabaugh had also become an expert in signs of concealment. Recently shaved facial hair or patches pulled off uniforms were indicators that a man had something to hide. True expertise, Dollabaugh knew, lay in recognizing nuance. After a few days at Dachau, Dollabaugh received another assignment. 
he proceeded to Central Continental Prisoner of War Enclosure No. 32, or CCPWE No. 32. The mission he was now on was classified top secret. Everyone he asked about CCPWE No. 32 said they'd never heard of it before. When Dolabois' driver left the borders of Germany and began heading into Luxembourg, Dolabois became overwhelmed with memories. Luxembourg, of all places, how capricious to be on assignment here. John Dolabois was born in Luxembourg. He had moved to America when he was a 12-year-old boy with his father. His mother had died in the great influenza pandemic. Driving into Luxembourg in 1945, Dolabois was seeing his native country for the first time in 14 years. As his army jeep made its way into a little spa town called Mondorf les bains images of his youth flooded his mind. He recalled Mondorf's beautiful park, a quiet stream on which one could row a boat, lots of old trees and acres of flowers. Mondorf was built a few miles from the Moselle River, in antiquity developed by the Romans as a health resort. It was known for its restorative qualities, its mineral baths, and fresh air. How different it all looked now, another small city devastated by war. Most homes and shops had been plundered or destroyed. Driving along the main boulevard, Dolabois observed how the facades of many houses had been blown off. He could see people carrying on with their lives inside of what was left of their homes. Only when his jeep pulled up to its destination did Dolabois realize that he'd arrived at the Palace Hotel. It was unrecognizable to him. A 15-foot high fence ran around the main building, on top of which was a double-stringed curl of barbed wire. There was a second fence that appeared to be electrified. Camouflage netting hung from panels of fencing. Wide canvas sheets had been strung from tree to tree. Huge Klieg lights illuminated the place. There were four guard towers, each manned by American soldiers holding powerful machine guns. Not even in photographs had John Dolabois seen an Allied prison facility in the European war theater as heavily fortified as this place was. At the front gate there was a jeep parked and with its engine turned off. A stern-faced sergeant sat inside. His name tag read, Sergeant of the Guard Robert Block. Block addressed Dolabois with a nod. Good afternoon, Sergeant, Dolabois said. I'm reporting for duty here. Block just stared at him. Dolabois recalled asking what kind of place this was, what was going on inside. Block said he had not been inside. There was a long, uncomfortable pause. Finally, Block spoke. To get in here, you need a pass signed by God. He nodded at the prisoner of war facility behind him. And have somebody verify the signature. Dolabois handed over his papers. After Block looked at them, the gate swung open and Dolabois was waved inside. In spite of its fortifications, the Palace Hotel remained surprisingly unscathed by war. The boomerang-shaped building was five stories tall. The fountain at the front entrance lacked water, its stone-carved nymph rising up from an empty pool. Inside the hotel foyer, Dolabois was greeted by two guards. A third soldier handed him a key and pointed up a flight of stairs. He told Dolabois to leave his things in room 30 on the second floor. I climbed up the stairs, located room 30, and let myself in with the key he had given me. It was an ordinary hotel room, remembers Dolabois, with rather noisy wallpaper. Inside, the fancy light fixtures and plush furniture of a grand hotel had been replaced by a folding table, two chairs, and an army cot. Dolabois unpacked his duffel bag. There was a knock on the door. Ashcan may have been heavily fortified on the exterior, but inside the facility, the prisoners were free to roam around. Dolabois opened the door and stood face to face with a large man dressed in a ratty, pearl-gray uniform with gold braids on the collars and gold insignia on the shoulder pads. He held a pair of trousers draped over one arm. Clicking his heels, he nodded and introduced himself as if he were at a party, not in a prison. The man opened his mouth and barked, Goring, Reichsmarshal. 
So this was Hermann Göring. Dalibois recognized him immediately from so many screenings of Triumph of the Will. Here was the man in flesh and blood. Göring was arguably the most notorious of Hitler's inner circle still alive. Former commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, director of the four-year plan. Hitler's long-acknowledged successor until the perceived betrayal at the very end. It was Hermann Göring who ordered security police chief Reinhard Heydrich to organize and coordinate plans for a solution to the Jewish question. At once I understood my assignment, recalled Dalibois. He was here in Luxembourg to interrogate the highest-ranking war criminals in the Nazi party. This was not a Nazi propaganda film. The individuals who had so populated his mind and his teaching at Camp Ritchie for the past eight months were right here, and they were all prisoners now. Goring stood before Dalibois, panting. Goring said he had been unfairly tricked by his captors. He had been told he was going to a palatial spa, Dalibois explained. When Goring arrived at Ashcan with his valet, Robert Krupp, he was expecting a vacation. He brought along eleven suitcases and twenty thousand paracodine pills, and had made sure his toenails and fingernails had been varnished to a bright red shine for his stay. That the spa at Mondorf had lost its chandeliers and been turned into a maximum security prison complex was not what Goring had in mind. His mattress was made of straw, Goring barked at Dalibois. He didn't have a pillow. A man of his rank deserved more. Dalibois looked at Goring, made a mental note. Are you by chance a welfare officer who will see to it that we are treated correctly according to the Articles of War? Goring asked Dalibois. In this question, Dalibois saw opportunity as an interrogator. Yes, he said, he would be working along those lines. Goring was pleased. He made a great show again of heel-clicking, bowing, and taking his 280 pounds out of my room. Goring returned to his fellow prisoners. He told the other Nazis about the new officer's arrival and his responsibilities to see better treatment for all of them. Suddenly, everyone wanted to speak with First Lieutenant John Dalibois. CCP WE No. 32 was filled with Nazi Bonzen, the big wheels, as Dalibois and the other interrogators called them. Hans Frank, the Jew butcher of Krakow, arrived at Ashcan on a stretcher, in silk pajamas drenched in blood. He had tried to kill himself by slashing his own throat. Frank was captured with his 38-volume diary, written during the war, a damning confession of many crimes he was guilty of. Dark-eyed and balding, noted Ashcan's commandant, Colonel Burton Andrus. Frank had pale, hairy hands. Other prisoners included members of the former German general staff, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, chief of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, OKW, or Armed Forces High Command, General Alfred Jodl, Keitel's chief of operations, Grand Admiral Karl Dunitz, commander of submarines and commander-in-chief of the German Navy. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, former chief of Armed Forces Italy and later Supreme Commander West. Joachim von Ribbentrop, foreign minister. And Albert Speer, minister of armaments and war production. These were the men who personally helped Hitler plan and execute World War II and the Holocaust those who hadn't escaped, perished, or committed suicide. In a second circle, or clique, there were the real Nazi gangsters, Dalibois explained, the old fighters who had been with Hitler at the beginning of his rise to power. Among this group were Robert Ley, labor front leader, Julius Stryker, editor of the anti-Semitic newspaper and propaganda tool Der Sturme, Alfred Rosenberg, Nazi philosopher, Arthur Zeiss in Quart, the man who betrayed Austria and became Reich's Commissar of Holland, and Wilhelm Frick, former Minister of the Interior and Reich's Protector of Bohemia, Moravia. 
Stripped of their power, small details spoke volumes to Dolabois. Goring was terrified of thunderstorms. Keitel was obsessed with sunbathing and staring at his reflection in Ashcan's only mirror in its entrance hall. Robert Lay was repeatedly reprimanded for masturbating in the bathtub. Joachim von Ribbentrop, named by the Nazi Ministry of Propaganda as the best-dressed man in Germany for nine consecutive years, was a lazy slob. Day in and day out, John Dolabois interviewed them. Almost all the men at Ashcan were eager to talk, Dolabois recalls. They felt neglected if they hadn't been interrogated by someone for several days. Their favorite pastime was casting blame. The greatest challenge for Dolabois and his fellow interrogators was determining, or trying to determine, who was lying and who was telling the truth. Cross-examination, playing one prisoner off the other, according to Dolabois, was a tactic that worked best. Often I was taken into their confidence when they needed a shoulder to cry on, Dolabois explains. At Mondorf, they still couldn't believe they would be tried for their crimes. Chapter 9 Hitler's Chemists At war's end, the staff of the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service had their sights set on bringing Hitler's chemists to the United States. The service saw unbridled potential in making the Nazis' nerve agent program its own and was willing to go to great lengths to obtain its secrets. Less than one month after British tanks rolled into the robber's lair and found the enormous cache of tabin-filled bombs in the forests of Munster Nord, the Chemical Warfare Service had obtained a sample of the nerve agent and was analyzing its properties in its development laboratory in the United States. Work began on May 15, 1945, and took two weeks to complete. The analysis revealed that Tabin was a revolutionary killer that could decimate enemy armies. General William N. Porter, chief of the Chemical Warfare Service, requested that five 260-kilogram Tabin-filled bombs be shipped from the robber's lair to the United States by air under highest priority for field tests. Separately, General Porter asked the U.S. Army Air Forces and U.S. Army Ordnance to conduct their own feasibility studies to determine if Tabin bombs could be used in combat by U.S. troops. Most people looked upon chemical warfare as abhorrent. In a June 1943 speech, President Roosevelt himself had said that using chemicals to kill people was immoral and inhumane. The president had denied Chemical Warfare Service officials their request to change the service's name to the Chemical Corps because of the permanence the name change suggested. And yet here was the interesting news for the Chemical Service. When German nerve gas entered into the world of chemical warfare, it brought with it the assurance of a U.S. chemical warfare program in peacetime. According to chemical weapons expert Jonathan B. Tucker, in 1945, in the aftermath of World War II, the U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Service decided to focus its research and development efforts on the German nerve agents, the technological challenges of which promised to ensure the organization's survival through the period of post-war demobilization and declining military budgets. Within several months of the German surrender, 530 tons of Tabin nerve agent were shipped to the United States and used in top-secret field tests. Requests to bring German chemists to the United States for weapons work quickly followed. But, as had been the case with the V-2 rocket scientists, the notion of issuing visas to Hitler's chemists was met with hostility inside the State Department. When the chief of the State Department's passport division, Howard K. Travers, learned about this idea, he sent his colleagues an internal memo stating, We should do everything we consistently can to prevent German chemists and others from entering this country. In Germany, Alsace scientific director Samuel Goodsmit had been tracking Hitler's chemists ever since the Allies crossed the Rhine. Likewise, the SIOS chemical weapons team, led by Lieutenant Colonel Philip R. Tarr of the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, 
and his British counterpart, Major Edmund Tilly, were continuing the relentless pursuit. When Alsace located the chemist Richard Kuhn at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg, they paid him a visit. Kuhn had once been an internationally revered organic chemist, but rumor had it that he had become an ardent Nazi during the war. Kuhn won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1938, but turned down accepting the award at the request of Hitler, who called it a Jewish prize. Here now to interview Richard Kuhn, Samuel Goodsmith had with him two American chemists, Louis Fieser of Harvard and Carl Bauman of the University of Wisconsin. Both men had actually worked with Kuhn in his laboratory before the war. After a cordial exchange of greetings, the interrogation began. Alsace sought information regarding the Third Reich's nerve agent program. What did Herr Kuhn know? Kuhn, with his mop of straight reddish-brown hair, cunning smile, and schoolboy looks, swore that he had no connection whatsoever with Reich military research. He told his former colleagues that he was a pure scientist, an academic who spent the war working on the chemistry of modern drugs. Samuel Goodsmith had his doubts. Richard Kuhn's record did not seem too clean to me, Goodsmith recalled after the war. As president of the German Chemical Society, he had followed the Nazi cult and rights quite faithfully. He never failed to give the Hitler salute when starting his classes and to shout Sieg Heil like a true Nazi leader, Goodsmith recalled. But the Alsace leader did not have enough evidence to have Kuhn arrested, so he put him under surveillance instead. Elsewhere in Germany, Sios chemical weapons investigators Colonel Tarr and Major Tilly had been rounding up German chemists and sending them to prisoner of war facilities near where the individual arrests had taken place. Starting on June 1, 1945, these chemists would now be sent to a single location, a top-secret interrogation facility outside Frankfurt. Schaaf was moving its headquarters from Versailles to Frankfurt and was to be dissolved in mid-July. The new organization, in charge of all affairs, including scientific exploitation, was the Office of Military Government for Germany, OMGUS, whose commander was Eisenhower's deputy, General Lucius D. Clay. The Allies were also reorganizing the way in which scientific intelligence was going to be collected moving forward. SIOS was transitioning into American and British components, FIAT, Field Information Agency, Technical, and BIOS, British Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee. SIOS teams would remain active while they completed open investigations. The structure that housed this new interrogation center was none other than Schloss Kranzberg or Kranzberg Castle. Hermann Göring's former Luftwaffe headquarters, and the place where Albert Speer and his aide spent the night the last New Year's Eve of the war. The Allies gave it the code name Dustbin. This medieval structure, built high in the Taunus Mountains, had grand rooms, hardwood floors, beautiful stone fireplaces, and shiny chandeliers. These were hardly gulag-type quarters. In terms of security classification, Dustbin was top tier. The facility was the second most classified interrogation center after Ashcan. Dustbin was self-contained inside its centuries-old stone walls, and as it went at Ashcan, the prisoners here were free to roam the grounds and chat among themselves. Karl Brandt, Hitler's doctor, organized morning gymnastics classes in the garden. Others played chess. Industrialists held lectures in the large banquet hall that Goring had once used as a casino. Speer took walks in the castle's apple orchard, almost always alone by choice. Whereas Ashcan housed the Nazi high command, Dustbin had many Nazi scientists, doctors, and industrialists under guard. This included more than 20 chemists with I.G. Farbin and at least six members of its board. Throughout the early summer of 1945, several key players in Farben's tab and gas program were still at large. For Major Tilly, 
the chronology regarding how Farben first began producing nerve gas and how it transformed into wide-scale production remained a mystery until a Farben chemist named Dr. Gerhard Schroeder was captured and brought to Dustbin. Schroeder was the man who created the nerve agent that had been found at Raubkammer, the robber's lair. The information Schroeder had was among the most sought-after, classified military intelligence in the world. Tilly prepared for intense stonewalling from the Farben chemist. Instead, Dr. Schroeder spoke freely, offering up everything he knew, beginning with Tobin's startling discovery in the fall of 1936. Dr. Schroeder had been working at an insecticide lab for I.G. Farben in Leverkusen, north of Cologne, for several years. By the fall of 1936, he had an important job on his hands. Weevils and leaf lice were destroying grain across Germany, and Schroeder was tasked with creating a synthetic pesticide that could eradicate these tiny pests. The government had been spending 30 million Reichsmarks a year on pesticides made by Farben as well as other companies. IG Farben wanted to develop an insect killer that could save money for the Reich and earn the company a monopoly on pesticides. Synthesizing organic, carbon-based compounds was trial and error work, Dr. Schroeder told Major Tilly. It was labor-intensive and dangerous. Schroeder, a family man, took excellent precautions against exposure, always working under a fume hood. Even trace amounts of the chemicals he was using had cumulative, potentially lethal effects. Schroeder suffered from frequent headaches and sometimes felt short of breath. One night, while driving home after working on a new product, Schroeder could barely see the road in front of him. When he pulled over to examine his eyes in the mirror, he saw that his pupils had constricted to the size of a pinhead. Over the next several days, his vision grew worse. He developed a throbbing pressure in his larynx. Finally, Schroeder checked himself into a hospital, where he was monitored for two weeks before being sent home and told to rest. Eight days after the respite, Schroeder returned to work. He had been developing a cyanide-containing fumigant, which he had given the code name Preparation 991. Picking up where he'd left off with his work, he prepared a small amount of his new substance, diluting it to one in 200,000 units to see if it would kill lice clinging to leaves. He was stunned when his new creation killed 100% of the lice. Schroeder repeated the experiment for his colleagues. They all agreed that Preparation 991 was a hundred times more lethal than anything anyone at the Leverkusen lab had ever worked with before. Dr. Schroeder sent a sample of this lethal new fumigant to Farben's Director of Industrial Hygiene, a man named Professor Eberhard Gross, not to be confused with Dr. Karl Gross, the Waffen-SS bacteriologist connected with the Gerberg discovery. Gross tested the substance on apes and was duly shocked by the results. After a healthy ape was injected with a tiny amount of Preparation 991, just one-tenth of a milligram per kilo of body weight, the ape died in less than an hour. Next, Gross tested the substance on an ape inside an inhalation chamber. He watched this healthy ape die in 16 minutes. Professor Gross told Dr. Schroeder that his Preparation 991 was being sent to Berlin and that he should wait for further instructions on what action to take next. At Dustbin, Schroeder told Major Tilly that when he learned his compound could kill a healthy ape through airborne contact in minutes, he became upset. His discovery was never going to be used as an insecticide, Schroeder lamented. It was simply too dangerous for any warm-blooded animal or human to come into contact with. Schroeder said his goal was to save money for the Reich. With the news of how powerful Preparation 991 was, Schroeder felt he'd failed at his job. He got back to work, searching for a fumigant better suited for the task of killing weevils and leaf lice. Meanwhile, Professor Gross brought the substance to his superiors. Starting in 1935, 
a Reich ordinance required all new discoveries with potential military application to be reported to the War Office. The Reich's Chemical Weapons Department began to evaluate Schroeder's Preparation 991 for its potential use in chemical warfare. In May 1937, Schroeder was invited to Berlin to demonstrate how he'd synthesized Preparation 991. Everyone was astounded, Schroeder told Tilly. This was the most promising chemical killer since the Germans invented mustard gas. Preparation 991 was classified top secret and given a code name, Tabin Gas. It came from the English word taboo, something prohibited or forbidden. Dr. Schroeder was told to produce one kilogram for the German army, which would take over Tabin production on a massive scale. Schroeder got a bonus of 50,000 Reichsmarks. The average German worker during this time period earned 3,100 Reichsmarks a year and was told to get back to work. Farben still needed him to develop a lice-killing insecticide. With their new nerve agent, Tabin, Farben executives saw all kinds of business opportunities. Karl Krau, the head of Farben's board of directors, began working with Hermann Göring on a longer-range plan to arm Germany with chemical weapons, ones that could eventually be dropped on the enemy from airplanes. In his report to Göring, Krau called Tabin the weapon of superior intelligence and superior scientific technological thinking. The beauty in the nerve agent, Krau told Göring, was that it could be used against the enemy's hinterland. Göring agreed, adding that what he liked most about chemical weapons was that they terrified people. He responded to Krau in writing, noting that the deadly effects of nerve agents like tabin gas could wreak psychological havoc on civilian populations, driving them crazy with fear. On August 22, 1938, Göring named Karl Krau his plenipotentiary for special questions of chemical production. Farben was now positioned to build the Reich's chemical weapons industry from the ground up. The Treaty of Versailles had forced Germany to destroy all of its chemical weapons factories after World War I, which meant factories had to be secretly built. This was an enormous undertaking, now an official part of the Nazis' secret four-year plan, and through Krau, I.G. Farben was made privy to the Reich's war plan before war was declared. At the Dustbin Interrogation Center, Major Tilly asked Schroeder about full-scale production. Based on the Allies' discovery of thousands of tons of Tabin bombs in the forest outside Raubkammer, Farben must have had an enormous secret production facility somewhere. Dr. Schroeder said that he was not involved in full-scale production. That was the job of his colleague, Dr. Otto Ambrose. Major Tilly asked Schroeder to tell him more about Ambrose. Schroeder said that most of what Ambrose did was classified, but that if Major Tilly wanted to know more about what he actually did for Farben, Tilly should talk to individuals who sat on Farben's board of directors with Ambrose, either Dr. Karl Krau or Baron Georg von Schnitzler. Both men were interned here at Dustbin. Who is Mr. Ambrose? Major Tilly asked Baron Georg von Schnitzler in an interview that would later be presented as evidence in a Nuremberg war crimes trial. He is one of our first, younger technicians, von Schnitzler said. He was in charge of Duhernfort, as well as Auschwitz and Gindorf. Where was Ambrose now? Tilly asked von Schnitzler. The Baron told Major Tilly to talk to Karl Krau. From Krau, Major Tilly learned quite a bit more about Ambrose, that he had been in charge of technical development of chemical weapons production at Gindorf and at Duernfort, that Gindorf produced mustard gas on an industrial scale, and that Duernfort produced tabin. Krau also revealed a new piece of evidence. Duernfort produced a second nerve agent, one that was even more potent than tabin, called sarin. Sarin was an acronym pieced together from the names of four key persons involved in its development. 
Schroeder and Ambrose from IG Farben, and from the German army, two officers named Rudiger and Lind. Crow told Major Tilly that the Duernfort plant had fallen into Russian hands. Karl Crow said something else that caught Major Tilly by surprise. Before coming to Dustbin, Crow said he had been in the hospital, where he'd been paid a visit by two American officers, one of whom was Lieutenant Colonel Tar. Judging from conversations I had a few months ago in the hospital with members of the USS BS, Colonel Snow, and Chemical Warfare, Colonel Tar, Crow explained, the gentlemen seemed mostly interested in Sarin and Tabin. They asked me for construction plans and details of fabrication. As far as I understood, they intended to erect similar plants in the USA. I told them to apply to Dr. Ambrose and his staff at Gindorf. Major Tilly was shocked. Lieutenant Colonel Tar was his Sias partner, and yet Tar had neglected to share with him the story about visiting Crow in the hospital. This was Tilly's first indication that Tar was running a separate mission for the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, one that apparently had a different objective than the Sios mission. The full, dramatic story was about to unfold. By June 1945, Otto Ambrose had been questioned by soldiers with the Third Army numerous times. For reasons that remain obscure, no one from that division had been informed of the fact that Ambrose was wanted for war crimes, or that he had served as Farben's chief of chemical weapons production throughout Hitler's rule. To the Third Army, he was simply the plain chemist in the Bavarian village of Gindorf, the smiling, well-dressed businessman who supplied American soldiers with free bars of soap. At Dustbin, Major Tilly relayed this critical new information about Dr. Otto Ambrose to his Fiat superiors, who in turn sent an urgent message to the 6th Army Group, also in Gindorf, ordering the immediate arrest of Dr. Ambrose. The 6th Army was to transport Ambrose directly to Dustbin so that Major Tilly could interrogate him. A note card was placed in Ambrose's dossier. Disparate bits of information were now coming into sharp focus. Case number 21877, Dr. Otto Ambrose, rumored to have been involved in use of concentration camp personnel for testing effectiveness of new poison gases developed at Gindorf. Krokas notified Schaaf, insisting that Dr. Ambrose be arrested. As the plant manager at Farben's Buna factory at Auschwitz, Otto Ambrose had been linked to atrocities, including mass murder and slavery. The six army groups swung into action. But when they arrived at Ambrose's home in Gindorf, arrest orders in hand, Ambrose was gone. The first assumption was that Ambrose had fled on his own. This proved incorrect. He had been taken away by Lieutenant Colonel Philip Tarr. Initially, the commanding officer at Dustbin found this impossible to comprehend. It was one thing for Tarr to try to interview Ambrose before any other chemical warfare experts did. That kind of rivalry had been going on ever since the various scientific intelligence teams had crossed the Rhine. But why would Tar defy orders from Schaaf to have Ambrose arrested? While soldiers with the 6th Army stood scratching their heads in Gindorf, Tar and Ambrose were actually headed to Heidelberg in a U.S. Army jeep. Their destination was an American interrogation center that was run by Army intelligence officers with the Chemical Warfare Service. For days, no one at Dustbin had any idea where Tar and Ambrose had gone. Otto Ambrose had a razor-sharp mind. He was cunning and congenial, sly like a fox. He almost always wore a grin. The American war crimes prosecutor, Josiah Dubois, described him as having a devilish friendliness about him. He also had a distracting, rabbit-like habit of sniffing at the air. Ambrose was short and heavy-set, with white hair and flat feet. He was a brilliant scientist 
who studied chemistry and agronomy under Nobel Prize winner Richard Vilstetter, a Jew. As a chemist, Ambrose had a mind that was capable of pushing science into realms previously unexplored. Few men were as important to I.G. Farben during the war as Otto Ambrose had been. I.G. Farben first began producing synthetic rubber in 1935, naming it Buna after its primary component, Butadine. In 1937, Farben presented commercial Buna on the world stage and won the gold medal at the International Expo in Paris. When Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, the Reich's ability to import natural rubber diminished. Demand for a synthetic alternative skyrocketed, a fact Farben was well aware of in advance of Germany's attack. Tanks needed treads, aircraft needed tires, and Farben needed to produce rubber. Hitler directed Farben to increase its Buna production further. Dr. Ambrose was put in charge and saw to it that Farben opened a second and then a third Buna plant so that supply could meet demand. As the invasion of the Soviet Union was secretly conceived by the German High Command, Hitler again called upon Farben's board of directors to increase its synthetic rubber production. Farben needed to construct a massive new Buna factory. Otto Ambrose was put in charge of masterminding this undertaking as well. The place chosen was Auschwitz. Once, Auschwitz was a regular town. Ordinary people lived there, and tourists visited to see the castle, the churches, the large medieval market square, and the synagogue, write historians Deborah Dwork and Robert Jan van Pelt. In the 1930s, visitors sent postcards from the area that read, Greetings from Auschwitz. When, in the fall of 1940, Otto Ambrose poured over maps of this region, called Upper Silesia, in search of a Buna factory site, he found what he was looking for. The production of synthetic rubber required four things, water, flat land, good railway connections, and an abundance of laborers. Auschwitz had all four. Three rivers met in Auschwitz, the Sola, the Vistula, and the Presemsha, with a water flow of 525,000 cubic feet per hour. The land was flat and 65 feet above the waterline, making it safe from floodwaters. The railway connections were sound. But most important was the labor issue. The concentration camp next door could provide an endless labor supply because the men were cheap and could be worked to death. For Farben, the use of slave labor could take the company to levels of economic prowess previously unexplored. First, a financial deal had to be made with the SS. Ambrose was instrumental in this act. For months, before the building of the Buna factory got the go-ahead, the SS and Farben haggled over deal points. Some of the paperwork survived the war. On November 8, 1940, the Reich's Minister of Economics wrote to Farben's board of directors requesting that they hurry up and settle the question regarding the site. Otto Ambrose lobbied hard for Auschwitz, and in December, I.G. Farben sent a busload of its rubber experts and construction workers to survey the work site. A Farben employee named Eric Santo was assigned to serve as Otto Ambrose's construction foreman. The concentration camp already existing with approximately 7,000 prisoners is to be expanded, Santo noted in his official company report. For Ambrose, Farben's arrangement with the SS regarding slave laborers remained vague. Ambrose sought clarity. It is therefore necessary to open negotiations with the Reich leader SS, Himmler, as soon as possible in order to discuss necessary measures with him, Ambrose wrote in his official company report. The two men had a decades-old relationship. Heinrich Himmler and Otto Ambrose had known one another since grade school. Ambrose could make Himmler see eye to eye with him on the benefits that Auschwitz offered to both Farben and the SS. In fact, the SS and IG Farben needed one another. 
Himmler wanted Farben's resources at Auschwitz and was eager to make the deal to supply the slaves. So SS officers hosted a dinner party for Farben's rubber and construction experts at the Auschwitz concentration camp inside an SS banquet hall there. During the festivities, the remaining issues were finally agreed upon. Farben would pay the SS three Reichsmarks a day for each laborer they supplied, which would go into the SS treasury, not to the slaves. On the occasion of a dinner party given for us by the management of the concentration camp, we furthermore determined all the arrangements relating to the involvement of the really excellent concentration camp operation in support of the Buna plants. Ambrose wrote to his boss, Fritz Termer, on April 12, 1941. Our new friendship with the SS is proving very profitable. Ambrose explained. The SS agreed to provide Farben with 1,000 slave workers immediately. That number, promised Himmler, could quickly rise to 30,000 with demand. The relationship between Farben and the SS at Auschwitz was now cemented. Otto Ambrose was the key to making the Buna factory a success. With his knowledge of synthetic rubber and his managerial experience, he also ran Farben's secret nerve gas production facilities. There was no better man than Otto Ambrose for the Auschwitz job. Major Tilly waited at Dustbin for the return of Tar and Ambrose. It was now clear to him that there was no single individual more important to Hitler's chemical weapons program than Otto Ambrose had been. Ambrose was in charge of chemical weapons at Gindorf and Duernfort, and he was the manager of the Buna factory at Auschwitz. From interviewing various Farben chemists held at Dustbin, Tilly had also learned that the gas used to murder millions of people at Auschwitz and other concentration camps, Zyklon B, was a Farben product. Farben owned the patent on Zyklon B, and it was sold to the Reich by an IG Farben company. In one of these interviews, Tilly asked IG Farben board member Baron Georg von Schnitzler, if Otto Ambrose knew that Farben chemicals were being used to murder people. You said yesterday that a Farben employee alluded to you that the poisonous gases and the chemicals manufactured by IG Farben were being used for the murder of human beings held in concentration camps, Major Tilly reminded von Schnitzler in their interview. So I understood him. Von Schnitzler replied. Didn't you question those employees of yours further in regard to the use of these gases? They said they knew it was being used for this purpose, Von Schnitzler said. What did you do when he told you that IG chemicals were being used to kill, to murder people held in concentration camps, Major Tilly asked. I was horrified, said Von Schnitzler. Did you do anything about it? I kept it for me because it was too terrible, von Schnitzler confessed. I asked the Farben employee, Is it known to you and Ambrose and the other directors in Auschwitz that the gases and chemicals are being used to murder people? What did he say? asked Major Tilly. Yes, it is known to all the IG directors in Auschwitz, von Schnitzler said. For Lieutenant Colonel Philip R. Tarr, there was a mission at hand. Enemy Equipment Intelligence Service Team No. 1, which he served on, needed information that only Dr. Otto Ambrose had. Specifically, the team needed blueprints for equipment necessary for producing tab and nerve gas. When Tarr and Ambrose arrived in Heidelberg, the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service had another IG Farben chemist in custody, whom they wanted Ambrose to work with on a classified job. The man is referred to in documents only as Herr Stumpfi. Ambrose and Stumpfi were told to drive to a special metals firm located in Hanau, where they were to locate 30 or 40 drawings of silver-lined equipment. The Chemical Warfare Service trusted Ambrose to such a degree that they sent him and Stumpfi on this mission without an escort. Manufacturing tabin gas 
was a precise and clandestine process. The United States desperately wanted to reproduce it, but attempting to do so without Farben's proprietary formula and its secret equipment was a potential death sentence for any chemist involved. Farben had spent millions of Reichsmarks on research and development. Hundreds of concentration camp workers had died in this trial and error process. When the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service learned that the silver-lined equipment used to manufacture tabin gas on a large scale had been outsourced from a special metals firm called Heraus, they coveted those blueprints and plans. Dr. Ambrose and Herr Stumpfi were to go to this engineering firm to locate these drawings and blueprints and bring them back to Heidelberg. The Chemical Warfare Service agents could not conduct this mission on their own because they had no idea what equipment to look for. The two Farben chemists, Ambrose and Stumpfi, set off on their secret assignment. When they arrived at the factory in Hanau, personnel of a U.S. CIC, Counterintelligence Corps, group with headquarters at that time in Hanau arrested them, read a secret report. When they explained their mission, the CIC personnel concerned confirmed the German engineer's statement by communication with Heidelberg, and the two Germans were released. Ambrose and Stumpfi drove away. The CIC personnel, concerned after having learned of the drawings through the two German engineers, then seized the drawings and took them to their own headquarters, read a classified army report. The Chemical Warfare Service never obtained the drawings they were looking for. But at least Tar had Dr. Ambrose under his control, or so he believed. Instead, somewhere between Ambrose's release from the Heraus engineering firm in Hanau and his return to Heidelberg, he was able to communicate to his network of spies and informants in Gindorf. From those sources, Ambrose learned that soldiers with the U.S. 6th Army had an order to arrest him. So instead of returning to Tar's custody, Ambrose drove to a fancy guest house that I.G. Farben maintained outside Heidelberg called Villa Kohlhoff, where a staff of Farben employees tended to his every need. Sios and Fiat officials from Dustbin finally made contact with Tar and ordered him to return with Ambrose to the interrogation facility immediately. But Tar was no longer in control of Ambrose. Major Tilly went looking for Ambrose himself and found Hitler's chemist residing at Villa Kohlhoff. Ambrose told Major Tilly that he would agree to continue cooperating with the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service and the various Allied agencies that sought information from him, but only on one condition, that Tilly secure the release of all chemical warfare personnel already detained at Dustbin. This was a preposterous request. Tilly's superior, Major P.M. Wilson of Fiat's Enemy Personnel Exploitation Section, attempted to take control of the situation, ordering Ambrose brought to Dustbin immediately. This was not a matter of cooperation, Wilson said. There were orders to arrest the man. Lieutenant Colonel Tarr intervened on Ambrose's behalf. He lobbied the British Ministry of Supply, the agency responsible for British chemical warfare issues, for help getting Ambrose's dustbin colleagues released. To Tarr, extracting Ambrose's esoteric knowledge outweighed the need to hold him accountable for his crimes. But the British also flatly refused to help Tarr. The matter stalled. Lieutenant Colonel Tarr flew to Paris. That night, a telegram arrived at Dustbin, sent from Paris and purporting to be from the British Ministry of Supply. The telegram ordered the release of all Farben chemical warfare scientists at Dustbin and was signed by a British Ministry of Supply colonel named J.T.M. Childs. Officers at Dustbin suspected that something was amiss and contacted Colonel Childs about his outrageous request. Colonel Childs swore he had neither written the memo nor signed it and accused Lieutenant Colonel Tarr of forgery. Fiat enhanced their efforts to have Dr. Ambrose arrested in Heidelberg. 
the efforts failed. Ambrose was able to evade capture by fleeing into the safety of the French zone. Double-crossing Lieutenant Colonel Tarr, Otto Ambrose struck a deal with French chemical weapons experts. In exchange for information, he was given a job as plant manager at Farben's chemical factory in Ludwigshaven. When Fiat officers at Dustbin learned what had happened, they were outraged. Ambrose's escape had been entirely preventable. It is evident that he was not kept in custody or under house arrest, noted Captain R. E. F. Edelston, a British officer with the Ministry of Supply. Major P. M. Wilson saw the situation in much darker terms. Lieutenant Colonel Tarr had taken steps to assist Ambrose to evade arrest, he wrote in a scathing report. Wilson was appalled by the friendly treatment being given to this man who is suspected of war criminality. But these were just words. Ambrose was now a free man, living and working in the French zone. The relationship among Tarr, Ambrose, and the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service was far from over. It was only a matter of time before an American chemical company would learn of the Army's interest in a whole new field of chemical weapons. An American chemist, Dr. Wilhelm Hirschkind, was in Germany at the same time. Dr. Hirschkind was conducting a survey of the German chemical industry for the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service while on temporary leave from the Dow Chemical Company. Dr. Hirschkind had spent several months inspecting IG Farben plants in the U.S. and British zones, and now he was in Heidelberg, hoping to meet Ambrose. Lieutenant Colonel Tarr reached out to Colonel Weiss, the French commander in charge of IG Farben's chemical plant in Ludwigshafen, and a meeting was arranged. On July 28, 1945, Dr. Hirschkind met with Dr. Ambrose and Lieutenant Colonel Tarr in Heidelberg. Ambrose brought his wartime deputy with him to the meeting, the Farben chemist, Jorgen von Klink. It was von Klink who, in the final months of the war, had helped Ambrose destroy evidence, hide documents, and disguise the Farben factory at Gindorf so that it appeared to produce soap, not chemical weapons. Jürgen von Klink was initially detained at Dustbin, but later released. The Heidelberg meetings lasted several days. When Dr. Wilhelm Hirschkin left, he had these words for Ambrose. I would look forward, after the conclusion of the peace treaty, to continuing our relations in my position as a representative of Dow. Only later did Fiat interrogators learn about this meeting. Major Tilly's suspicions were now confirmed. A group inside the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, including his former partner, Lieutenant Colonel Tarr, did indeed have an ulterior motive that ran counter to the motives of SIOS, FIAT, and the United Nations War Crimes Commission. Tilly's superior at Dustbin, Major Wilson, confirmed this dark and disturbing truth in a classified military intelligence report on the Ambrose affair. It is believed that the conflict between FIAT and Lieutenant Colonel Tarr was due to the latter's wish to use Ambrose for industrial chemical purposes back in the United States. All documents regarding the Ambrose affair would remain classified for the next 40 years until August of 1985. That an officer of the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, Lieutenant Colonel Tarr, had sheltered a wanted war criminal from capture in the aftermath of the German surrender was damning. That this officer was also participating in meetings with the fugitive and a representative from the Dow Chemical Company was scandalous. In 1945, the Chemical Warfare Service was also in charge of the U.S. Biological Weapons Program, the existence of which remained secret from the American public. The program was robust. If the atomic bomb failed to end the war in Japan, there were plans in motion to wage biological warfare against Japanese crops. After the fall of the Reich, the staff of the Chemical Warfare Service began interrogating Hitler's biological weapons makers, many of whom were interned at Dustbin. 
The Chemical Warfare Service saw enormous potential in making the Nazis' biological weapons program its own and sought any scientific intelligence it could get. The man most wanted in this effort was Hitler's top biological weapons expert, Dr. Kurt Bloma. On June 29, 1945, Bloma was sent to dustbin. The officers assigned to interrogate him were Bill Cromarty and J. M. Barnes of Operation Alsace. Each man was uniquely familiar with Bloma's background. Cromarty had been in Dr. Eugen Hagen's apartment in Strasbourg in 1944 when he and Alsace scientific director Samuel Goodsmith made the awful discovery that the Reich had been experimenting on people during the war. Bloma was named in the Hagen files. And it was Cromarty and Barnes who led the investigation of the Gerberg facility, the abandoned, curious-looking research outpost hidden in the Thuringian forest. Both Cromarty and Barnes had concluded that Gerberg had been a laboratory for Reich biological weapons research and that Dr. Bloma was in charge. During his initial interview at Dustbin, Bloma refused to cooperate. When he was first interrogated, he was very evasive, Cromarty and Barnes wrote. But a few days later, when interrogated in more detail, Bloma's attitude changed completely and he seemed anxious to give a full account not only of what he actually did, but what he had in mind for future work. Cromarty and Barnes were unsure if they should be enthused by Bloma's seeming change of heart or suspicious of it. Bloma had been observed in the dustbin eating hall conversing at length with Dr. Heinrich Kleve, the Reich's counterintelligence agent for bacterial warfare concerns. Perhaps the two men were concocting a misinformation scheme. During the war, Dr. Kleva's job had been to monitor bioweapons progress being made by Germany's enemies, most notably Russia. Kleva claims that he himself did all the evaluating of the reports received and determined what course of action his department should thenceforth follow, investigators wrote in Kleva's dustbin dossier. Kleva told Bloma that he would likely be taken to Heidelberg for a lengthy interrogation with Alsace agents, as Kleva had been. If Cromarty and Barnes were surprised by Bloma's sudden willingness to talk, they were also aware that most of what he told them could not be independently verified. It is quite impossible to check many of his statements, and what follows is an account of what he related, read a note in Bloma's dustbin dossier. What Bloma recounted was a dark tale of plans for biological warfare spearheaded by Heinrich Himmler. Himmler had a layman's fascination with biological warfare. A former chicken farmer, the Reichsführer SS, had studied agriculture in school. According to Bloma, it was Himmler who was the primary motivator behind the Reich's bioweapons program. Hitler, Bloma said, did not approve of biological warfare and was kept in the dark as to specific plans. Himmler's area of greatest fascination, said Bloma, was bubonic plague. On April 30, 1943, Goring had created the cancer research post that was to be held by Bloma. Over the next 19 months, Bloma explained, he met with Himmler five times. At their first meeting, which occurred in the summer of 1943, Bloma recalled it as being July or August, Himmler ordered Bloma to study various dissemination methods of plague bacteria for offensive warfare. According to Bloma, he shared with Himmler his fears regarding the dangerous boomerang effect a plague bomb would most likely have on Germany. Himmler told Bloma that in that case, he should get to work immediately to produce a vaccine to prevent such a thing. To expedite vaccine research, Bloma said, Himmler ordered him to use human beings. Himmler offered Bloma a medical block at a concentration camp like Dachau, where he could complete this work. Bloma said he told Himmler he was aware of 
strong objections in certain circles to using humans in experimental vaccine trials. Himmler told Bloma that experimenting on humans was necessary in the war effort. To refuse was the equivalent of treason. Very well, said Bloma. He considered himself a loyal Nazi, and it was his intention to help Germany win the war. History gives us examples of human disease affecting the outcome of wars, Bloma told his Alsace interrogators, taking a moment to lecture them on history. We know that from antiquity up till the time of the Napoleonic Wars, victories and defeats were often determined by epidemics and starvation, Bloma said. Spreading an infectious disease could bring about the demise of a marauding army, and Bloma said that the failure of Napoleon's Russian campaign was due in great part to the infection of his horses with glanders, a highly contagious bacterial disease. History aside, Bloma said he counseled Himmler on the fact that a concentration camp was a terrible place to experiment with bubonic plague because the population was too dense. Bloma then told Himmler that if he were to experiment with plague bacterium, he would need his own institute, an isolated facility far removed from population centers. Himmler and Bloma agreed that Poland would be a good place, and they settled on Nesselstedt, a small town outside the former Poznan University, by then operated by the Reich. Bloma's research institute was to be called the Bacteriological Institute at Nesselstedt. In the interim, in Berlin, Bloma oversaw a field test using rats, history's traditional carrier of bubonic plague. A debate had been taking place inside the Hygiene Institute of the Waffen-SS as to whether or not rats were the best plague carriers. Himmler's idea was to take infected rats onto U-boats and release them near the enemy shores so they could swim to land. Bloma doubted that rats could swim great distances. He believed they could swim only for as long as the air in their fur kept them afloat. To prove his point, Bloma arranged for a test on a Berlin lake. About 30 rats were taken out in a police boat and released at different distances from the shore to swim both with and against the wind. Bloma said that the rats were dumber than he thought, that when placed in the water, they had no idea where the shore was and swam around in different directions. A few of them drowned in ten minutes. The longest any of the rats swam for was thirty minutes. Of those released a little over a half mile from shore, only a third reached land. As far as Bloma was concerned, Himmler's U-boat dispersal idea was not practical. Meeting number two took place a month or two later, in September or October 1943, and was largely a repetition of the first, at least according to Bloma. There was one significant development, however. Himmler asked Bloma if he needed an assistant. Bloma agreed that a bacteriologist would be helpful. Himmler assigned Dr. Karl Gross, formerly a staff member at the Waffen-SS Hygiene Institute. The two doctors did not get along. Bloma became convinced that Dr. Gross had been sent by Himmler to spy on him. He told his interrogators that he was under great pressure to work faster. Himmler repeatedly reiterated that the methods of waging BW, biological warfare, must be studied in order to understand the defense against it. What this meant was that Himmler wanted Bloma to infect human test subjects with plague to see what would happen to them. The third meeting took place four or five months later, in February 1944. By this time, Bloma said, the facility at Nesselstedt had been built. There was ample staff housing, a well-equipped laboratory, and an animal farm. The block for experimental work included a climate room, a cold room, disinfectant facilities, and rooms for clean and dirty experiments. There was an isolation hospital for 16 people in the event that workers on Bloma's staff contracted the disease. Work progressed slowly, Bloma said, and Himmler became enraged. 
Rumors of an Allied invasion of the European continent had become a constant thorn in the side of the Reichsfuhrer SS. Why wasn't the Reich's bioweapons program more advanced? Himmler demanded to know. He asked Bloma if it was possible to do something now, for example, disseminate influenza that would delay the heralded Anglo-American invasion in the West. According to Bloma, he told Himmler it was impossible to do anything on these lines. Himmler proposed another idea. How about disseminating a virulent strain of hoof and mouth disease, or tularemia, also called rabbit fever, which affected man in a manner similar to plague? Bloma told Himmler that these were dangerous ideas, as any outbreak would surely affect Germany's troops. The Reich needed a massive stockpile of vaccinations before it could feasibly launch a biological attack. Himmler stretched his thinking to target the Allies on their own soil. How about spreading cattle plague, also called Rinderpest, in America or England? Himmler told Bloma that infecting the enemy's food supply would have a sinister effect on enemy troops. Bloma agreed and said he would investigate what it would take to start a plague epidemic among the enemy's cows. There was, however, a problem. Bloma explained. An international agreement prohibited stocks of the Rinderpest virus to be stored anywhere in Europe. Strains of cattle plague were available only in the Third World. Himmler said that he would get the cattle plague himself. He sent Dr. Eric Traub, a veterinarian from the Reich's State Research Institute located on the island of Reims, to Turkey. There. Dr. Traub acquired a strain of the lethal Rinderpest virus. Under Bloma's direction, trials to infect healthy cows with Rinderpest began. Reims, in northern Germany, in the Bay of Greifswald, was totally isolated and self-contained. It was the perfect place for these dangerous tests. The veterinary section used airplanes to spray the cattle plague virus on the island's grassy fields. Where cows grazed, Bloma said he didn't know much more about the program or its results, only that Dr. Traub, second in command at the research facility, was taken by the Russians when the Red Army captured Reims in April 1945. Bloma's fourth meeting with Himmler took place in April or May of 1944. Himmler had become paranoid by now, Bloma said. He believed that the Allies were plotting a biological weapons attack against the Reich. Bloma was summoned by telephone to see Himmler urgently. The latter had received a number of curious reports. Grass had come floating out of the sky over some part of Austria, and a cow that had eaten some of it had died. Bloma told Himmler he'd look into it. There were additional strange events. Himmler confided to Bloma. Some small balloons had been found near Salzburg, and Berchtesgaden, not far from Hitler's mountain residence, the Berghof, and potato beetles had been dropped in Normandy. Bloma promised to study each incident. Bloma told Himmler he had a pressing issue of his own. Given the progress of the Red Army, he thought it was wise to move his plague research institute at Posen, Posnan, somewhere inside Germany. The place Bloma suggested was Gerberg in the Thuringian forest at the edge of the Harz Mountains. Himmler said that the Russians would never reach Posen. By early fall, he had changed his mind. In October, a new biological weapons research facility was being built, concealed inside a pine forest in the village of Gerberg. In the meantime, Bloma told his interrogators, work on vaccines was moving forward. Not at either of his research institutes, but inside the army instead. Göring had moved epidemic control into the jurisdiction of a major general named Dr. Walter Schreiber, Surgeon General of the Reich. Bloma held the position of Deputy Surgeon General of the Reich, but the two men had equal positions under Göring. Bloma explained, he, Bloma, was in charge of creating the biological weapons. Dr. Schreiber was in charge of protecting Germans against biological weapons should they be used.
Major General Dr. Schreiber specialized in epidemic control, the sword and the shield. Alsace was very interested in learning about these vaccines. Bloma said that Major General Dr. Schreiber was the person to talk to about that. Where could he be found? Bloma said Schreiber had last been seen in Berlin. Word was he had surrendered to the Red Army and was their prisoner now.